This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. To find out more, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Kevin, a neural engine by Amazon Web Services. In conjunction with Laude Corpus, Software Safety, Audiobook Library Essentials, and Project Gutenberg. The Veil of Isis. Chapter 10. Tau Epsilon Sigma Delta Epsilon Gamma Alpha Rho Epsilon Kappa Tau Rho Iota Alpha Delta Omicron Sigma Pi Alpha Nu Pi Nu Epsilon Y Epsilon Mu Alpha Pi Alpha Tau Epsilon Rho Epsilon Kappa Epsilon Rho Alpha Sigma Epsilon. Te, Lid. Demens, 20. The more powerful souls perceive truth through themselves, and are of a more inventive nature. Such souls are saved through their own strength, according to the Oracle. Proclus and I Alk. Since the soul perpetually runs and passes through all things in a certain space of time, which being performed, it is presently compelled to run back again through all things, and unfold the same web of generation in the world, for as often as the same causes return, the same effects will in like manner be returned. Fison. De M. N. 129. Chaldean Oracles. If not to some peculiar end assigned. Studies the specious trifling of the mind. Young. From the moment when the fetal embryo is formed until the old man, gasping his last, drops into the grave, neither the beginning nor the end is understood by scholastic science, all before us is a blank, all after us chaos. For it there is no evidence as to the relations between spirit, soul, and body, either before or after death. The mere life principle itself presents an unsolvable enigma, upon the study of which materialism has vainly exhausted its intellectual powers. In the presence of a corpse a skeptical physiologist stands dumb when asked by his pupil whence came the former tenant of that empty box, and whither it has gone. The pupil must either, like his master, rest satisfied with the explanation that protoplasm made the man, and force vitalized and will now consume his body, or he must go outside the walls of his college and the books of its library to find an explanation of the mystery. It is sometimes as interesting as instructive to follow the two great rivals, science and theology, in their frequent skirmishes. Not all of the sons of the church are as unsuccessful in their attempts at advocacy as the poor Abbe Moino, of Paris. This respectable, and no doubt well-meaning divine, in his fruitless attempt to refute the free-thinking arguments of Huxley, Tyndall, Dubois Raymond, and many others, has met with a sad failure. In his antidotal arguments his success was more than doubtful, and, as a reward for his trouble, the congregation of the index forbids the circulation of his book among the faithful. It is a dangerous experiment to engage in a single-handed duel with scientists on topics which are well demonstrated by experimental research. In what they do know they are unassailable, and until the old formula is destroyed by their own hands and replaced by a more newly discovered one, there is no use fighting against Achilles unless, indeed, one is four. p. 337 tune it enough to catch the swift-footed god by his vulnerable heel. This heel is what they confess they do not know. That was a cunning device to which a certain well-known preacher resorted to reach this mortal part. Before we proceed to narrate the extraordinary though well-authenticated facts with which we intend to fill this chapter, it will be good policy to show once more how fallible is modern science as to every fact in nature which can be tested neither by retort nor crucible. The following are a few fragments from a series of sermons by F. Felix of Notre Dame, entitled Mystery and Science. They are worthy to be translated for and quoted in a work which is undertaken in precisely the same spirit as that exhibited by the preacher. For once the church silenced for a time the arrogance of her traditional enemy, in the face of the learned academicians. It was known that the great preacher, in response to the general desire of the faithful, and perhaps to the orders of ecclesiastical superiors, had been preparing himself for a great oratorical effort and the historic cathedral was filled with a monster congregation. Amid a profound silence he began his discourse, of which the following paragraphs are sufficient for our purpose. A portentous word has been pronounced against us to confront progress with Christianity science. Such is the formidable evocation with which they try to appall us. To all that we can say to base progress upon Christianity, they have always a ready response, that is not scientific. We say a revelation, Revelation is not scientific. We say miracle, a miracle is not scientific. Thus anti-Christianism, faithful to its tradition, and now more than ever, pretends to kill us by science. Principle of darkness, it threatens us with light. It proclaims itself the light. 
A hundred times I ask myself, what is, then, that terrible science which is making ready to devour us? Is it mathematical science? But we also have our mathematicians. Is it physics? Astronomy? Physiology? Geology? But we number in Catholicism astronomers, physicists, geologists, and physiologists, who make somewhat of a figure in the scientific world, who have their place in the academy and their name in history. It would appear that what is to crush us is neither this nor that science, but science in general. And why do they prophesy the overthrow of Christianity by science? Listen, we must perish by science because we teach mysteries, and because the Christian mysteries are in radical antagonism with modern. P. 338. Science. Mystery is the negation of common sense. Science repels it. Science condemns it. She has spoken anathema. Ah. You are right. If Christian mystery is what you proclaim it, then in the name of science hurl the anathema at it. Nothing is antipathetic to science like the absurd and contradictory. But, glory be to the truth. Such is not the mystery of Christianity. If it were so, it would remain for you to explain the most inexplicable of mysteries, how comes it that, during nearly two thousand years, so many superior minds and rare geniuses have embraced our mysteries, without thinking to repudiate science or abdicate reason? Talk as much as you like of your modern science, modern thought, and modern genius, there were scientists before 1789. If our mysteries are so manifestly absurd and contradictory, how is it that such mighty geniuses should have accepted them without a single doubt? But God preserve me from insisting upon demonstrating that mystery implies no contradiction with science, of what used to prove, by metaphysical abstractions, that science can reconcile itself with mystery, when all the realities of creation show unanswerably that mystery everywhere baffles science? You ask that we should show you, beyond doubt, that exact science cannot admit mystery, I answer you decidedly that she cannot escape it. Mystery is the fatality of science. Shall we choose our proofs? First, then, look around at the purely material world, from the smallest atom to the most majestic sun. There, if you try to embrace in the unity of a single law all these bodies and their movements, if you seek the word which explains, in this vast panorama of the universe, this prodigious harmony, where all seems to obey the empire of a single force, you pronounce a word to express it, and say attraction, yes, attraction, this is the sublime epitome of the science of the heavenly bodies. You say that throughout space these bodies recognize and attract each other, you say that they attract in proportion to their mass, and in inverse ratio with the squares of their distances. And, in fact, until the present moment, nothing has happened to give the lie to this assertion, but everything has confirmed a formula which now reigns sovereign in the empire of hypothesis, and therefore it must henceforth enjoy the glory of being an invincible truism. Gentlemen, with all my heart I make my scientific obeisances to the sovereignty of attraction. It is not I who would desire to obscure a light in the world of matter which reflects upon the world of spirits. The P. 339. Empire of attraction, then, is palpable, it is sovereign, it stares us in the face. But, what is this attraction? Who has seen attraction? Who has met attraction? Who has touched attraction? How do these mute bodies, intelligent, insensible, exercise upon each other unconsciously this reciprocity of action and reaction which holds them in the common equilibrium and unanimous harmony. Is this force which draws Sunday to Sunday, and atom to atom, an invisible mediator which goes from one to another? And, in such case what is this mediator? Whence comes to itself this force which mediates, and this power which embraces, from which the sun can no more escape than the atom? But is this force nothing different from the elements themselves which attract each other? Mystery. Mystery. Yes, gentlemen, this attraction which shines with such brightness throughout the material world, remains to you at bottom an impenetrable mystery. Well, because of its mystery, will you deny its reality, which touches you, and its domination, which subjugates you? And again, remark if you please, mystery is so much at the foundation of all science that if you should desire to exclude mystery, you would be compelled to suppress science itself. Imagine whatever science you will, follow the magnificent sweep of its deductions, when you arrive at its parent source, you come face to face with the unknown. Who has been able to penetrate the secret of the formation of a body, the generation of a single atom? What is there I will not say at the center of a sun, but at the center of an atom? Who has sounded to the bottom the abyss in a grain of sand? The grain of sand, gentlemen, 
has been studied four thousand years by science. She has turned and returned it. She divides it and subdivides it. She torments it with her experiments. She vexes it with her questions to snatch from it the final word as to its secret constitution. She asked it, with an insatiable curiosity, shall I divide the infinitesimally? Then, suspended over this abyss, science hesitates. She stumbles. She feels dazzled. She becomes dizzy. And, in despair says, I do not know. But if you are so fatally ignorant of the genesis and hidden nature of a grain of sand, how should you have an intuition as to the generation of a single living being? Whence in the living being does life come? Where does it commence? What is the life principle? P. 340. Can the scientist answer the eloquent monk? Can they escape from his pitiless logic? Mystery certainly does bound them on every side, and the ultima fool, whether of Herbert Spencer, Tyndall, or Huxley, has written upon the closed portals the words incomprehensible, unknowable. For the lover of metaphor, science may be likened to a twinkling star shining with resplendent brightness through rifts in a bank of densely black clouds. If her votaries cannot define that mysterious attraction which draws into concrete masses the material particles which form the smallest pebble on the ocean beach, how can they define the limits at which the possible stops and the impossible begins? Why should there be an attraction between the molecules of matter, and none between those of spirit? If, out of the material portion of the ether, by virtue of the inherent restlessness of its particles, the forms of worlds and their species of plants and animals can be evolved, why, out of the spiritual part of the ether, should not successive races of beings, from the stage of monad to that of man, be developed, each lower form unfolding a higher one until the work of evolution is completed on our earth, and the production of a mortal man? It will be seen that, for the moment, we entirely put aside the accumulated facts which prove the case, and submit it to the arbitrament of logic. By whatsoever name the physicist may call the energizing principle in matter is of no account, it is a subtle something apart from the matter itself, and, as it escapes their detection, it must be something besides matter. If the law of attraction is admitted as governing the one, why should it be excluded from influencing the other? Leaving logic to answer, we turn to the common experience of mankind, and there find a mass of testimony corroborative of the immortality of the soul, if we judge but from analogies. But we have more than that we have the unimpeachable testimony of thousands upon thousands, that there is a regular science of the soul, which, notwithstanding that it is now denied the right of a place among other sciences, is a science. This science, by penetrating the arcana of nature far deeper than our modern philosophy ever dreamed possible, teaches us how to force the invisible to become visible, the existence of elementary spirits, the nature and magical properties of the astral light, the power of living men to bring themselves into communication with the former through the latter. Let them examine the proofs with the lamp of experience, and neither the academy nor the church, for which Father Felix so persuasively spoke, can deny them. Modern science is in a dilemma, it must concede our hypothesis to be correct, or admit the possibility of miracle. To do so, is to say that there can be an infraction of natural law. If this can happen in one case. P. 341. What assurance have we that it may not be repeated indefinitely, and so destroy that fixity of law, that perfect balance of forces by which the universe is governed? This is a very ancient and an unanswerable argument. To deny the appearance, in our midst, of supersensual beings, when they have been seen, at various times and in various countries, by not merely thousands, but millions of persons, is unpardonable obstinacy, to say that, in any one instance, the apparition has been produced by a miracle, fatal to the fundamental principle of science. What will they do? What can they do, when they shall have awakened from the benumbing stupor of their pride, but collect the facts, and try to enlarge the boundaries of their field of investigations? The existence of spirit in the common mediator, the ether, is denied by materialism, while theology makes of it a personal god, the Kabbalist holds that both are wrong, saving that in ether, the elements represent but matter the blind cosmic forces of nature, and spirit, the intelligence which directs them. The Hermetic, Orphic, and Pythagorean cosmogonical doctrines, as well as those of Sanko Niton and Barassas, are all based upon one irrefutable formula, viz., that the ether and chaos, or, in the Plutonic language, mind and matter, were the two primeval and eternal principles of the universe, utterly independent of anything else. The former was the all-vivifying intellectual principle, the chaos, a shapeless, liquid principle, without form or sense, from the union of which two, sprang into existence the universe, 
or rather, the universal world, the first androgynous deity the chaotic matter becoming its body, and ether the soul. According to the phraseology of a fragment of Hermias, chaos, from this union with spirit, obtaining sense, shone with pleasure, and thus was produced the protagonos, the firstborn, light. This is the universal trinity, based on the metaphysical conceptions of the ancients, who, reasoning by analogy, made of man, who is a compound of intellect and matter, the microcosm of the macrocosm, or great universe. If we now compare this doctrine with the speculations of science, which comes to a full stop at the borderland of the unknown, and, while incompetent to solve the mystery, will allow no one else to speculate upon the subject, or, with the great theological dogma, that the world was called into existence by a heavenly trick of prestidigitation, we do not hesitate to believe that, in the absence of better proof, the hermetic doctrine is by far the more reasonable, highly metaphysical as it may appear. The universe is there, and we know that we exist, but how did it come, and how did we appear in it? Denied an answer by the Rep. P. 342. Presentatives of physical learning, and excommunicated and anathematized for our blasphemous curiosity by the spiritual usurpers, what can we do, but turn for information to the sages who meditated upon the subject ages before the molecules of our philosophers aggregated an ethereal space? This visible universe of spirit and matter, they say, is but the concrete image of the ideal abstraction. It was built on the model of the first divine idea. Thus our universe existed from eternity in a latent state. The soul animating this purely spiritual universe is the central sun, the highest deity itself. It was not himself who built the concrete form of his idea, but his first begotten, and as it was constructed on the geometrical figure of the dodecahedron, the first begotten was pleased to employ 12,000 years in its creation. The latter number is expressed in the Tyrrhenian cosmogony which shows man created in the sixth millennium. This agrees with the Egyptian theory of 6,000 years, and with the Hebrew computation. Sanko Niaton, in his cosmogony, declares that when the wind, spirit, became enamored of its own principles, the chaos, an intimate union took place, which connection was called pothos, and from this sprang the seed of all. And the chaos knew not its own production, for it was senseless, but from its embrace with the wind was generated mo, or the illus, mud. From this proceeded the spores of creation and the generation of the universe. The ancients, who named but four elements, made of ether a fifth one. On account of its essence being made divine by the unseen presence it was considered as a medium between this world and the next. They held that when the directing intelligences retired from any portion of ether, one of the four kingdoms which they are bound to superintend, the space was left in possession of evil. An adept who prepared to converse with the invisibles, had to know well his ritual, and be perfectly acquainted with the conditions required for the perfect equilibrium of the four elements in the astral light. First of all, he must purify the essence, and within the circle in which he sought to attract the pure spirits, equilibrize the elements, so as to prevent the ingress of the elementaries into their respective spheres. But woe to the imprudent inquirer who ignorantly trespasses upon forbidden ground, danger will beset him at every step. He evokes powers that he cannot control, he arouses sentries which allow only their masters to pass. For, in the words of the immortal Rosicrucian, once that thou hast resolved to become a cooperator with the spirit of. p. 343. The living God, take care not to hinder him in his work, for, if thy heat exceeds the natural proportion thou hast stirred the wrath of the moist natures, and they will stand up against the central fire, and the central fire against them, and there will be a terrible division in the chaos. The spirit of harmony and union will depart from the elements, disturbed by the imprudent hand, and the currents of blind forces will become immediately infested by numberless creatures of matter and instinct the bad demons of the theurgists, the devils of theology, the gnomes, salamanders, sylphs, and undines will assail the rash performer under multifarious aerial forms. Unable to invent anything, they will search your memory to its very depths, hence the nervous exhaustion and mental oppression of certain sensitive natures at spiritual circles. The elementals will bring to light long forgotten remembrances of the past, forms, images, sweet mementos, and familiar sentences, long since faded from our own remembrance, but vividly preserved in the inscrutable depths of our memory and on the astral tablets of the imperishable book of life. Every organized thing in this world, visible as well as invisible, has an element appropriate to itself. The fish lives and breathes in the water, the plant consumes carbonic acid which for animals and men produces death, 
Some beings are fitted for rarefied strata of air, others exist only in the densest. Life, to some, is dependent on sunlight, to others, upon darkness, and so the wise economy of nature adapts to each existing condition some living form. These analogies warrant the conclusion that, not only is there no unoccupied portion of universal nature, but also that for each thing that has life, special conditions are furnished, and, being furnished, they are necessary. Now, assuming p. 344. That there is an invisible side to the universe, the fixed habit of nature warrants the conclusion that this half is occupied, like the other half, and that each group of its occupants is supplied with the indispensable conditions of existence. It is as illogical to imagine that identical conditions are furnished to all, as it would be to maintain such a theory respecting the inhabitants of the domain of visible nature. That there are spirits implies that there is a diversity of spirits, for men differ, and human spirits are but disembodied men. To say that all spirits are alike, or fitted to the same atmosphere, or possess of like powers, or governed by the same attractions electric, magnetic, otic, astral, it matters not which is as absurd as though one should say that all planets have the same nature, or that all animals are amphibious, or all men can be nourished on the same food. It accords with reason to suppose that the grossest natures among the spirits will sink to the lowest depths of the spiritual atmosphere in other words be found nearest to the earth. Inversely, the Pyrrhus would be farthest away. And what, were we to coin a word, we should call the psychomatics of occultism, it is as unwarrantable to assume that either of these grades of spirits can occupy the place, or subsist in the conditions, of the other, as in hydraulics it would be to expect that two liquids of different densities could exchange their markings on the scale of Bohm's hydrometer. Guards, describing a conversation he had with some Hindus of the Malabar coast, reports that upon asking them whether they had ghosts among them, they replied, yes, but we know them to be bad spirits, good ones can hardly ever appear at all. They are principally the spirits of suicides and murderers, or of those who die violent deaths. They constantly flutter about and appear as phantoms. Nighttime is favorable to them, they seduce the feeble-minded and tempt others in a thousand different ways. Porphyry presents to us some hideous facts whose verity is substantiated in the experience of every student of magic. The soul, says he, having even after death a certain affection for its body, an affinity proportioned to the violence with which their union was broken, we see many spirits hovering in despair about their earthly remains, we even see them eagerly seeking the putrid remains of other bodies, but above all freshly spilled blood, which seems to impart to them for the moment some of the faculties of life. P. 345. Let spiritualists who doubt the theurgist, try the effect of about half a pound of freshly drawn human blood at their next materializing seance. The gods and the angels, says the Omblicus, appear to us among peace and harmony, the bad demons, in tossing everything in confusion. As to the ordinary souls, we can perceive them more rarely, etc. The human soul, the astral body, is a demon that our language may name genius says Apuleius. She is an immortal god, though in a certain sense she is born at the same time as the man in whom she is. Consequently, we may say that she dies in the same way that she is born. The soul is born in this world upon leaving another world, animal mundi, in which her existence precedes the one we all know, on earth. Thus, the gods who consider her proceedings in all the phases of various existences and as a whole, punish her sometimes for sins committed during an interior life. She dies when she separates herself from a body in which she crossed this life as in a frail bark. And this is, if I mistake not, the secret meaning of the tumulary inscription, so simple for the initiate, to the gods manies who lived. But this kind of death does not annihilate the soul, it only transforms it into a lemur. Lemurs are the manies or ghosts, which we know under the name of lares. When they keep away and show us a beneficent protection, we honor in them the protecting divinities of the family hearth, but, if their crimes sentence them to err, we call them larvae. They become a plague for the wicked, and the vain terror of the good. This language can hardly be called ambiguous, and yet, the reincarnationists quote Apuleius in corroboration of their theory that man passes through a succession of physical human births upon this planet, until he is finally purged from the dross of his nature. But Apuleius distinctly says that we come upon this earth from another one, where we had an existence, the recollection of which has faded away. As the watch passes from hand to hand and room to room in a factory, one part being added here and another there, until the delicate machine is perfected, 
according to the design conceived in the mind of the master before the work was begun. So, according to ancient philosophy, the first divine conception of man takes shape little by little, in the several departments of the universal workshop, and the perfect human being finally appears on our scene. This philosophy teaches that nature never leaves her work unfinished. p. 346. If baffled at the first attempt, she tries again. When she evolves the human embryo, the intention is that a man shall be perfected physically, intellectually, and spiritually. His body is to grow mature, wear out, and die, his mind unfold, ripen, and be harmoniously balanced, his divine spirit illuminate and blend easily with the inner man. No human being completes its grand cycle, or the circle of necessity, until all these are accomplished. As the laggards in a race struggle and plod in their first quarter while the victor darts past the goal, so, in the race of immortality, some souls outspeed all the rest and reach the end, while their myriad competitors are toiling under the load of matter, close to the starting point. Some unfortunates fall out entirely, and lose all chance of the prize, some retrace their steps and begin again. This is what the Hindu dreads above all things transmigration and reincarnation, only on other and inferior planets, never on this one. But there is a way to avoid it, and Buddha taught it in his doctrine of poverty, restriction of the senses, perfect indifference to the objects of this earthly veil of tears, freedom from passion, and frequent intercommunication with the Atma soul contemplation. The cause of reincarnation is ignorance of our senses, and the idea that there is any reality in the world, anything except abstract existence. From the organs of sense comes the hallucination we call contact, from contact, desire, from desire, sensation, which also is a deception of our body, from sensation, the cleaving to existing bodies, from this cleaving, reproduction, and from reproduction, disease, decay, and death. Thus, like the revolutions of a wheel, there is a regular succession of death and birth, the moral cause of which is the cleaving to existing objects, while the instrumental cause is karma, the power which controls the universe, prompting it to activity, merit and demerit. It is, therefore, the great desire of all beings who would be released from the sorrows of successive birth, to seek the destruction of the moral cause, the cleaving to existing objects, or evil desire. They, in whom evil desire is entirely destroyed, are called arhats. Freedom from evil desire ensures the possession of a miraculous power. At his death, the Arya is never reincarnated, he invariably attains nirvana a word, by the by, falsely interpreted by the Christian scholars and skeptical commentators. Nirvana is the world of cause, in which all deceptive effects or delusions of our senses disappear. Nirvana is the highest attainable sphere. The Petrus, the pre-Adamic spirits, are considered as reincarnated, by the Buddhistic philosopher, though in a degree far superior to that of the man of earth. Do they not die in their turn? Do not their astral bodies? p. 347. Suffer and rejoice, and feel the same curse of illusionary feelings as when embodied? What Buddha taught in the 6th century, B.C., in India, Pythagoras taught in the 5th, in Greece and Italy. Given shows how deeply the Pharisees were impressed with this belief in the transmigration of souls. The Egyptian circle of necessity is ineffaceably stamped on the hoary monuments of old. And Jesus, when healing the sick, invariably used the following expression, Thy sins are forgiven thee. This is a pure Buddhistical doctrine. The Jews said to the blind man, Thou wast altogether born in sins, and dost thou teach us? The doctrine of the disciples, of Christ, is analogous to the merit and demerit of the Buddhists, for the sick were covered, if their sins were forgiven. But, this formal life believed in by the Buddhists, is not a life on this planet, for, more than any other people, the Buddhistical philosopher appreciated the great doctrine of cycles. The speculations of Dupuy, Volney, and Godfrey Higgins on the secret meaning of the cycles, or the Kalpas and the Yugs of the Brahmins and Buddhists, amounted to little, as they did not have the key to the esoteric, spiritual doctrine therein contained. No philosophy ever speculated on God as an abstraction, but considered him under his various manifestations. The first cause of the Hebrew Bible, the Pythagorean monad, the one existence of the Hindu philosopher, and the Kabbalistic ends off the boundless are identical. The Hindu Bhagavan does not create, he enters the egg of the world, and emanates from it as Brahm, in the same manner as the Pythagorean do it evolves from the highest and solitary monas. The monas of the Simeon Philo. p. 348. Sophra is the Hindu monas, mind, 
who has no first cause, a porvo, or material cause, nor is liable to destruction. Brahma, as Prajapati, manifests himself first of all as twelve bodies, or attributes, which are represented by the twelve gods, symbolizing one, fire, two, the sun, three, soma, which gives omissions, four, all living beings, five, vayu, or material ether, six, death, or breath of destruction Shiva, seven, earth, eight, heaven, nine, agni, the immaterial fire, ten, aditya, the immaterial and female invisible sun, eleven, mind, twelve, the great infinite cycle, which is not to be stopped. After that, Brahma dissolves himself into the visible universe, every atom of which is himself. When this is done, the not manifested, indivisible, and indefinite monas retires into the undisturbed and majestic solitude of its unity. The manifested deity, a do it at first, now becomes a triad, its trying quality emanates incessantly spiritual powers, who become immortal gods, souls. Each of these souls must be united in its turn with a human being, and from the moment of its consciousness it commences a series of births and deaths. An Eastern artist has attempted to give pictorial expression to the Kabbalistic doctrine of the cycles. The picture covers a whole inner wall of a subterranean temple in the neighborhood of a great Buddhistic pagoda, and is strikingly suggestive. Let us attempt to convey some idea of the design, as we recall it. Imagine a given point in space as the primordial one, then with compasses draw a circle around this point, where the beginning and the end unite together, emanation and reabsorption meet. The circle itself is composed of innumerable smaller circles, like the rings of a bracelet, and each of these minor rings forms the belt of the goddess which represents that sphere. As the curve of the arc approaches the ultimate point of the semicircle, the nadir of the grand cycle at which is placed or planted by the mystical painter, the face of each successive goddess becomes more dark and hideous than European imagination is able to conceive. Every belt is covered with the representations of plants, animals, and human beings, belonging to the fauna flora, and anthropology of that particular sphere. There is a certain distance between each of the spheres, purposely marked, for, after the accomplishment of the circles through. p. 349. Various transmigrations, the soul is allowed a time of temporary nirvana, during which space of time the Agma loses all remembrance of past sorrows. The intermediate ethereal space is filled with strange beings. Those between the highest ether and the earth below are the creatures of a middle nature, nature spirits, or, as the Kabbalists term it sometimes, the elementary. This picture is either a copy of the one described to posterity by Barassus, the priest of the Temple of Belus, at Babylon, or the original. We leave it to the shrewdness of the modern archaeologists to decide. But the wall is covered with precisely such creatures as described by the semi-demon, or half-god, Oannes, the Chaldean manfish, hideous beings, which were produced of a twofold principle the astral light and the grosser matter. Even remains of architectural relics of the earliest races have been sadly neglected by antiquarians, until now. The caverns of Agenta, which are but 200 miles from Bombay, and the Chandor Range, and the ruins of the ancient city of Aurangabad, whose crumbling palaces and curious tombs have lain in desolate solitude for many centuries, have attracted attention but very recently. Mementos of long bygone civilization, they were allowed to become the shelter of wild beasts for ages before they were found worthy of a scientific exploration, and it is only recently that the observer gave an enthusiastic description of these archaic ancestors of Herculaneum and Pompeii. After justly blaming the local government which has provided a bungalow where the traveler may find shelter and safety, but that is all, it proceeds to narrate the wonders to be seen in this retired spot, in the following words. In a deep glen away up the mountain there is a group of cave temples which are the most wonderful caverns on the earth. It is not known at the present age how many of these exist in the deep recesses of the mountains, but twenty-seven have been explored, surveyed, and, to some extent, cleared of rubbish. There are, doubtless, many others. It is hard to realize with what indefatigable toil these wonderful caves have been hewn from the solid rock of amygdaloid. They are said to have been wholly Buddhist in their origin and were used for purposes of worship and asceticism. They rank very high as works of art. They extend over 500 feet along the high cliff, and are carved in the most curious manner, exhibiting, in a wonderful degree, the taste, talent, and persevering industry of the Hindu sculptors. p. 350. These cave temples are beautifully cut and carved on the outside, but inside they were finished most elaborately, 
and decorated with a vast profusion of sculptures and paintings. These long deserted temples have suffered from dampness and neglect, and the paintings and frescoes are not what they were hundreds of years ago. But the colors are still brilliant, and scenes gay and festive still appear upon the walls. Some of the figures cut in the rock are taken for marriage processions and scenes in domestic life that are represented as joyful. The female figures are beautiful, delicate, and fair as Europeans. Every one of these representations is artistic, and all of them are unpolluted by any grossness or obscenity generally so prominent in Brahmanical representations of a similar character. These caves are visited by a great number of antiquarians, who are striving to decipher the hieroglyphics inscribed on the walls and determine the age of these curious temples. The ruins of the ancient city Aurangabad are not very far from these caves. It was a walled city of great repute, but is now deserted. There are not only broken walls, but crumbling palaces. They were built of immense strength, and some of the walls appear as solid as the everlasting hills. There are a great many places in this vicinity where there are Hindu remains, consisting of deep caves and rock-cut temples. Many of these temples are surrounded by a circular enclosure, which is often adorned with statues and columns. The figure of an elephant is very common, placed before or beside the opening of a temple, as a sort of sentinel. Hundreds and thousands of niches are beautifully cut in the solid rock, and when these temples were thronged with worshippers, each niche had a statue or image, usually in the florid style of these oriental sculptures. It is a sad truth that almost every image here is shamefully defaced and mutilated. It is often said that no Hindu will bow down to an imperfect image, and that the Mohammedans, knowing this, purposely mutilated all these images to prevent the Hindus from worshipping them. This is regarded by the Hindus as sacrilegious and blasphemous, awakening the keenest animosities, which every Hindu inherits from his father, and which centuries have not been able to efface. Here also are the remains of buried cities sad ruins generally without a single inhabitant. And the grand palaces where royalty once gathered and held festivals, wild bees find their hiding places. In several places the track of the railway has been constructed over or through these ruins, and the material has been used for the bed of the road. Enormous stones have remained in their places for thousands of years, and probably will for thousands of years to come. These rock. p. 351. Cut temples, as well as these mutilated statues, show a workmanship that no work now being done by the natives can equal. It is very evident that hundreds of years since these hills were alive with a vast multitude, where now it is all or desolation, without cultivation or inhabitants, and given over to wild beasts. It is good hunting ground, and, as the English are mighty hunters, they may prefer to have these mountains and ruins remain without change. We fervently hope they will. Enough vandalism was perpetrated in earlier ages to permit us to hope that at least in this century of exploration and learning, science, and its branches of archaeology and philology, will not be deprived of these most precious records, wrought on imperishable tablets of granite and rock. We will now present a few fragments of this mysterious doctrine of reincarnation as distinct from metempsychosis which we have from an authority. Reincarnation, i.e., the appearance of the same individual, or rather of his astral monad, twice on the same planet, is not a rule in nature, it is an exception, like the teratological phenomenon of a two-headed infant. It is preceded by a violation of the laws of harmony of nature, and happens only when the latter, seeking to restore its disturbed equilibrium violently throws back into earth life the astral monad which had been tossed out of the circle of necessity by crime or accident. Thus, in cases of abortion, of infants dying before a certain age, and of congenital and incurable idiocy, nature's original design to produce a perfect human being, has been interrupted. Therefore, while the gross matter of each of these several entities is suffered to disperse itself at death, through the vast realm of being, the immortal spirit and astral monad of the individual the latter having been set apart to animate a frame and the former to shed its divine light on the corporeal organization must try a second time to carry out the purpose of the creative intelligence. If reason has been so far developed as to become active and discriminative, there is no reincarnation on this earth, for the three parts of the trine man have been united together, and he is capable of running the race. But when the new being has not passed beyond the condition of monad, or when, as in the idiot, the trinity has not been completed, the immortal spark which illuminates it, has to re-enter on the earthly plane as it was frustrated in its first attempt. Otherwise, the mortal or astral. p. 352. And the immortal or divine, souls, could not progress in unison and pass onward to the sphere above. 
Spirit follows a line parallel with that of matter, and the spiritual evolution goes hand in hand with the physical. As in the case exemplified by Professor Leconti, Vidi Chap. 9. There is no force in nature and the rule applies to the spiritual as well as to the physical evolution which is capable of raising at one spirit or matter from number 1 to number 3, or from 2 to 4, without stopping and receiving an accession of force of a different kind on the intermediate plane. That is to say, the monad which was imprisoned in the elementary being the rudimentary or lowest astral form of the future man after having passed through and quitted the highest physical shape of a dumb animal say an orangutan, or again an elephant, one of the most intellectual of brutes that monad, we say, cannot skip over the physical and intellectual sphere of the terrestrial man, and be suddenly ushered into the spiritual sphere above. What reward or punishment can there be in that sphere of disembodied human entities for a fetus or a human embryo which had not even time to breathe on this earth, still less an opportunity to exercise the divine faculties of the spirit? Or, for an irresponsible infant, whose senseless monad remaining dormant within the astral and physical casket, could as little prevent him from burning himself as another person to death? Or for one idiotic from birth, the number of whose cerebral circumvolutions is only from 20 to 30 percent of those of sane persons, and who therefore is irresponsible for either his disposition, acts, or the imperfections of his vagrant, half-developed intellect? No need to remark that if even hypothetical, this theory is no more ridiculous than many others considered as strictly orthodox. We must not forget that either through the inaptness of the specialists or some other reason, physiology itself is the least advanced or understood of sciences, and that some French physicians, with Dr. Fournier, positively despair of ever progressing in it beyond pure hypotheses. Further, the same occult doctrine recognizes another possibility, albeit so rare and so vague that it is really useless to mention it. Even the modern Occidental occultists deny it, though it is universally accepted in Eastern countries. When, through vice, fearful crimes and animal passions, a disembodied spirit has fallen to the eighth sphere the allegorical Hades, and the Gehenna of the Bible the nearest to our earth he can, with the help of that glimpse of reason and consciousness left to him, repent, that is to say, he can, by exercising the remnants of his willpower, strive upward, and like a drowning man, struggle once more to the sword. p. 353. Face. In the magical and philosophical precepts of Celis, we find one which, warning mankind, says, Stoop not down, for a precipice lies below the earth. Drawing under a descent of seven steps, beneath which is the throne of dire necessity. A strong aspiration to retrieve his calamities, a pronounced desire, will draw him once more into the earth's atmosphere. Here he will wander and suffer more or less in dreary solitude. His instincts will make him seek with avidity contact with living persons. These spirits are the invisible but too tangible magnetic vampires, the subjective demons so well known to medieval ecstatics, nuns, and monks, to the witches made so famous in the witch hammer, and to certain sensitive clairvoyants, according to their own confessions. They are the blood demons of porphyry, the larvae and lemurs of the ancients, the fiendish instruments which sent so many unfortunate and weak victims to the rack and stake. Origen held all the demons which possessed the demoniacs mentioned in the New Testament to be human spirits. It is because Moses knew so well what they were, and how terrible were the consequences to weak persons who yielded to their influence that he enacted the cruel, murderous law against such would-be witches, but Jesus, full of justice and divine love to humanity, healed instead of killing them. Subsequently our clergy, the pretended exemplars of Christian principles, followed the law of Moses, and quietly ignored the law of him whom they call their one living God, by burning dozens of thousands of such pretended witches. Which, mighty name, which in the past contained the promise of ignominious death, and in the present has but to be pronounced to raise a whirlwind of ridicule, a tornado of sarcasms. How is it then that there have always been men of intellect and learning, who never thought that it would disgrace their reputation for learning, or lower their dignity, to publicly affirm the possibility of such a thing as a witch, and the correct acceptation of the word? One such fearless champion was Henry Moore, the learned scholar of Cambridge, of the 17th century. It is well worth our while to see how cleverly he handled the question. It appears that about the year 1678, a certain divine, named John Webster, wrote criticisms and interpretations of scripture, against the existence of witches, and other superstitions. Finding the work a weak and impertinent piece, Dr. Moore criticized it in a letter to Glanville, the author of Sadducismus Triumphatus, 
and as an appendix and a p 354 treatise on witchcraft and explanations of the word witch itself this document is very rare but we possess it in a fragmentary form in an old manuscript having seen it mentioned besides only in an insignificant work of 1820 on apparitions for it appears that the document itself was long since out of print the words witch and wizard according to dr moore signify no more than a wise man or a wise woman and the word wizard it is plain at the very sight and the most plain and least operose deduction of the name witch is from wit whose derived adjective might be witty or wittage and by contraction afterwards witch as the noun wit is from the verb debate which is to know so that a witch thus far is no more than a knowing woman which answers exactly to the latin word saga according to that of festus sicae dictae anus quae multiscine this definition of the word appears to us the more plausible as it exactly answers the evident meaning of the slavonian russian names for witches and wizards the former is called vidma and the latter vidmik both from the verb to know vedat or vidat the root moreover being positively sanskrit veda says max muller in his lecture on the vedas means originally knowing or knowledge veda is the same word which appears in greek omicron iota delta alpha i know the digamma fav being omitted and in the english wise wisdom to wit furthermore the sanskrit word vidma answering to the german vir wissen means literally we know it is a great pity that the eminent philologist while giving in his lecture the sanskrit greek gothic anglo-saxon and german comparative roots of this word has neglected the slavonian another russian appellation for witch and wizard the former being purely slavonian is nahar and zaharka feminine from the same verbs not to know thus dr moore's definition of the word given in 1678 is perfectly correct and coincides in every particular with modern philology use says this scholar questionless had appropriated the word to such a kind of skill and knowledge as was out of the common road or extraordinary nor did this peculiarity imply any unlawfulness but there was after a further restriction in which alone nowadays the words witch and wizard are used and that is for one that has the knowledge and skill of doing or telling things in an extraordinary way and that in virtue of either an express or implicit association or confederacy with some bad spirits in the clause of the severe law of moses so many names are reckoned up with that of which that it is difficult as well as useless to give here the definition of every one of them as found in drive p three hundred fifty five moore's able treatise there shall not be found among you any one that uses divination or an observer of time or an enchanter or a witch or a charmer or a consulter with familiar spirits or a wizard or a necromancer says the text we will show further on the real object of such severity for the present we will remark that Dr. Moore, after giving a learned definition of every one of such appellations, and showing the value of their real meaning in the days of Moses, proves that there is a vast difference between the enchanters, observers of time, etc., and a witch. So many names are reckoned up in this prohibition of Moses, that, as in our common law, the sense may be more sure, and leave no room to evasion, and that the name of which is not from any tricks of ledger domain as in common jugglers, that delude the sight of the people at a market or fair, but that it is the name of such as raise magical spectres to deceive men's sight, and so are most certainly witches women and men who have a bad spirit in them. Thou shalt not suffer Mechisethel, that is, a witch, to live, which would be a law of extreme severity, or rather cruelty, against the poor hocus-pocus for his tricks of legerdemain. Thus, it is but the sixth appellation, that of a consulter with familiar spirits or a witch that had to incur the greatest penalty of the law of moses for it is only a witch which must not be suffered to live while all the others are simply enumerated as such with whom the people of israel were forbidden to communicate on account of their idolatry or rather religious views and learning chiefly this sixth word is shul ap which our english translation renders a consulter with familiar spirits but which the septuagint translates epsilon nu gamma alpha sigma tau rho iota mu epsilon theta omicron sigma one that has a familiar spirit inside him, one possessed with the spirit of divination, which was considered to be python by the Greeks, and awe by the Hebrews, the old serpent, and its esoteric meaning the spirit of concupiscence and matter, which, according to the Kabbalists, is always an elementary human spirit of the eighth sphere. Shul Og, I conceive, says Henry Moore, 
is to be understood of the witch herself who asks counsel of her or is familiar. The reason of the name Ob was taken first from that spirit that was in the body of the party, and swelled it to a protuberancy, the voice always seeming to come out as from a bottle, for which reason they were named ventriloquists. Obi signifies as much as Pytho, which at first took its name from the Pythia of Apes, a spirit that tells hidden things, or things to come. In Acts 16. 16. Pinu Epsilon Upsilon Mu Alpha Pi Upsilon Theta Omicron Nu Omicron Sigma, when Paul being grieved, turned and said to that spirit, I command thee, in the name of Jesus Christ, to come out of her, and he came out at the same hour. Therefore, the words obsess or possess are synonyms of the word which, nor could this. p. 356. Pytho of the eighth sphere come out of her, unless it was a spirit distinct from her. And so it is that we see in Leviticus 20. 27. A man also or woman that hath a familiar spirit, or that is a wizard, an irresponsible jitignoni, shall surely be put to death, they shall stone them with stones, their blood shall be upon them. A cruel and unjust law beyond doubt, and one which gives a lie to a recent utterance of spirits, by the mouth of one of the most popular inspirational mediums of the day, to the effect that modern philological research proves that the Mosaic law never contemplated the killing of the poor mediums or witches of the Old Testament, but that the words, Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live, meant to live by their mediumship, that is, to gain their livelihood. An interpretation no less ingenious than novel. Certainly, nowhere short of the source of such inspiration could we find such philological profundity. Shut the door in the face of the demon, says the Kabbalah, and he will keep running away from you, as if you pursued him, which means, that you must not give a hold on you to such spirits of obsession by attracting them into an atmosphere of congenial sin. These demons seek to introduce themselves into the bodies of the simple-minded and idiots, and remain there until dislodged therefrom by a powerful and pure will. Jesus, Apollonius, and some of the apostles, had the power to cast out devils, by purifying the atmosphere within and without the patient, so as to force the unwelcome tenant to flight. Certain volatile salts are particularly obnoxious to them, and the effect of the chemicals used in a saucer, and placed under the bed by Mr. Varley, of London, for the purpose of keeping away some disagreeable. p. 357. Physical phenomena at night are corroborative of this great truth. Pure or even simply inoffensive human spirits fear nothing, for having rid themselves of terrestrial matter, terrestrial compounds can affect them in no wise, such spirits are like a breath. Not so with the earthbound souls and the nature spirits. It is for these carnal terrestrial larvae, degraded human spirits, that the ancient Kabbalists entertained a hope of reincarnation. But when, or how? At a fitting moment, and if helped by a sincere desire for his amendment and repentance by some strong, sympathizing person, or the will of an adept, or even a desire emanating from the erring spirit himself, provided it is powerful enough to make him throw off the burden of sinful matter. Losing all consciousness, the once bright monad is caught once more into the vortex of our terrestrial evolution, and it repasses the subordinate kingdoms, and again breathes as a living child. To compute the time necessary for the completion of this process would be impossible. Since there is no perception of time and eternity, the attempt would be a mere waste of labor. As we have said, but few Kabbalists believe in it, and this doctrine originated with certain astrologers. While casting out the nativities of certain historical personages renowned for some peculiarities of disposition, they found the conjunction of the planets answering perfectly to remarkable oracles and prophesies about other persons born ages later. Observation, and what would now be termed remarkable coincidences, added to revelation during the sacred sleep of the neophyte, disclosed the dreadful truth. So horrible is the thought that even those who ought to be convinced of it prefer ignoring it, or at least avoid speaking on the subject. This way of obtaining oracles was practiced in the highest antiquity. In India, the sublime lethargy is called the sacred sleep of it is an oblivion into which the subject is thrown by certain magical processes, supplemented by drafts of the juice of the soma. The body of the sleeper remains for several days in a condition resembling death, and by the power of the adept is purified of its earthliness and made fit. p. 358. To become the temporary receptacle of the brightness of the immortal Agoides. In this state the torpid body is made to reflect the glory of the upper spheres, as a burnished mirror does the rays of the sun. The sleeper takes no note of the lapse of time, but upon awakening, after four or five days of trance, imagines he has slept but a few moments. 
What his lips utter he will never know, but as it is the spirit which directs them they can pronounce nothing but divine truth. For the time being the poor helpless clod is made the shrine of the sacred presence, and converted into an oracle a thousand times more infallible than the asphyxiated Pythoness of Delphi, and, unlike her mantic frenzy, which was exhibited before the multitude, this holy sleep is witnessed only within the sacred precinct by those few of the adepts who are worthy to stand in the presence of the Adonai. The description which Isaiah gives of the purification necessary for a prophet to undergo before he is worthy to be the mouthpiece of heaven, applies to the case in point. In customary metaphor he says, Then flew one of the seraphim unto me having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar, and he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo! This hath touched thy lips and thine iniquity is taken away. The invocation of his own agoides, by the purified adept, is described in words of unparalleled beauty by Bulwer Lighten and Zanoni, and there he gives us to understand that the slightest touch of mortal passion unfits the higher fan to hold communion with his spotless soul. Not only are there few who can successfully perform the ceremony, but even these rarely resort to it except for the instruction of some neophytes, and to obtain knowledge of the most solemn importance. And yet how little is the knowledge treasured up by these hierophants understood or appreciated by the general public. There is another collection of writings and traditions bearing the title of Kabbalah, attributed to Oriental scholars, says the author of Art Magic, but as this remarkable work is of little or no value without a key, which can only be furnished by Oriental fraternities, its transcript would be of no value to the general reader. And how they are ridiculed by every Houndsditch commercial traveler who wanders through India in pursuit of orders and rights to the times, and misrepresented by every nimble-fingered trickster who pretends to show by ledger domain, to the gaping crowd, the feats of true Oriental magicians. But, notwithstanding his unfairness in the Algerian affair, Robert Udine, an authority on the art of prestidigitation, and Moro Sinti. P. 359. Another, gave honest testimony in behalf of the French mediums. They both testified, when cross-examined by the academicians, that none but the mediums could possibly produce the phenomena of table wrapping and levitation without a suitable preparation and furniture adapted for the purpose. They also showed that the so-called levitations without contact were feats utterly beyond the power of the professional juggler, that for them, such levitations, unless produced in a room supplied with secret machinery and concave mirrors, was impossible. They added moreover, that the simple apparition of a diaphanous hand, in a place in which confederacy would be rendered impossible, the medium having been previously searched, would be a demonstration that it was the work of no human agency, whatever else that agency might be. The Siecla, and other Parisian newspapers immediately published their suspicions that these two professional and very clever gentlemen had become the confederates of the spiritists. Professor Pepper, director of the Polytechnic Institute of London, invented a clever apparatus to produce spiritual appearances on the stage, and sold his patent in 1863, in Paris, for the sum of 20,000 francs. The phantoms looked real and were evanescent, being but an effect produced by the reflection of a highly illuminated object upon the surface of plaque glass. They seemed to appear and disappear, to walk about the stage and play their parts to perfection. Sometimes one of the phantoms placed himself on a bench, after which, one of the living actors would begin quarreling with him, and, seizing a heavy hatchet, would part the head and body of the ghost in two. But, joining his two parts again, the spectre would reappear, a few steps off, to the amazement of the public. The contrivance worked marvelously well, and nightly attracted large crowds. But to produce these ghosts required a stage apparatus, and more than one confederate. There were nevertheless some reporters who made this exhibition the pretext for ridiculing the spiritists as though the two classes of phenomena had the slightest connection. What the pepper ghosts pretended to do, genuine disembodied human spirits, when their reflection is materialized by the elementals, can actually perform. They will permit themselves to be perforated with bullets or the sword, or to be dismembered, and then instantly form themselves anew. But the case is different with both cosmic and human elementary spirits, for a sword or dagger, or even a pointed stick, will cause them to vanish in terror. This will seem unaccountable to those who do not understand of what a material substance the elementary are composed, but the Kabbalists understand perfectly. The records of antiquity and of the Middle Ages, to say nothing of the modern wonders at Sideville, which have been judicially attested for us, corroborate these facts. p. 360. Skeptics, and even skeptical spiritualists, have often unjustly accused mediums of fraud, 
when denied what they considered their inalienable right to test the spirits. But where there is one such case, there are fifty in which spiritualists have permitted themselves to be practiced upon by tricksters, while they neglected to appreciate genuine manifestations procured for them by their mediums. Ignorant of the laws of mediumship, such do not know that when an honest medium is once taken possession of by spirits, whether disembodied or elemental, he is no longer his own master. He cannot control the actions of the spirits, nor even his own. They make him a puppet to dance at their pleasure while they pull the wires behind the scenes. The false medium may seem entranced, and yet be playing tricks all the while, while the real medium may appear to be in full possession of his senses, when in fact he is far away, and his body is animated by his Indian guide, or control. Or, he may be entranced in his cabinet, while his astral body, double, or doppelganger, is walking about the room moved by another intelligence. Among all the phenomena, that of repercussion, closely allied with those of bilocation and aerial traveling, is the most astounding. In the Middle Ages it was included under the head of sorcery. De Gasparin, in his refutations of the miraculous character of the marvels of Sideville, treats of the subject at length, but these pretended explanations were all in their turn exploded by de Merville and de Musos, who, while failing in their attempt to trace the phenomena back to the devil, did, nevertheless, prove their spiritual origin. The prodigy of repercussion, says de Musos, occurs when a blow aimed at the spirit, visible or otherwise, of an absent living person, or at the phantom which represents him, strikes this person himself, at the same time, and in the very place at which the spectre or his double is touched. We must suppose, therefore, that the blow is repercussed, and that it reaches, as if rebounding, from the image of the living person his phantasmal duplicate the original, wherever he may be, in flesh and blood. Thus, for instance, an individual appears before me, or, remaining invisible, declares war, threatens, and causes me to be threatened with obsession. I strike at the place where I perceive his phantom, where I hear him moving, where I feel somebody, something which molests and resists me. I strike, the blood will appear sometimes on this place, and occasionally a scream may be heard, he is wounded perhaps, dead. It is done, and I have explained the fact. P. 361. Notwithstanding that, at the moment I struck him, his presence in another place is authentically proved, I saw yes, I saw plainly the phantom hurt upon the cheek or shoulder, and this same wound is found precisely on the living person, repercussed upon his cheek or shoulder. Thus, it becomes evident that the facts of repercussion have an intimate connection with those of bilocation or duplication, either spiritual or corporeal. The history of the Salem witchcraft, as we find it recorded in the works of Cotton Mather, Caliph, Upham, and others, furnishes a curious corroboration of the fact of the double, as it also does of the effects of allowing elementary spirits to have their own way. This tragical chapter of American history has never yet been written in accordance with the truth. A party of four or five young girls had become developed as mediums, by sitting with a West Indian Negro woman, a practitioner of obia. They began to suffer all kinds of physical torture, such as pinching, having pins stuck in them, and the marks of bruises and teeth on different parts of their bodies. They would declare that they were hurt by the specters of various persons, and we learn from the celebrated narrative of Day. Lawson, London, 1704, that some of them confessed that they did afflict the sufferers, i.e., these young girls, according to the time and manner they were accused thereof, and, being asked what they did to afflict them, some said that they pricked pins into poppets, made with rags, wax, and other materials. One that confessed after the signing of her death warrant, said she used to afflict them by clutching and pinching her hands together, and wishing in what part and after what manner she would have them afflicted, and it was done. Mr. Upham tells us that Abigail Hobbs, one of these girls, acknowledged that she had confederated with the devil, who came to her in the shape of a man, and commanded her to afflict the girls, bringing images made of wood in their likeness, with thorns for her to prick into the images, which she did, whereupon, the girls cried out that they were hurt by her. P. 362. How perfectly these facts, the validity of which was proven by unimpeachable testimony in court, go to corroborate the doctrine of Paracelsus. It is surpassingly strange that so ripe a scholar as Mr. Upham should have accumulated into the 1,000 pages of his two volumes such a mass of legal evidence, going to show the agency of earthbound souls and tricksy nature spirits in these tragedies, without suspecting the truth. Ages ago, the old Aeneas was made by Lucretius to say, 
bis duo sunt homens, manes, caro, spiritus umbra. Quator is the loci bis duo sisiparent. Teratigit carnem, tumulum circumvolat umbra. Orcus hobbit manes. In this present case, as in every similar one, the scientists, being unable to explain the fact, assert that it cannot exist. But we will now give a few historical instances going to show that some diamonds, or elementary spirits, are afraid of sword, knife, or anything sharp. We do not pretend to explain the reason. That is the province of physiology and psychology. Unfortunately, physiologists have not yet been able to even establish the relations between speech and thought, and so, have handed it over to the metaphysicians, who, in their turn, according to Fournier, have done nothing. Done nothing we say, but claimed everything. No fact could be presented to some of them, that was too large for these learned gentlemen to at least try to stuff into their pigeonholes, labeled with some fancy Greek name, expressive of everything else but the true nature of the phenomenon. Alas, alas! My son! exclaims the wise Mufti, of Aleppo, to his son Ibrahim, who choked himself with the head of a huge fish. When will you realize that your stomach is smaller than the ocean? Or, as Mrs. Catherine Crow remarks in her Night Side of Nature, when will our scientists admit that their intellects are no measure of God Almighty's designs? We will not ask which of the ancient writers mentioned facts of seemingly supernatural nature, but rather which of them does not? In Homer, we find Ulysses evoking the spirit of his friend, the soothsayer Tiresias. Preparing for the ceremony of the Festival of Blood, Ulysses draws his sword, and thus frightens away the thousands of phantoms attracted by the sacrifice. The friend himself, the so long expected Tiresias, dares not approach him so long as Ulysses holds the dreaded weapon in his hand. Aeneas prepares to descend to the kingdom of the shadows, and as soon as they approach its entrance, the Sibyl who, p. 363, guides him utters her warning to the Trojan hero, and orders him to draw his sword and clear himself a passage through the dense crowd of flitting forms. To invade Vium, Vaginic Ferum. Glanville gives a wonderful narrative of the apparition of the drummer of Tedworth, which happened in 1661, in which the skin like a, or double, of the drummer sorcerer was evidently very much afraid of the sword. Celis, in his work, gives a long story of his sister-in-law being thrown into a most fearful state by an elementary daimon taking possession of her. She was finally cured by a conjurer, a foreigner named Anaphalanges, who began by threatening the invisible occupant of her body with a naked sword until he finally dislodged him. Celis introduces a whole catechism of demonology, which he gives in the following terms, as far as we remember. You want to know, ask the conjurer, whether the bodies of the spirits can be hurt by sword or any other weapon? Yes, they can. Any hard substance striking them can make them sensible to pain, and though their bodies be made neither of solid nor firm substance, they feel it the same, for in beings endowed with sensibility it is not their nerves only which possess the faculty of feeling, but likewise also the spirit which resides in them, the body of a spirit can be sensible in its whole, as well as in each one of its parts. Without the help of any physical organism the spirit sees, hears, and if you touch him feels your touch. If you divide him in two, he will feel the pain as would any living man, for he is matter still, though so refined as to be generally invisible to our eye. One thing, however, distinguishes him from the living man, viz., that when a man's limbs are once divided, their parts cannot be reunited very easily. But, cut a demon in two, and you will see him immediately join himself together. As water or air closes in behind a solid body passing through it, and no trace is left, so does the body of a demon condense itself again, when the penetrative weapon is withdrawn from the wound. But every rent made in it causes him pain nevertheless. That is why diamonds dread the point of a sword or any sharp weapon. Let those who want to see them flee try the experiment. One of the most learned scholars of his century, Bowden, the Demonologian. p. 364. Held the same opinion, that both the human and cosmical elementaries were sorely afraid of swords and daggers. It is also the opinion of Porphyry, Iamblichus, and Plato. Plutarch mentions it several times. The practicing theurgists knew it well and acted accordingly, and many of the latter assert that the demons suffer from any rent made in their bodies. Bowden tells us a wonderful story to this effect, in his work on the demons, p. 292. I remember, says the author, that in 1557 an elemental demon, 
one of those who are called thundering, fell down with the lightning, into the house of Padot, the shoemaker, and immediately began flinging stones all about the room. We picked up so many of them that the landlady filled a large chest full, after having securely closed the windows and doors and locked the chest itself. But it did not prevent the demon in the least from introducing other stones into the room, but without injuring anyone for all that. Latimi, who was then quarter president, came to see what was the matter. Immediately upon his entrance, the spirit knocked the cap off his head and made him run away. It had lasted for over six days, when M. Jean Mourns, counselor at the Presidio, came to fetch me to see the mystery. When I entered the house, someone advised the master of it to pray to God with all his heart and to wheel round a sword in the air about the room. He did so. On that following day the landlady told us, that from that very moment they did not hear the least noise in the house, but that during the seven previous days that it lasted they could not get a moment's rest. The books on the witchcraft of the Middle Ages are full of such narratives. The very rare and interesting work of Glanville, called Sadducis Mis Triumphatus, ranks with that of Bowdoin, above mentioned, as one of the best. But we must give space now to certain narratives of the more ancient philosophers, who explain at the same time that they describe. And first in rank for wonders comes Proclus. His list of facts, most of which he supports by the citation of witnesses sometimes well-known philosophers is staggering. He records many instances in his time of dead persons who were found to have changed their recumbent positions in the sepulchre, for one of either sitting or standing, which he attributes to their being larvae, and which he says is related by the ancients of Aristides, Epimenides, and Hermodorus. He gives five such cases from the history of Clearchus, the disciple of Aristotle. 1. Cleonemus, the Athenian. 2. Polycritus, an illustrious man among the Aeolians. It is related by the historian Nomachius, that Polycritus died, and returned in the ninth month after his death. Hiero, the Ephesian, and other. p. 365. Historians, says his translator, Taylor, testify to the truth of this. 3. In Nicopolis, the same happened to one Uranus. The latter revived on the fifteenth day after his burial, and lived for some time after that, leading an exemplary life. 4. Rufus, a priest of Thessalonica, restored to life the third day after his death, for the purpose of performing certain sacred ceremonies according to promise, he fulfilled his engagement, and died again to return no more. 5. This is the case of one Philonia, who lived under the reign of Philip. She was the daughter of Demostratus and Trito of Amphipolos. Married against her wish to one Croterus, she died soon after. But in the sixth month after her death, she revived, as Proclus says, through her love of a youth named Machates, who came to her father Demostratus, from Pella. She visited him for many nights successively, but when this was finally discovered, she, or rather the vampire that represented her, died of rage. Previous to this she declared that she acted in this manner according to the will of terrestrial demons. Her dead body was seen at this second death by every one in the town, lying in her father's house. On opening the vault, where her body had been deposited, it was found empty by those of her relatives, who being incredulous upon that point, went to ascertain the truth. The narrative is corroborated by the epistles of Hipparchus and those of Aridaeus to Philip. Says Proclus, Many other of the ancients have collected a history of those that have apparently died, and afterward revived. Among these is the natural philosopher Democritus. In his writings concerning Hades, he affirms that, in a certain case under discussion, death was not, as it seemed, an entire desertion of the whole life of the body, but a cessation caused by some blow, or perhaps a wound, but the bonds of the soul yet remained rooted about the marrow, and the heart contained in its profundity the empire Roma of life, and this remaining it again acquired the life, which had been extinguished, in consequence of being adapted to animation. He says again, that it is possible for the soul to depart from and enter into the body, is evident from him, who, according to Clearchus, used a soul attracting one on a sleeping boy, and who persuaded Aristotle, as Clearchus relates in his treatise on sleep, that the soul may be separated from the body, and that it enters into a body and uses it as a lodging. For, striking the boy with the wand, he drew out, and, as it were, let his soul, for the purpose of evincing that the body was a mover. p. 366. Lay when the soul, astral body, was at a distance from it, and that it was preserved uninjured, but the soul being again led into the body by means of the wand, after its entrance, narrated every particular. 
From this circumstance, therefore, both the spectators and Aristotle were persuaded that the soul is separate from the body. It may be considered quite absurd to recall so often the facts of witchcraft, in the full light of the nineteenth century. But the century itself is getting old, and as it gradually approaches the fatal end, it seems as if it were falling into dotage. Not only does it refuse to recollect how abundantly the facts of witchcraft were proven, but it refuses to realize what has been going on for the last thirty years, all over the wide world. After a lapse of several thousand years we may doubt the magic powers of the Thessalonian priests and their sorceries, as mentioned by Pliny. We may throw discredit upon the information given us by Suidas, who narrates Medea's journey through the air, and thus forget that magic was the highest knowledge of natural philosophy, but how are we to dispose of the frequent occurrence of precisely such journeys through the air when they happen before our own eyes, and are corroborated by the testimony of hundreds of apparently sane persons? If the universality of a belief be a proof of its truth, few facts have been better established than that of sorcery. Every people, from the rudest to the most refined, we may also add in every age, have believed in the kind of supernatural agency, which we understand by this term, says Thomas Wright, the author of Sorcery and Magic and a skeptical member of the National Institute of France. It was founded on the equally extensive creed, that, besides our own visible existence, we live in an invisible world of spiritual beings, by which our actions and even our thoughts are often guided, and which have a certain degree of power over the elements and over the ordinary course of organic life. Further, marveling how this mysterious science flourished everywhere, and noticing several famous schools of magic in different parts of Europe, he explains the time-honored belief, and shows the difference between sorcery and magic as follows. The magician differed from the witch in this, that, while the latter was an ignorant instrument in the hands of the demons, the former had become their master by the powerful intermediation of science, which was only within reach of the few, and which these beings were unable to disobey. This delineation, established and known since the days of Moses, the author gives as derived from the most authentic sources. p. 367. If from this unbeliever we pass to the authority of an adept in that mysterious science, the anonymous author of Art Magic, we find him stating the following, the reader may inquire wherein consists the difference between a medium and a magician? The medium is one through whose astral spirit other spirits can manifest, making their presence known by various kinds of phenomena. Whatever these consist in, the medium is only a passive agent in their hands. He can neither command their presence, nor will their absence can never compel the performance of any special act, nor direct its nature. The magician, on the contrary, can summon and dismiss spirits at will, can perform many feats of occult power through his own spirit, can compel the presence and assistance of spirits of lower grades of being than himself, and effect transformations in the realm of nature upon animate and inanimate bodies. This learned author forgot to point out a marked distinction in mediumship, with which he must have been entirely familiar. Physical phenomena are the result of the manipulation of forces through the physical system of the medium, by the unseen intelligences, of whatever class. In a word, physical mediumship depends on a peculiar organization of the physical system, spiritual mediumship, which is accompanied by a display of subjective, intellectual phenomena, depends upon a like peculiar organization of the spiritual nature of the medium. As the potter from one lump of clay fashions a vessel of dishonor, and from another a vessel of honor, so, among physical mediums, the plastic astral spirit of one may be prepared for a certain class of objective phenomena, and that of another for a different one. Once so prepared, it appears difficult to alter the phase of mediumship, as when a bar of steel is forged into a certain shape, it cannot be used for any other than its original purpose without difficulty. As a rule, mediums who have been developed for one class of phenomena rarely change to another, but repeat the same performance ad infinitum. Psychography with a direct writing of messages by spirits, partakes of both forms of mediumship. The writing itself is an objective physical fact, while the sentiments it contains may be of the very noblest character. The latter depend entirely on the moral state of the medium. It does not require that he should be educated, to write philosophical treatises worthy of Aristotle, nor a poet, to write verses that would reflect honor upon a Byron or a Lamartine but it does require that the soul of the medium shall be pure enough to serve as a channel for spirits who are capable of giving utterance to such lofty sentiments. p. 368. In Art Magic, one of the most delightful pictures presented to us is that of an innocent little child medium, in whose presence, during the past three years, four volumes of MSS, and the ancient Sanskrit, have been written by the spirits, 
without pens, pencils, or ink. It is enough, says the author, to lay the blank sheets on a tripod, carefully screened from the direct rays of light, but still dimly visible to the eyes of attentive observers. The child sits on the ground and lays her head on the tripod, embracing its supports with her little arms. In this attitude she most commonly sleeps for an hour, during which time the sheets lying on the tripod are filled up with exquisitely formed characters in the ancient Sanskrit. This is so remarkable an instance of psychographic mediumship, and so thoroughly illustrates the principle we have above stated, that we cannot refrain from quoting a few lines from one of the Sanskrit writings, the more so as it embodies that portion of the hermetic philosophy relating to the antecedent state of man, which elsewhere we have less satisfactorily described. Man lives on many earths before he reaches this. Myriads of worlds swarm in space where the soul in rudimental states performs its pilgrimages, ere he reaches the large and shining planet named the Earth, the glorious function of which is to confer self-consciousness. At this point only is he man, at every other stage of his vast, wild journey he is but an embryonic being a fleeting, temporary shape of matter a creature in which a part, but only a part, of the high, imprisoned soul shines forth, a rudimental shape, with rudimental functions, ever living, dying, sustaining a flitting spiritual existence as rudimental as the material shape from whence it emerged, a butterfly, springing up from the chrysalidic shell, but ever, as it onward rushes, in new births, new deaths, new incarnations, and on to die and live again, but still stretch upward, still strive onward, still rush on the giddy, dreadful, toilsome, rugged path, until it awakens once more once more to live and be a material shape, a thing of dust, a creature of flesh and blood, but now a man. We witnessed once in India a trial of psychical skill between a holy Gossain and a sorcerer, which recurs to us in this connection. We had been discussing the relative powers of the Fakir's Petrus, pre Adamite spirits, and the juggler's invisible allies. A trial of skill was agreed upon, and the writer was chosen as a referee. We were taking our noonday rest, beside a small lake in northern India. Upon the surface of the glassy water floated innumerable aquatic flowers, and large shining leaves. Each of the contestants plucked a leaf. The fakir, laying his against his breast, folded his hands across it, and fell into a moat. P. 369. Mentary Trance. He then laid the leaf, with its surface downward, upon the water. The juggler pretended to control the water master, the spirit dwelling in the water, and boasted that he would compel the power to prevent the petrus from manifesting any phenomena upon the fakir's leaf in their element. He took his own leaf and tossed it upon the water, after going through a form of barbarous incantation. It at once exhibited a violent agitation, while the other leaf remained perfectly motionless. After the lapse of a few seconds, both leaves were recovered. Upon that of the fakir were found much to the indignation of the juggler something that looked like a symmetrical design traced in milk-white characters, as though the juices of the plant had been used as a corrosive writing fluid. When it became dry, and an opportunity was afforded to examine the lines with care, it proved to be a series of exquisitely formed Sanskrit characters, the whole composed a sentence embodying a high moral precept. The fakir, let us add, could neither read nor write. Upon the juggler's leaf, instead of writing, was found the tracing of a most hideous, impish face. Each leaf, therefore, bore an impression or allegorical reflection of the character of the contestant, and indicated the quality of spiritual beings with which he was surrounded. But, with deep regret, we must once more leave India, with its blue sky and mysterious past, its religious devotees and its weird sorcerers, and on the enchanted carpet of the historian, transport ourselves back to the musty atmosphere of the French Academy. To appreciate the timidity, prejudice, and superficiality which have marked the treatment of psychological subjects in the past, we propose to review a book which lies before us. It is the Histoire du Merveilleux dans les Temps Modernes. The work is published by its author, the learned Dr. Figuier, and teams with quotations from the most conspicuous authorities in physiology, psychology, and medicine. Dr. Camille, the well-known director-in-chief of Charenton, the famous lunatic asylum of France, is the robust atlas on whose mighty shoulders rests this world of erudition. As the ripe fruit of the thought of 1860 it must forever keep a place among the most curious of works of art. Moved by the restless demon of science, determined to kill superstition and, as a consequence, spiritism at one blow, the author affords us a summary view of the most remarkable instances of mediumistic phenomena during the last two centuries. 
The discussion embraces the prophets of Seven, the Camisards, the Jansenists, the Abbe Paris, and other historical epidemics, which, as they have been described during the last twenty years by nearly every writer upon the modern phenomena, we will mention as briefly as possible. It is not facts that we desire to bring again under discussion, but p. 370. Merely the way in which such facts were regarded and treated by those who, as physicians and recognized authorities, had the greater responsibility in such questions. If this prejudiced author is introduced to our readers at this time, it is only because his work enables us to show what occult facts and manifestations may expect from orthodox science. When the most world-renowned psychological epidemics are so treated, what will induce a materialist to seriously study other phenomena as well authenticated and as interesting, but still less popular? Let it be remembered that the reports made by various committees to their respective academies at that time, as well as the records of the judicial tribunals, are still in existence, and may be consulted for purposes of verification. It is from such unimpeachable sources that Dr. Figuier compiled his extraordinary work. We must give, at least, in substance, the unparalleled arguments with which the author seeks to demolish every form of supernaturalism, together with the commentaries of the demonological de Musos, who, in one of his works, pounces upon his skeptical victim like a tiger upon his prey. Between the two champions the materialist and the bigot the unbiased student may glean a good harvest. We will begin with the convulsionaires of Seven, the epidemic of whose astounding phenomena occurred during the latter part of 1700. The merciless measures adopted by the French Catholics to extirpate the spirit of prophecy from an entire population, is historical, and needs no repetition here. The fact alone that a mere handful of men, women, and children, not exceeding two thousand persons in number, could withstand for years King's troops, which, with the militia, amounted to sixty thousand men, is a miracle in itself. The marvels are all recorded, and the Perseverer box of the time preserved in the archives of France until this day. There is an existence in official report among others, which was sent to Rome by the ferocious Abbe Chela, the prior of Laval, in which he complains that the evil one is so powerful, that no torture, no amount of inquisitory exorcism, is able to dislodge him from the Sivanoi. He adds, that he closed their hands upon burning coals, and they were not even singed, that he had wrapped their whole persons in cotton soap with oil, and had set them on fire, and in many cases did not find one blister on their skins, that balls were shot at them, and found flattened between the skin and clothes, without injuring them, etc., etc. Accepting the whole of the above as a solid groundwork for his learned arguments, this is what Dr. Figuier says, toward the close of the 17th century, an old maid imports into Seven the spirit of. p. 371. Prophecy. She communicates it, to young boys and girls, who transpire it in their turn, and spread it in the surrounding atmosphere. Women and children become the most sensitive to the infection, volume 2, p. 261. Men, women, and babies speak under inspiration, not in ordinary patois, but in the purest French a language at that time utterly unknown in the country. Children of twelve months, and even less, as we learn from the Perseverer box, who previously could hardly utter a few short syllables, spoke fluently, and prophesied. Eight thousand prophets, says Figuier, were scattered over the country, doctors and eminent physicians were sent for. Half of the medical schools of France, among others, the faculty of Montpellier, hastened to the spot. Consultations were held, and the physicians declared themselves delighted, lost in wonder and admiration, upon hearing young girls and boys, ignorant and illiterate, deliver discourses on things they had never learned. The sentence pronounced by Figuier against these treacherous professional brethren, for being so delighted with the young prophets, is that they did not understand, themselves, what they saw. Many of the prophets forcibly communicated their spirit to those who tried to break the spell. A great number of them were between three and twelve years of age, still others were at the breast, and spoke French distinctly and correctly. These discourses, which often lasted for several hours, would have been impossible to the little orators, were the latter in their natural or normal state. Now, asked the reviewer, what was the meaning of such a series of prodigies? all of them freely admitted in Figuier's book? No meaning at all. It was nothing, he says, except the effect of a momentary exaltation of the intellectual faculties. These phenomena, he adds, are observable in many of the cerebral affections. Momentary exaltation, 
lasting for many hours in the brains of babies under one year old, not weaned yet, speaking good French before they had learned to say one word in their own patois. Oh, miracle of physiology! Prodigy ought to be thy name! exclaims De Musso's. Dr. Kamel, in his work on insanity, remarks Figuet, when reporting on the ecstatic theomania of the Calvinists, concludes that the disease must be attributed in the simpler cases to hysteria, and in those of more serious character to epilepsy. We rather incline to the opinion, says Figuet, that it was a disease sui generis, and in order. p. 372. To have an appropriate name for such a disease, we must be satisfied with the one of the trembling convulsionaires of Savin. Theomania and hysteria, again. The medical corporations must themselves be possessed with an incurable atomomania, otherwise why should they give out such absurdities for science, and hope for their acceptance? Such was the fury for exorcising and roasting, continues Figuier, that monks sell possessions by demons everywhere when they felt in need of miracles to either throw more light on the omnipotency of the devil, or keep their dinner pot boiling at the convent. For the sarcasm the pious de Musos expresses a heartfelt gratitude to Figuier, for, as he remarks, he is in France one of the first writers whom we find, to our surprise, not denying the phenomena which have been made long since undeniable. Moved by a sense of lofty superiority and even disdain for the method used by his predecessors, Dr. Figuier desires his readers to know that he does not follow the same path as they. We will not reject, says he, as being unworthy of credit, facts only because they are embarrassing for our system. On the contrary, we will collect all of the facts that the same historical evidence has transmitted to us, and which, consequently, are entitled to the same credence, and it is upon the whole mass of such facts that we will base the natural explanation, which we have to offer, in our turn, as a sequel to those of the savants who have preceded us on this subject. Thereupon, Dr. Figuier proceeds. He takes a few steps, and, placing himself right in the midst of the convulsionaires of St. Medar, he invites his readers to scrutinize, under his direction, prodigies which are for him but simple effects of nature. But before we proceed, in our turn, to show Dr. Figuier's opinion, we must refresh the reader's memory as to what the Jansenist miracles comprised, according to historical evidence. Abbe Paris was a Jansenist, who died in 1727. Immediately after his decease the most surprising phenomena began to occur at his tomb. The churchyard was crowded from morning till night. Jesuits, exasperated at seeing heretics perform wonders in healing, and other works, got from the magistrates in order to close all access to the tomb of the abbe. But, notwithstanding every opposition, the wonders lasted for over twenty years. Bishop Douglas, who went to Paris for that sole purpose in 1749, visited the place, and he reports that the miracles were still going on among the convulsionaires. When every endeavor to stop them failed, the Catholic clergy were forced to admit their reality, but screen them. p. 373. Selves, as usual, behind the devil. Hume, in his philosophical essays, says, there surely never was so great a number of miracles ascribed to one person as those which were lately said to have been wrought in France upon the tomb of the Abbe Paris. The curing of the sick, giving hearing to the deaf and sight to the blind, were everywhere talked of as the effects of the holy sepulchre. But, what is more extraordinary, many of the miracles were immediately proved upon the spot, before judges of unquestioned credit and distinction, and a learned age, and on the most eminent theatre that is now in the world, nor were the Jesuits, though a learned body, supported by the civil magistrates, and determined enemies to those opinions in whose favor the miracles were said to have been wrought, ever able distinctly to refute or detect them, such as historic evidence. Dr. Middleton, in his free inquiry, a book which be wrote at a period when the manifestations were already decreasing, i.e., about nineteen years after they had first begun, declares that the evidence of these miracles is fully as strong as that of the wonders recorded of the apostles. The phenomena so well authenticated by thousands of witnesses before magistrates, and in spite of the Catholic clergy, are among the most wonderful in history. Cari de Monteron, a member of Parliament and a man who became famous for his connection with the Jansenists, enumerates them carefully in his work. It comprises four thick quarter volumes, of which the first is dedicated to the king, under the title, La Verité des Miracles au Paris par l'intercession d'Am. De Paris, de Montre contre l'archevêque de senators of Raj Ddoroi, par M. de Montferron, conseiller au Parlement. 
The author presents a vast amount of personal and official evidence to the truthfulness of every case. For speaking disrespectfully of the Roman clergy, Montferron was thrown into the Bastille, but his work was accepted. And now for the views of Dr. Figuier upon these remarkable and unquestionably historical phenomena. A convulsionary bends back into an arc, her loins supported by the sharp point of a peg, quotes the learned author, from the Procès Verbox. The pleasure that she begs for is to be pounded by a stone weighing fifty pounds, and suspended by a rope passing over a pulley fixed to the ceiling. The stone, being hoisted to its extreme height, falls with all its weight upon the patient's stomach, her back resting all the while on the sharp point of the peg. Montferron and numerous other witnesses testified to the fact that neither the flesh nor the skin of the back were ever marked in the least, and that the girl, to show she suffered no pain whatever, kept crying out, strike harder harder. p. 374. Jean Mallette, a girl of twenty, leaning with her back against the wall, received upon her stomach one hundred blows of a hammer weighing thirty pounds. The blows, administered by a very strong man, were so terrible that they shook the wall. To test the force of the blows, Montferron tried them on the stone wall against which the girl was leaning. He gets one of the instruments of the Jansenist healing, called the Grand Secours. At the twenty-fifth blow, he writes, the stone upon which I struck, which had been shaken by the preceding efforts, suddenly became loose and fell on the other side of the wall, making an aperture more than half a foot in size. When the blows are struck with violence upon an iron drill held against the stomach of a convulsion air, who, sometimes, is but a weak woman, it seems, says Montcaron, as if it would penetrate through to the spine and rupture all the entrails under the force of the blows, volume 1, p. 380. But, so far from that occurring, the convulsion air cries out, with an expression of perfect rapture in her face, oh, how delightful. Oh, that does me good. Courage, brother, strike twice as hard, if you can. It now remains, continues Dr. Fillier to try to explain the strange phenomena which we have described. We have said, in the introduction to this work, that at the middle of the 19th century one of the most famous epidemics of possession broke out in Germany, that of the non-names, who performed all the miracles most admired since the days of St. Medar, and even some greater ones, who turned somersaults, who climbed dead walls, and spoke foreign languages. The official report of the wonders, which is more full than that of Figue, and such further particulars as that the affected persons would stand on their heads for hours together, and correctly describe distant events, even such as were happening in the homes of the committeemen, as it was subsequently verified. Men and women were held suspended in the air, by an invisible force, and the combined efforts of the committee were insufficient to pull them down. Old women climbed perpendicular walls thirty feet in height with the agility of wild cats, etc., etc. Now, one should expect that the learned critic, the eminent physician and psychologist, who not only credits such incredible phenomena but himself describes them minutely, in con amore, so to say, would necessarily startle the reading public with some explanation so extraordinary that his scientific views would cause a real agire to the unexplored fields of psychology. Well, he does startle us, for to all this he quietly. p. 375. Observes, Recourse was had to marriage to bring to a stop these disorders of the convulsion heirs. For once they Musos had the best of his enemy, marriage, do you understand this? He remarks. Marriage cures them of this faculty of climbing dead walls like so many flies, and of speaking foreign languages. Oh! The curious properties of marriage in those remarkable days. It should be added, continues Figuier, that with the fanatics of Saint Medar, the blows were never administered except during the convulsive crisis, and that, therefore, as Dr. Kamal suggests, meteorism of the abdomen, the state of spasm of the uterus of women, of the alimentary canal in all cases, the state of contraction, of erethism, of turgescence of the carneous envelopes of the muscular coats which protect and cover the abdomen, chest, and principal vascular masses in the osseous surfaces, may have singularly contributed toward reducing, and even destroying, the force of the blows. The astounding resistance that the skin, the irregular tissue, the surface of the bodies and limbs of the convulsionaires offered to things which seem as if they ought to have torn or crushed them, is of a nature to excite more surprise. Nevertheless, it can be explained. This resisting force, this insensibility, seems to partake of the extreme changes in sensibility which can occur in the animal economy during a time of great exaltation. Anger, fear, in a word, every passion, 
provided that it be carried to a paroxysmal point, can produce this insensibility. Let us remark, besides, rejoins Dr. Connell, quoted by Figuier, that for striking upon the bodies of the convulsionaires used was made either of massive objects with flat or rounded surfaces, or of cylindrical and blunt shapes. The action of such physical agents is not to be compared, in respect to the danger which attaches to it, with that of cords, supple or flexible instruments, and those having a sharp edge. In fine, the contact and the shock of the blows produced upon the convulsionaires the effect of a salutary shampooing, and reduced the violence of the tortures of hysteria. The reader will please observe that this is not intended as a joke, but is the sober theory of one of the most eminent in the French physicians, hoary with age and experience, the director-in-chief of the government insane asylum at Charenton. Really, the above explanation might lead the reader to a strange suspicion. We might imagine, perhaps, that drive. P. 376. Connell has kept company with the patients under his care a few more years and was good for the healthy action of his own brain. Besides, when Figuier talks of massive objects, of cylindrical and blunt shapes, he surely forgets the sharp swords, pointed iron pegs, and the hatchets, of which he himself gave a graphic description on page 409 of his first volume. The brother of Ellie Marion is shown by him striking his stomach and abdomen with the sharp point of a knife, with tremendous force, his body all the while resisting as if it were made of iron. Arrived at this point, De Musos loses all patience, and indignantly exclaims, was the learned physician quite awake when writing the above sentences? If, perchance, the doctors Kamel and Figuier should seriously maintain their assertions and insist on their theory, we are ready to answer them as follows, we are perfectly willing to believe you. But before such a superhuman effort of condescension, will you not demonstrate to us the truth of your theory in a more practical manner? Let us, for example, develop in you a violent and terrible passion, anger rage if you choose. You shall permit us for a single moment to be in your sight irritating, rude, and insulting. Of course, we will be so only at your request and in the interest of science in your cause. Our duty under the contract will consist in humiliating and provoking you to the last extremity. Before a public audience, who shall know nothing of our agreement, but whom you must satisfy as to your assertions, we will insult you, we will tell you that your writings are an ambuscade to truth, an insult to common sense, a disgrace which paper only can bear but which the public should chastise. We will add that you lie to science, you lie to the ears of the ignorant and stupid fools gathered around you, open-mouthed, like the crowd around a peddling quack. And when, transported beyond yourself, your face ablaze, in anger tumifying, you shall have displaced your fluids, when your fury has reached the point of bursting, we will cause your digestive muscles to be struck with powerful blows, your friends shall show us the most insensible places, we will let a perfect shower, an avalanche of stones fall upon them, for so was treated the flesh of the convulsed women whose appetite for such blows could never be satisfied. But, in order to procure for you the gratification of a salutary shampooing as you deliciously express it your limbs shall only be pounded with objects having blunt surfaces and cylindrical shapes, with clubs and sticks devoid of suppleness, and, if you prefer it, neatly turned into lathe. So liberal as de Musso's, so determined to accommodate his antagonists with every possible chance to prove their theory, that he offers them. p. 377. The choice to substitute for themselves in the experiment their wives, mothers, daughters, and sisters, since, he says, you have remarked that the weaker sex is the strong and resistant sex in these disconcerting trials. Useless to remark that De Musso's challenge remained unanswered. Chapter 11. Strange Condition of the Human Mind which seems to require that it should long exercise itself in error, before it dare approach the truth. Magendi. La Verite K.J. defends est emprien sur tous les monuments du passé pour comprendre l'histoire, il faut étudier les symboles anciens, les signes sacrés du sacerdoce, at l'ardeguerre ir dans les temps primitifs, ardibly aujourd'hui. Baron du Petet. It is a truth perpetually, that accumulated facts, lying in disorder, begin to assume some order if an hypothesis is thrown among them. Herbert Spencer. And now we must search magical history for cases similar to those given in the preceding chapter. This insensibility of the human body to the impact of heavy blows, and resistance to penetration by sharp points and musket bullets, is a phenomenon sufficiently familiar in the experience of all times in all countries. While science is entirely unable to give any reasonable explanation of the mystery, the question appears to offer no difficulty to mesmerists, 
who have well studied the properties of the fluid. The man, who by a few passes over a limb can produce a local paralysis so as to render it utterly insensible to burns, cuts, and the prickings of needles, may be but very little astonished at the phenomena of the Jansenists. As to the adepts of magic, especially in Siam and the East Indies, they are too familiar with the properties of the Akasha, the mysterious life fluid, to even regard the insensibility of the convulsionaires as a very great phenomenon. The astral fluid can be compressed about a person so as to form an elastic shell, absolutely non penetrable by any physical object, however great the velocity with which it travels. In a word, this fluid can be made to equal and even excel in resisting power, water and air. In India, Malabar, in some places of Central Africa, the conjurers will freely permit any traveler to fire his musket or revolver at them, without touching the weapon themselves or selecting the balls. In Lang's travels among Timani, the Karenkos, and the Solimas, occurs a description by an English traveler, the first white man to visit the tribe of the Solimas, near the sources of the Dialaba, of a very curious scene. A body of pick soldiers fired upon a chief who had nothing to defend himself with but certain talismans. Although their muskets were properly loaded and aimed, not a ball could strike him. Salford gives a similar case in his Philosophy of Occult Sciences, in 1568, the Prince of Orange condemned a Spanish prisoner to be shot at Juliers, the soldiers tied. p. 379. Him to a tree and fired, but he was invulnerable. They at last stripped him to see what armor he wore, but found only an amulet. When this was taken from him, he fell dead at the first shot. This is a very different affair from the dexterous trickery resorted to by Udin in Algeria. He prepared balls himself of tallow, blackened with soot, and by sleight of hand exchanged them for the real bullets, which the Arab chiefs supposed they were placing in the pistols. The simple-minded natives, knowing nothing but real magic, which they had inherited from their ancestors, and which consists in each case of some one thing that they can do without knowing why or how, and seeing Udin, as they thought, accomplished the same results in a more impressive manner, fancied that he was a greater magician than themselves. Many travelers, the writer included, have witnessed instances of this invulnerability where deception was impossible. A few years ago, there lived in an African village, an Abyssinian who passed for a sorcerer. Upon one occasion a party of Europeans, going to Sudan, amused themselves for an hour or two in firing at him with their own pistols and muskets, a privilege which he gave them for a trifling fee. As many as five shots were fired simultaneously, by a Frenchman named Longlois, and the muzzles of the pieces were not above two yards distant from the sorcerer's breast. In each case, simultaneously with the flash, the bullet would appear just beyond the muzzle, quivering in the air, and then, after describing a short parabola, fall harmlessly to the ground. A German of the party, who was going in search of ostrich feathers, offered the magician a five-franc piece if he would allow him to fire his gun with the muzzle touching his body. The man at first refused, but, finally, after appearing to hold conversation with somebody inside the ground, consented. The experimenter carefully loaded, impressing the muzzle of the weapon against the sorcerer's body, after a moment's hesitation, fired, the barrel burst into fragments as far down as the stop, and the man walked off unhurt. This quality of invulnerability can be imparted to persons both by living adepts and by spirits. In our own time several well-known mediums have frequently, in the presence of the most respectable witnesses, not only handled blazing coals and actually placed their face upon a fire without singeing a hair, but even laid flaming coals upon the heads and hands of bystanders, as in the case of Lord Lindsay and Lord Adair. The well-known story of the Indian chief, who confessed to Washington that at Braddock's defeat he had fired his rifle at him seventeen times at short range without being able to touch him, will recur to the reader in this connection. In fact, many great commanders have been believed by their soldiers to bear what is called a charmed life, in prints. P. 380. Emil von Sein Wittgenstein, a general of the Russian army, is said to be one of these. This same power which enables one to compress the astral fluid so as to form an impenetrable shell around one, can be used to direct, so to speak, a bolt of the fluid against a given object, with fatal force. Many a dark revenge has been taken in that way, and in such cases the coroner's inquest will never disclose anything but sudden death, apparently resulting from heart disease, an apoplectic fit, or some other natural, but still not veritable cause. Many persons firmly believe that certain individuals possess the power of the evil eye. The Malokio, 
Orgetatura is a belief which is prevalent throughout Italy and southern Europe. The Pope is held to be possessed perchance unconsciously of that disagreeable gift. There are persons who can kill toads by merely looking at them, and can even slay individuals. The malignance of their desire brings evil forces to a focus, and the death-dealing bolt is projected, as though it were a bullet from a rifle. In 1864, in the French province of Lavar, near the little village of Brignol, lived the peasant named Jacques Pellissier, who made a living by killing birds by simple willpower. His case is reported by the well-known Dr. Dalger, at whose request the singular hunter gave exhibitions to several scientific men, of his method of proceeding. The story is told as follows, at about fifteen or twenty paces from us, I saw a charming little meadow lark which I showed to Jacques. Watch him well, monsieur, said he, he is mine. Instantly stretching his right hand toward the bird, he approached him gently. The meadow lark stops, raises and lowers his pretty head, spreads his wings, but cannot fly, at last he cannot make a step further and suffers himself to be taken, only moving his wings with a feeble fluttering. I examine the bird, his eyes are tightly closed and his body has a corpse-like stiffness, although the pulsations of the heart are very distinct, it is a true cataleptic sleep, and all the phenomena incontestably prove a magnetic action. Fourteen little birds were taken in this way, within the space of an hour, none could resist the power of Master Jacques, and all presented the same cataleptic sleep, a sleep which, moreover, terminates at the will of the hunter, whose humble slaves these little birds have become. A hundred times, perhaps, I asked Jacques to restore life and movement to his prisoners, to charm them only halfway, so that they might hop along the ground, and then again bring them completely under the charm. All my requests were exactly complied with, and not one single failure was made by this remarkable Nimrod, who finally said to me, If you wish it, I will kill those which you designate without touching them. I pointed out two for the experiment, and, at twenty-five or p. 381. Thirty paces distance, he accomplished in less than five minutes what he had promised. A most curious feature of the above case is, that Jacques had complete power only over sparrows, robins, goldfinches, and meadow larks, he could sometimes charm skylarks, but, as he says, they often escape me. This same power is exercised with greater force by persons known as wild beast tamers. On the banks of the Nile, some of the natives can charm their crocodiles out of the water, with a peculiarly melodious, low whistle, and handle them with impunity, while others possess such powers over the most deadly snakes. Travelers tell seeing the charmers surrounded by multitudes of the reptiles which they dispatch at their leisure. Bruce, Hasselquist, and Lamprier testify to the fact that they have seen in Egypt, Morocco, Arabia, and especially in the Sinar, some natives utterly disregarding the bites of the most poisonous vipers, as well as the stings of scorpions. They handle and play with them, and throw them at will into a state of stupor. In vain do the Latin and Greek writers, says Salvert, assure us that the gift of charming venomous reptiles was hereditary in certain families from time immemorial, that in Africa the same gift was enjoyed by the Scilly, that the Marses in Italy, and the Ophiozines in Cyprus possessed it. The skeptics forget that, in Italy, even at the commencement of the 16th century, men, claiming to be descended from the family of St. Paul, braved, like the Marses, the bites of serpents. Doubts upon this subject, he goes on to say, were removed forever at the time of the expedition of the French into Egypt, and the following relation is attested by thousands of eyewitnesses. The silly, who pretended, as Bruce had related, to possess that faculty, went from house to house to destroy serpents of every kind. A wonderful instinct drew them at first toward the place in which the serpents were hidden, furious, howling, and foaming, they seized and tore them asunder with their nails and teeth. Let us place, says Salvert, inveterate skeptic himself, to the account of charlatanism, the howling and the fury, still, the instinct which warned the silly of the presence of the serpents, has in it some. p. 382. Thing more real. In the Antilles, the Negroes discover, by its odor, a serpent which they do not see. In Egypt, the same tact, formerly possessed, is still enjoyed by men brought up to it from infancy, and born as with an assumed hereditary gift to hunt serpents, and to discover them even at a distance too great for the effluvia to be perceptible to the dull organs of a European. The principal fact above all others, the faculty of rendering dangerous animals powerless, merely by touching them, remains well verified, and we shall, perhaps, 
never understand better the nature of this secret, celebrated in antiquity, and preserved to our time by the most ignorant of men. Music is delightful to every person. Low whistling, a melodious chant, or the sounds of a flute will invariably attract reptiles in countries where they are found. We have witnessed and verified the fact repeatedly. In Upper Egypt, whenever our caravan stopped, a young traveler, who believed he excelled on the flute, amused the company by playing. The camel drivers and other Arabs invariably checked him, having been several times annoyed by the unexpected appearance of various families of the reptile tribe, which generally shirk an encounter with men. Finally, our caravan met with a party, among whom were professional serpent charmers, and the virtuoso was then invited, for experiment's sake, to display his skill. No sooner had he commenced, than a slight rustling was heard, and the musician was horrified at suddenly seeing a large snake appear in dangerous proximity with his legs. The serpent, with uplifted head and eyes fixed on him, slowly, and, as if unconsciously, crawled, softly undulating its body, and following his every movement. Then appeared at a distance another one, then a third, and a fourth, which were speedily followed by others, until we found ourselves quite in a select company. Several of the travelers made for the backs of their camels, while others sought refuge in the contineer's tent. But it was a vain alarm. The charmers, three in number, began their chants and incantations, and, attracting the reptiles, were very soon covered with them from head to foot. As soon as the serpents approached the men, they exhibited signs of torpor, and were soon plunged in a deep catalepsy. Their eyes were half closed and glazed, and their heads drooping. There remained but one recalcitrant, a large and glossy black fellow, with a spotted skin. This melman of the desert went on gracefully nodding and leaping, as if it had danced on its tail all its life, and keeping time to the notes of the flute. This snake would not be enticed by the charming of the Arabs, but kept slowly moving in the direction. P. 383. Of the flute player, who at last took to his heels. The modern Cillian then took out of his bag a half-withered plant, which he kept waving in the direction of the serpent. It had a strong smell of mint, and as soon as the reptile caught its odor, it followed the Arab, still erect upon its tail, but now approaching the plant. A few more seconds, and the traditional enemy of man was seen entwined around the arm of his charmer, became torpid in its turn, and the whole lot were then thrown together in a pool, after having their heads cut off. Many believe that all such snakes are prepared and trained for the purpose, and that they are either deprived of their fangs, or have their mouths sewed up. There may be, doubtless, some inferior jugglers, whose trickery has given rise to such an idea. But the genuine serpent charmer has too well established his claims in the East, to resort to any such cheap fraud. They have the testimony on this subject of too many trustworthy travelers, including some scientists, to be accused of any such charlatanism. That the snakes, which are charmed to dance and to become harmless, are still poisonous, is verified by Forbes. On the music stopping too suddenly, says he, or from some other cause, the serpent, who had been dancing within a circle of country people, darted among the spectators, and inflicted a wound in the throat of a young woman, who died in agony, and half an hour afterward. According to the accounts of many travelers the Negro women of Dutch Guiana, the Obia women, excel in taming very large snakes called amidites, or papa, they make them descend from the trees, follow, and obey them by merely speaking to them. We have seen in India a small brotherhood of fakirs settled round a little lake, or rather a deep pool of water, the bottom of which was literally carpeted with enormous alligators. These amphibious monsters crawl out, and warm themselves in the sun, a few feet from the fakirs, some of whom may be motionless, lost in prayer and contemplation. So long as one of these holy beggars remains in view, the crocodiles are as harmless as kittens. But we would never advise a foreigner to risk himself alone within a few yards of these monsters. The poor Frenchman Pridden found an untimely grave in one of these terrible Saurians, commonly called by the Hindus Medela. This word should be Nihang or Grail. When Iamblichus, Herodotus, Pliny, or some other ancient writer tells us of priests who caused us to come forth from the altar of Isis, or of thaumaturgists taming with a glance the most ferocious animals, they. p. 384 are considered liars and ignorant imbeciles. When modern travelers tell us of the same wonders performed in the East, they are set down as enthusiastic jabbers, or untrustworthy writers. But, despite materialistic skepticism, man does possess such a power, as we see manifested in the above instances. 
When psychology and physiology become worthy of the name of sciences, Europeans will be convinced of the weird and formidable potency existing in the human will and imagination, whether exercised consciously or otherwise. And yet, how easy to realize such power and spirit, if we only think of that grand truism in nature that every most insignificant atom in it is moved by spirit, which is one in its essence, for the least particle of it represents the whole, and that matter is but the concrete copy of the abstract idea, after all. In this connection, let us cite a few instances of the imperial power of even the unconscious will, to create according to the imagination or rather the faculty of discerning images in the astral light. We have but to recall the very familiar phenomenon of stigmata, or birthmarks, where effects are produced by the involuntary agency of the maternal imagination under a state of excitement. The fact that the mother can control the appearance of her unborn child was so well known among the ancients, that it was the custom among wealthy Greeks to place fine statues near the bed, so that she might have a perfect model constantly before her eyes. The cunning trick by which the Hebrew patriarch Jacob caused ring streaked and speckle cast to be dropped, is an illustration of the law among animals, and Arakanti tells of four successive litters of puppies, born of healthy parents, some of which, in each litter, were well formed, whilst the remainder were without interior extremities and had hair lip. The works of Geoffroy St. Hilaire, Bordock, and Elam, contain accounts of great numbers of such cases, and in Dr. Prosper Lucas's important volume, Sir Laredite Naturel, there are many. Elam quotes from Pritchard an instance where the child of a negro in white was marked with black and white color upon separate parts of the body. He adds, with laudable sincerity, these are singularities of which, in the present state of science, no explanation can be given. It is a pity that his example was not more generally imitated. Among the ancients Empedocles, Aristotle, Pliny, Hippocrates, Galen, Marcus Damascenus, and others give us accounts quite as wonderful as our contemporary authors. In a work published in London, in 1659, a powerful argument is. p. 385. Made in refutation of the materialist by showing the potency of the human mind upon the subtle forces of nature. The author, Dr. Moore, views the fetus as if it were a plastic substance, which can be fashioned by the mother to an agreeable or disagreeable shape, to resemble some person or impart several persons, and to be stamped with the effigies, or as we might more properly call it, astrograph, of some object vividly presented to her imagination. These effects may be produced by her voluntarily or involuntarily, consciously or unconsciously, feebly or forcibly, as the case may be. It depends upon her ignorance or knowledge of the profound mysteries of nature. Taking women in the mass, the marking of the embryo may be considered more accidental than the result of design, and as each person's atmosphere in the astral light is peopled with the images of his or her immediate family, the sensitive surface of the fetus, which may almost be likened to the collodionized plate of a photograph, is as likely as not to be stamped with the image of a near or remote ancestor, whom the mother never saw, but which, at some critical moment, came as it were into the focus of nature's camera. Says Dr. Elam, near me is seated a visitor from a distant continent, where she was born and educated. The portrait of a remote ancestress, far back in the last century, hangs upon the wall. In every feature, one is an accurate presentment of the other, although the one never left England, and the other was an American by birth and half-parentage. The power of the imagination upon our physical condition, even after we arrive at maturity, is evinced in many familiar ways. In medicine, the intelligent physician does not hesitate to accord to it a curative or morbific potency greater than his pills and potions. He calls it the vis medicatrix naturae, and his first endeavor is to gain the confidence of his patient so completely, that he can cause nature to extirpate the disease. Fear often kills, and grief has such a power over the subtle fluids of the body as not only to derange the internal organs but even to turn the hair white. Vicinus mentions the signature of the fetus with the marks of cherries and various fruits, colors, hairs, and excrescences, and acknowledges that the imagination of the mother may transform it into a resemblance of an ape, pig, or dog, or any such animal. Marcus Damascenus tells of a girl covered with hair and, like our modern Julia Pastrana, furnished with a full beard, Gliomus Paradinus, of a child whose skin and nails resembled those of a bear, Waldinus Ronsaeus of one born with a turkey's waddles, Perius, of one with a head like a frog, and Avicenna, of chickens with hawks' heads. In this latter case, which perfectly exemplifies the power of the same imagination in animals, 
The embryo must have been stamped at the instant of conception when the hen's imagination saw a hawk either in fact or in fancy. This is evident. P. 386. For Dr. Moore, who quotes this case on the authority of Avicenna, remarks very appropriately that, as the egg in question might have been hatched a hundred miles distant from the hen, the microscopic picture of the hawk impressed upon the embryo must have enlarged and perfected itself with the growth of the chicken quite independently of any subsequent influence from the hen. Cornelius Gemma tells of a child that was born with his forehead wounded and running with blood, the result of his father's threats toward his mother, with a drawn sword which he directed toward her forehead. See Nurtius records the case of a pregnant woman who, seeing a butcher divide a swine's head with his cleaver, brought forth her child with his face cloven in the upper jaw, the palate, and upper lip to the very nose. In Van Helmont's The Injectus Materialibus, some very astonishing cases are reported. The wife of a tailor at Mechlin was standing at her door and saw a soldier's hand cut off in a quarrel, which so impressed her as to bring on premature labor, and her child was born with only one hand, the other arm bleeding. In 1602, the wife of Marcus de Vogler, a merchant of Antwerp, seeing a soldier who had just lost his arm, was taken in labor and brought forth a daughter with one arm struck off and bleeding as in the first case. Van Helmont gives a third example of another woman who witnessed the beheading of thirteen men by order of the Duc d'Alva. The horror of the spectacle was so overpowering that she suddenly fell into labor and brought forth a perfectly formed infant, only the head was wanting, but the neck bloody as their body she beheld that had their heads cut off. And that which does still advance the wonder is, that the hand, arm, and head of these infants were none of them to be found. If it was possible to conceive of such a thing as a miracle in nature, the above cases of the sudden disappearance of portions of the unborn human body might be designated. We have looked in vain through the latest authorities upon human physiology for any sufficient theory to account for the least remarkable of fetal signatures. The most they can do is to record instances of what they call spontaneous varieties of type and then fall back either upon Mr. Proctor's curious coincidences or upon such candid confessions of ignorance as are to be found in authors not entirely satisfied with the sum of human knowledge. McGendy acknowledges that, despite scientific researches, comparatively little is known of fetal life. At page 518 of the American edition of his Précy et la Montaire de Physiologie he instances a case where the umbilical cord was ruptured and perfectly cicatrized, and asks how was the p. 387. Circulation carried on in this organ? On the next page, he says, nothing is at present known respecting the use of digestion in the fetus, and respecting its nutrition, propounds this query, what, then, can we say of the nutrition of the fetus? Physiological works contain only vague conjectures on this point. On page 520, the following language occurs, in consequence of some unknown cause, the different parts of the fetus sometimes develop themselves in a preternatural manner. With singular inconsistency with his previous admissions of the ignorance of science upon all these points which we have quoted, he adds, there is no reason for believing that the imagination of the mother can have any influence in the formation of these monsters, besides, productions of this kind are daily observed in the offspring of other animals and even in plants. How perfect an illustration is this of the methods of scientific men? The moment they pass beyond their circle of observed facts, their judgment seems to become entirely perverted. Their deductions from their own researches are often greatly inferior to those made by others who have to take the facts at second hand. The literature of science is constantly furnishing examples of this truth, and when we consider the reasoning of materialistic observers upon psychological phenomena, the rule is strikingly manifest. Those who are soul-blind are as constitutionally incapable of distinguishing psychological causes from material effects as the color-blind are to select scarlet from black. Elam, without being in the least a spiritualist, nay, though an enemy to it, represents the belief of honest scientists in the following expressions, it is certainly inexplicable how matter and mind can act and react one upon the other, the mystery is acknowledged by all to be insoluble, and will probably ever remain so. The great English authority upon the subject of malformation is the science and practice of medicine, by William Aitken, M. D., Edinburgh, and Professor of Pathology in the Army Medical School, the American edition of which, by Professor Meredith Clymer, M. D., of the University of Pennsylvania, has equal weight in the United States. At page 233 of Volume 1, we find the subject treated at length. The author says, The superstition, absurd notions, and strange causes assigned to the occurrence of such malformations, 
are now fast disappearing before the lucid expositions of those famous anatomists who have made the development and growth of the ovum a subject of special study. It is sufficient to mention here the names, J. Muller, Ratlike, Bischoff, St. Hilaire, Bordock, Alan Thompson, G. and W. Verlick, Wolf, Meckel, Simpson, Rokotonsky, and von Ammann as sufficient evidence that the truths of science will in time dispel the mists of ignorance and superstition. One would. P. 388. Think, from the complacent tone adopted by this eminent writer that we were in possession if not of the means of readily solving this intricate problem at least of a clue to guide us through the maze of our difficulties. But, in 1872, after profiting by all the labors and ingenuity of the illustrious pathologists above enumerated, we find him making the same confession of ignorance as that expressed by McGendy in 1838. Nevertheless, says he, much mystery still enshrouds the origin of malformation. The origin of them may be considered in two main issues, namely, 1. Are they due to original malformation of the germ? 2. Or, are they due to subsequent deformities of the embryo by causes operating on its development? With regard to the first issue, it is believed that the germ may be originally malformed, or defective, owing to some influence proceeding either from the female, or from the male, as in case of repeated procreation of the same kind of malformation by the same parents, deformities on either side being transmitted as an inheritance. Being unsupplied with any philosophy of their own to account for the lesions, the pathologists, true to professional instinct, resort to negation, that such deformity may be produced by mental impressions on pregnant women there is an absence of positive proof, they say. Moles, mother's marks, and cutaneous spots as ascribed to morbid states of the coats of the ovum. A very generally recognized cause of malformation consists in impeded development of the fetus, the cause of which is not always obvious, but is for the most part concealed. Transient forms of the human fetus are comparable to persistent forms of many lower animals. Can the learned professor explain why? Hence malformations resulting from arrest of development often acquire an animal-like appearance. Exactly, but why do not pathologists inform us why it is so? Any anatomist who has made the development and growth of the embryo and fetus a subject of special study, can tell, without much brain work, what daily experience and the evidence of his own eyes show him, viz., that up to a certain period, the human embryo is a facsimile of a young batrachian and its first removed from the spawn a tadpole. But no physiologist or anatomist seems to have had the idea of applying to the development of the human being from the first instant of its physical appearance as a germ to its ultimate formation and birth the Pythagorean esoteric doctrine of metempsychosis, so erroneously interpreted by critics. The meaning of the Kabbalistic axiom, a stone becomes a plant, a plant a beast, the beast a man, etc., was mentioned in another place in relation to the spiritual and physical evolution of man on this earth. We will now add a few words more to make the idea clearer. What is the primitive shape of the future man? A grain, a corpuscle. P. 389. Say some physiologists, a molecule, an ovum of the ovum, say others. If it could be analyzed by the spectroscope or otherwise of what ought we to expect to find it composed? Analogically, we should say, of a nucleus of inorganic matter, deposited from the circulation at the germinating point and united with a deposit of organic matter. In other words, this infinitesimal nucleus of the future man is composed of the same elements as a stone of the same elements as the earth, which the man is destined to inhabit. Moses is cited by the Kabbalists as authority for the remark, that it required earth and water to make a living being, and thus it may be said that man first appears as a stone. At the end of three or four weeks the ovum has assumed a plant-like appearance, one extremity having become spheroidal and the other tapering like a carrot. Upon dissection it is found to be composed, like an onion, of very delicate laminar coats, enclosing a liquid. The lamina approach each other at the lower end, and the embryo hangs from the root of the umbilicus almost like a fruit from the bough. The stone has now become changed, by metempsychosis, into a plant. Then the embryonic creature begins to shoot out, from the inside outward, its limbs, and develops its features. The eyes are visible as two black dots, the ears, nose, and mouth form depressions, like the points of a pineapple, before they begin to project. The embryo develops into an animal-like fetus the shape of a tadpole and like an amphibious reptile lives in water, and develops from it. Its monad has not yet become either human or immortal, for the Kabbalists tell us that that only comes at the fourth hour. 
One by one the fetus assumes the characteristics of the human being. The first flutter of the immortal breath passes through his being. He moves. Nature opens the way for him, ushers him into the world, and the divine essence settles in the infant frame, which it will inhabit until the moment of physical death, when man becomes a spirit. This mysterious process of a nine months formation the Kabbalists call the completion of the individual cycle of evolution. As the fetus develops from the liquor amnia in the womb, so the earths germinate from the universal ether, or astral fluid, in the womb of the universe. These cosmic children, like their pygmy inhabitants, are first nuclei, then ovules, then gradually mature, and becoming mothers in their turn, develop mineral, vegetable, animal, and human forms. From center to circumference, from the imperceptible vesicle to the uttermost conceivable bounds of the cosmos, these glorious thinkers, the Kabbalists, trace cycle merging into cycle, containing and contained in an endless series. The embryo evolving in its prenatal sphere, the individual and his family, the family and the state, the state and mankind, the earth and our system. p. 390. That system and its central universe, the universe and the cosmos, and the cosmos in the first cause, the boundless and endless. So runs their philosophy of evolution. All are but parts of one stupendous whole, whose body nature is, and God the soul, worlds without number, lie in this bosom like children, while unanimously agreeing that physical causes, such as blows, accidents, and bad quality of food for the mother, affect the fetus in a way which endangers its life, and while admitting again that moral causes, such as fear, sudden terror, violent grief, or even extreme joy, may retard the growth of the fetus or even kill it. Many physiologists agree with McGendy in saying, there is no reason for believing that the imagination of the mother can have any influence in the formation of monsters, and only because productions of this kind are daily observed in the production of other animals and even in plants. In this opinion he is supported by the leading teratologists of our day. Although Geoffroy saint Hilaire gave its name to the new science, its facts are based upon the exhaustive experiments of Bichat, who, in 1802, was recognized as the founder of analytical and philosophical anatomy. One of the most important contributions to teratological literature is the monograph of G.J. Fisher, M.D., of Sing Sing, N.Y., entitled Diploteratology, an essay on compound human monsters. This writer classifies monstrous fetal growths into their genera and species, accompanying the cases with reflections suggested by their peculiarities. Following St. Euler, he divides the history of the subject into the fabulous, the positive, and the scientific periods. It suffices for our purpose to say that in the present state of scientific opinion two points are considered as established. 1. That the maternal, mental condition has no influence in the production of monstrosities. 2. That most varieties of monstrosity may be accounted for on the theory of arrest and retardation of development. Says Fisher, by careful study of the laws of development and the order in which the various organs are evolved in the embryo, it has been observed that monsters by defect or arrest of development, are, to a certain extent, permanent embryos. The abnormal organs merely represent the primitive condition of formation as it existed in an early stage of embryonic or fetal life. With physiology in so confessedly chaotic a state as it is at present. p. 391. It seems a little like hardihood in any teratologist, however great his achievements in anatomy, histology, or embryology, to take so dangerous a position as that the mother has no influence upon her offspring. While the microscopes of Haller and Perlick, Garrison and Murray Blood have disclosed to us many interesting facts concerning the single or double primitive traces on the vitellin membrane, what remains undiscovered about embryology by modern science appears greater still. If we grant that monstrosities are the result of an arrest of development nay, if we go farther, and can see that the fetal feature may be prognosticated from the vitellin tracings, where will the teratologist take us to learn the antecedent psychological cause of either? Dr. Fisher may have carefully studied some hundreds of cases, and feel himself authorized to construct a new classification of their genera and species, but facts are facts, and outside the field of his observation it appears, even if we judge but by our own personal experience, in various countries, that there are abundant attainable proofs that the violent maternal emotions are often reflected in tangible, visible, and permanent disfigurements of the child. And the cases in question seem, moreover, to contradict Dr. Fisher's assertion that monstrous growths are due to causes traceable to the early stages of embryonic or fetal life. One case was that of a judge of an imperial court at Saratow, Russia, 
who always wore a bandage to cover a mouse mark on the left side of his face. It was a perfectly formed mouse, whose body was represented in high relief upon the cheek, and the tail ran upward across the temple and was lost in his hair. The body seemed glossy, gray, and quite natural. According to his own account, his mother had an unconquerable repugnance to mice, and her labor was prematurely brought on by seeing a mouse jump out from her workbox. In another instance, of which the writer was a witness, a pregnant lady, within two or three weeks of her accouchement, saw a bowl of raspberries and was seized with an irresistible longing for some, but denied. She excitedly clasped her right hand to her neck in a somewhat theatrical manner, and exclaimed that she must have them. The child born under her eyes, three weeks later, had a perfectly defined raspberry on the right side of his neck. To this day, when that fruit ripens, his birthmark becomes of a deep crimson, while, during the winter, it is quite pale. Such cases as these, which are familiar to many mothers of families, either in their personal experience or that of friends, carry conviction, despite the theories of all the teratologists of Europe and America. Because, forsooth, animals and plants are observed to produce malformations of their species as well as human beings, McGendy and his school infer that the human malformations of an identical character are. p. 392. Not at all due to maternal imagination, since the former are not. If physical causes produce physical effects in the subordinate kingdoms, the inference is that the same rule must hold with ourselves. But an entirely original theory was broached by Professor Armour, of the Long Island Medical College, in the course of a discussion recently held in the Detroit Academy of Medicine. In opposition to the orthodox views which Dr. Fisher represents, Professor Armour says that malformations result from either one of two causes one a deficiency or abnormal condition in the generative matter from which the fetus is developed, or two, morbid influences acting on the fetus in utero. He maintains that the generative matter represents in its composition every tissue, structure, and form, and that there may be such a transmission of acquired structural peculiarities as would make the generative matter incapable of producing a healthy and equally developed offspring. On the other hand, the generative matter may be perfect in itself, but being subjected to morbid influences during the process of gestation, the offspring will, of necessity, be monstrous. To be consistent, this theory must account for diploteratological cases, double-headed or double-membered monsters, which seems difficult. We might, perhaps, admit that in defective generative matter, the head of the embryo might not be represented, or any other part of the body be deficient, but, it hardly seems as if there could be two, three, or more representatives of a single member. Again, if the generative matter have hereditary taint, it seems as if all the resulting progeny should be equally monstrous, whereas the fact is that in many cases the mother has given birth to a number of healthy children before the monster made its appearance, all being the progeny of one father. Numerous cases of this kind are quoted by Dr. Fisher, among others he cites the case of Catherine Corcoran, a very healthy woman, 30 years of age and who, Previously to giving birth to this monster had borne five well-formed children, no two of which were twins, it had a head at either extremity, two chests, with arms complete, two abdominal and two pelvic cavities united end to end, with four legs placed two at either side, where the union between the two occurred. Certain parts of the body, however, were not duplicated, and therefore this cannot be claimed as a case of the growing together of twins. Another instance is that of Maria Teresa Parati. This woman, who had previously given birth to eight well-formed children, was delivered of a female infant the upper part of which only was double. Instances in p. 393, which before and after the production of a monster the children were perfectly healthy or numerous, and if, on the other hand, the fact that monstrosities are as common with animals as they are with mankind is a generally accepted argument against the popular theory that these malformations are due to the imagination of the mother and that other fact that there is no difference between the ovarian cell of a mammifer and man, be admitted, what becomes of Professor Armour's theory? In such a case an instance of an animal malformation is as good as that of a human monster, and this is what we read in Dr. Samuel L. Mitchell's paper on two-headed serpents. A female snake was killed, together with her whole brood of young ones, amounting to 120, of these three were monsters. One with two distinct heads, one with a double head and only three eyes, and one with a double skull furnished with three eyes, and a single lower jaw, this last had two bodies. Surely the generative matter which produced these three monsters was identical with that which produced the other 117? 
Thus the armor theory is as imperfect as all the rest. The trouble proceeds from the defective method of reasoning usually adopted induction, a method which claims to collect by experiment and observation all the facts within its reach, the former being rather that of collecting and examining experiments and drawing conclusions therefrom, and, according to the author of Philosophical Inquiry, as this conclusion cannot be extended beyond what is warranted by the experiments, the induction is an instrument of proof and limitation. Notwithstanding this limitation is to be found in every scientific inquiry, it is rarely confessed, but hypotheses are constructed for us as though the experimenters had found them to be mathematically proved theorems, while they are, to say the most, simple approximations. For a student of occult philosophy, who rejects in his turn the method of induction on account of these perpetual limitations, and fully adopts the platonic division of causes namely, the efficient, the formal, the material, and the final, as well as the Iliadic method of examining any given proposition, it is but natural to reason from the following standpoint of the Neoplatonic school. 1. The subject either is as it is supposed or is not. Therefore we will inquire, does the universal ether, known by the Kabbalists as the astral light, contain electricity and magnetism, or does it not? The answer must be in the affirmative, for exact science herself teaches us that these two convertible agents saturating both the air and the earth, there is a constant interchange of electricity and magnetism between them. The question number one being P. 394. Settled, we will have now to examine what happens 1 SD. To it with respect to itself. 2 D. To it with respect to all other things. 3 D. With all other things, with respect to it. Fourth. To all other things with respect to themselves. Answers. First. With respect to itself that inherent properties previously laid in electricity, become active under favoring conditions, and that at one time the form of magnetic force is assumed by the subtle, all-pervading agent, at another, the form of electric force is assumed. 2d. With respect to all other things. By all other things for which it has an affinity, it is attracted, by all others repelled. 3d. With all other things with respect to it. It happens that whenever they come in contact with electricity, they receive its impress in proportion to their conductivity. Fourth, to all other things with respect to themselves, that under the impulse received from the electric force, and in proportion to its intensity, their molecules change their relations with each other, that either they are wrenched asunder, so as to destroy the object organic or inorganic which they formed, or, if previously disturbed, are brought into equilibrium, as in cases of disease, or the disturbance may be but superficial, and the object may be stamped with the image of some other object encountered by the fluid before reaching them. To apply the above propositions to the case in point, there are several well-recognized principles of science, as, for instance, that a pregnant woman is physically and mentally in a highly impressible state. Physiology tells us that her intellectual faculties are weakened, and that she is affected to an unusual degree by the most trifling events. Her pores are opened, and she exudes a peculiar cutaneous perspiration, she seems to be in a receptive condition for all the influences in nature. Reichenbach's disciples assert that her audit condition is very intense. De Patet warns against incautiously mesmerizing her, for fear of affecting the offspring. Her diseases are imparted to it, and often it absorbs them entirely to itself. Her pains and pleasures react upon its temperament as well as its health, great men proverbially of great mothers, and vice versa. It is true that her imagination has an influence upon the fetus, admits Magendi, thus contradicting what he asserts in another place, and he adds that sudden terror may cause the death of the fetus, or retard its growth. In the case recently reported in the American papers, of a boy who was killed by a stroke of lightning, upon stripping the body, there was found imprinted upon his breast the faithful picture of a tree which grew. p. 395 near the window which he was facing at the time of the catastrophe, and which was also felled by the lightning. Now, this electrical photography, which was accomplished by the blind forces of nature, furnishes an analogy by which we may understand how the mental images of the mother are transmitted to the unborn child. Her pores are opened, she exudes an otic emanation which is but another form of the akasha, the electricity, or life principle, in which, according to Reichenbach, produces mesmeric sleep and consequently is magnetism. Magnetic currents develop themselves into electricity upon their exit from the body. An object making a violent impression on the mother's mind, 
its image is instantly projected into the astral light, or the universal ether, which Jevons and Babbage, as well as the authors of the unseen universe, tell us is the repository of the spiritual images of all forms, and even human thoughts. Her magnetic emanations attract and unite themselves with the descending current which already bears the image upon it. It rebounds, and repercussing more or less violently, impresses itself upon the fetus, according to the very formula of physiology which shows how every maternal feeling reacts on the offspring. Is this Kabbalistic theory more hypothetical or incomprehensible than the teratological doctrine taught by the disciples of Geoffroy St. Hilaire? The doctrine, of which Magendi so justly observes, is found convenient and easy from its vagueness and obscurity, and which pretends to nothing less than the creation of a new science, the theory of which reposes on certain laws not very intelligible, as that of arresting, that of retarding, that of similar or eccentric position, especially the great law, as it is called, of self for self. Eliphas Levi, who is certainly one of the best authorities on certain points among Kabbalists, says, pregnant women are, more than others, under the influence of the astral light, which assists in the formation of their child, and constantly presents to them the reminiscences of forms with which it is filled. It is thus that very virtuous women deceive the malignity of observers by equivocal resemblances. They often impress upon the fruit of their marriage an image which has struck them in a dream, and thus are the same physiognomies perpetuated from age to age. The Kabbalistic use of the pentagram can therefore determine the countenance of unborn infants, and an initiated woman might give to her son the features of Near Use or Achilles, as well as those of Louis XV. Or Napoleon. If it should confirm another theory than that of Dr. Fisher, he should be the last to complain, for as he himself makes the confession, which p. 396. His own example verifies, one of the most formidable obstacles to the advancement of science, has ever been a blind submission to authority. To untrammel the mind from the influence of mere authority, that it may have free scope in the investigation of facts and laws which exist and are established in nature, is the grand antecedent necessary to scientific discovery and permanent progress. If the maternal imagination can stunt the growth or destroy the life of the fetus, why cannot it influence its physical appearance? There are some surgeons who have devoted their lives and fortunes to find the cause for these malformations, but have only reached the opinion that they are mere coincidences. It would be also highly unphilosophical to say that animals are not endowed with imagination, and, while it might be considered the acne of metaphysical speculation to even formulate the idea that members of the vegetable kingdom say the mimosas in the group of insect catchers have an instinct and even rudimentary imagination of their own. Yet the idea is not without its advocates. If great physicists like Tyndall are forced to confess that even in the case of intelligent and speaking man they are unable to bridge the chasm between mind and matter, and to find the powers of the imagination, how much greater must be the mystery about what takes place in the brain of a dumb animal? What is imagination? Psychologists tell us that it is the plastic or creative power of the soul, but materialists confound it with fancy. The radical difference between the two was, however, so thoroughly indicated by Wordsworth, in the preface to his lyrical ballads, that it is no longer excusable to interchange the words. Imagination, Pythagoras maintained to be the remembrance of precedent spiritual, mental, and physical states, while fancy is the disorderly production of the material brain. From whatever aspect we view and question matter, the world old philosophy that it was vivified and fructified by the eternal idea, or imagination the abstract outlining and preparing the model for the concrete form is unavoidable. If we reject this doctrine, the theory of a cosmos evolving gradually out of its chaotic disorder becomes an absurdity, for it is highly unphilosophical to imagine inert matter, solely moved by blind force, and directed by intelligence, forming itself spontaneously into a universe of such admirable harmony. If the soul of man is really an outcome of the essence of this universal soul, an infinitesimal fragment of this first creative principle, it must of necessity partake in degree of all the attributes of the demiurgic power. As the creator, breaking up the chaotic mass of dead, and active matter, shaped it into. p. 397. Form, so man, if he knew his powers, could, to a degree, do the same. As Phidias, gathering together the loose particles of clay and moistening them with water, could give plastic shape to the sublime idea evoked by his creative faculty, so the mother who knows her power can fashion the coming child into whatever form she likes. Ignorant of his powers, the sculptor produces only an inanimate though ravishing figure of inert matter, while the soul of the mother, violently affected by her imagination, 
blindly projects into the astral light an image of the object which impressed it, and, by repercussion, that is stamped upon the fetus. Science tells us that the law of gravitation assures us that any displacement which takes place in the very heart of the Earth will be felt throughout the universe, and we may even imagine that the same thing will hold true of those molecular motions which accompany thought. Speaking of the transmission of energy throughout the universal ether or astral light, the same authority says, continual photographs of all occurrences are thus produced and retained. A large portion of the energy of the universe may thus be said to be invested in such pictures. Dr. Fournier, of the National Deaf and Dumb Institute of France, in Chapter 2, of his work, in discussing the question of the fetus, says that the most powerful microscope is unable to show us the slightest difference between the ovarian cell of a mammifer and a man, and, respecting the first or last movement of the ovule, ask, what is it? Has it particular characters which distinguish it from every other ovule? And justly answers thus, until now, science has not replied to these questions, and, without being a pessimist, I do not think that she ever will reply, from the day when her methods of investigation will permit her to surprise the hidden mechanism of the conflict of the principle of life with matter, she will know life itself, and be able to produce it. If our author had read the sermon of Pierre Felix, how appropriately he might utter his amen. To the priest's exclamation mystery. Mystery. Let us consider the assertion of Magendi in the light of recorded instances of the power of imagination in producing monstrous deformities, where the question does not involve pregnant women. He admits that these occur daily in the offspring of the lower animals. How does he account for the hatching of chickens with hawk heads, except upon the theory that the appearance of the hereditary enemy acted upon the hen's imagination, which, in its turn, imparted to the matter composing the germ a certain motion which, before expanding itself, produced the monstrous chicks? We know of an analogous case, where attained of. p. 398. Belonging to a lady of our acquaintance, was frightened daily by a parrot, and in her next brood of young there were two squabs with parrot's heads, the resemblance even extending to the color of the feathers. We might also cite Kalimela, Ewitt, and other authorities, together with the experience of all animal breeders, to show that by exciting the imagination of the mother, the external appearance of the offspring can be largely controlled. These instances in no degree affect the question of heredity, for they are simply special variations of type artificially caused. Catherine Crow discusses at considerable length the question of the power of the mind over matter, and relates, in illustration, many well-authenticated instances of the same. Among others, that most curious phenomenon called the stigmata have a decided bearing upon this point. These marks come upon the bodies of persons of all ages, and always as the result of exalted imagination. In the cases of the Tyrolese ecstatic, Catherine Emmerich, and many others, the wounds of the crucifixion are said to be as perfect as nature. A certain madame, Bivon N. dreamed one night that a person offered her a red and a white rose, and that she chose the latter. On awaking, she felt a burning pain in her arm, and by degrees there appeared the figure of a rose, perfect in form and color, it was rather raised above the skin. The mark increased in intensity till the eighth day, after which it faded away, and by the fourteenth, was no longer perceptible. Two young ladies, in Poland, were standing by an open window during a storm, a flash of lightning fell near them, and the gold necklace on the neck of one of them was melted. A perfect image of it was impressed upon the skin, and remained throughout life. The other girl, appalled by the accident to her companion, stood transfixed with horror for several minutes, and then fainted away. Little by little the same mark of a necklace as had been instantaneously imprinted upon her friend's body, appeared upon her own, and remained there for several years, when it gradually disappeared. Dr. Eustinus Kerner, the distinguished German author, relates a still more extraordinary case. At the time of the French invasion, a Cossack having pursued a Frenchman into a cul-de-sac, an alley without an outlet, there ensued a terrible conflict between them, in which the latter was severely wounded. A person who had taken refuge in this close, and could not get away, was so dreadfully frightened, that when he reached home there broke out on his body the very same wounds that the Cossack had inflicted on his enemy. In this case, as in those were organic disorders, and even physical, p. 399. Death result from a sudden excitement of the mind reacting upon the body, McGendy would find it difficult to attribute the effect to any other cause than the imagination, and if he were an occultist, like Paracelsus, or Van Helmont, the question would be stripped of its mystery. 
He would understand the power of the human will and imagination the former conscious, the latter involuntary on the universal agent to inflict injury, physical and mental, not only upon chosen victims, but also, by reflex action, upon oneself and unconsciously. It is one of the fundamental principles of magic, that if a current of this subtle fluid is not impelled with sufficient force to reach the objective point, it will react upon the individual sending it, as an India rubber ball rebounds to the thrower's hand from the wall against which it strikes without being able to penetrate it. There are many cases and since where would-be sorcerers fell victims themselves. Van Helmont says, The imaginative power of a woman vividly excited produces an idea, which is the connecting medium between the body and spirit. This transfers itself to the being with whom the woman stands in the most immediate relation, and impresses upon it that image which the most agitated herself. Deleuze has collected, in his Bibliothèque du Magnetisme Animal, a number of remarkable facts taken from Van Helmont, among which we will content ourselves with quoting the following as pendants to the case of the bird hunter, Jacques Pellissier. He says that men by looking steadfastly at animals' oculus intentus for a quarter of an hour may cause their death which Rousseau confirms from his own experience in Egypt and the East, as having killed several toads in this manner. But when he at last tried this at Lyons, the toad, finding it could not escape from his eye, turned round, blew itself up, and stared at him so fiercely, without moving its eyes, that a weakness came over him even to fainting, and he was for some time thought to be dead. But to return to the question of teratology, Weiris tells, in his De Prostigies Demonum, of a child born of a woman who not long before its birth was threatened by her husband, he sang that she had the devil in her and that he would kill him. The mother's fright was such that her offspring appeared well shaped from the middle downward, but upward spotted with black and red spots, with eyes in his forehead, a mouth like a satyr, ears like a dog, and bended horns on its head like a goat. In a demonological work by Perimatus, there is a story of a monster born at St. Lawrence, in the West Indies, in the year 1573 the genuineness of which is certified by the Duke of Medina Sidonia. The child, besides the horrible deformity of its mouth, ears, and nose, had two horns on the head, like those of young goats, long hair on his body, a fleshy girdle about his middle, double, from whence hung a piece. p. 400. A flesh like a purse, and a bell of flesh in his left hand like those the Indians use when they dance, white boots of flesh on his legs, doubled down, and breathe, the whole shape was horrid and diabolical, and conceived to proceed from some fright the mother had taken from the antic dances of the Indians. Dr. Fisher rejects all such instances as unauthenticated and fabulous. But we will not weary the reader with further selections from the multitude of teratological cases to be found recorded in the works of standard authors, the above suffice to show that there is reason to attribute these aberrations of physiological type to the mutual reaction of the maternal mind and the universal ether upon each other. Lest some should question the authority of Van Helmont, as a man of science, we will refer them to the work of Fournier, the well-known physiologist, where, at page 717, the following estimate of his character will be found. Van Helmont was a highly distinguished chemist, he had particularly studied aeriform fluids, and gave them the name of gas, at the same time he pushed his piety to mysticism, abandoning himself exclusively to a contemplation of the divinity. Van Helmont is distinguished above all his predecessors by connecting the principle of life, directly and in some sort experimentally, as he tells us, with the most minute movements of the body. It is the incessant action of this entity, in no way associated by him with the material elements, but forming a distinct individuality, that we cannot understand. Nevertheless, it is upon this entity that a famous school has laid its principal foundation. Van Helmont's principle of life, or Archaeus, is neither more nor less than the astral light of all the Kabbalists, and the universal ether of modern science. If the more unimportant signatures of the fetus are not due to the imagination of the mother, to what other cause would Magendi attribute the formation of horny scales, the horns of goats and the hairy coats of animals, which we have seen in the above instances marking monstrous progeny? Surely there were no latent germs of these distinguishing features of the animal kingdom capable of being developed under a sudden impulse of the maternal fancy. In short, the only possible explanation is the one offered by the adepts in the occult sciences. Before leaving the subject, we wish to say a few words more respecting the cases where the head, arm, and hand were instantly dissolved, though it was evident that in each instance the entire body of the child had been perfectly formed. Of what is a child's body composed at its birth? 
The chemist will tell us that it comprises a dozen pounds of solidified gas, and a few ounces of ashy residuum, some water, oxygen. P. 401. Hydrogen, nitrogen, carbonic acid, a little lime, magnesia, phosphorus, and a few other minerals, that is all. Whence came they? How were they gathered together? How are these particles which Mr. Proctor tells us are drawn in from the depths of space surrounding us on all sides, formed and fashioned into the human being? We have seen that it is useless to ask the dominant school of which Magendi is an illustrious representative, for he confesses that they know nothing of the nutrition, digestion, or circulation of the fetus, and physiology teaches us that while the ovule is enclosed in the graphene vesicle it participates forms an integral part of the general structure of the mother. Upon the rupture of the vesicle, it becomes almost as independent of her for what is to build up the body of the future being as the germ and a bird's egg after the mother has dropped it in the nest. There certainly is very little in the demonstrated facts of science to contradict the idea that the relation of the embryonic child to the mother is much different from that of the tenant to the house, upon whose shelter he depends for health, warmth, and comfort. According to Democritus, the soul results from the aggregation of atoms, and Plutarch describes his philosophy as follows that there are substances infinite in number, indivisible, undisturbed, which are without differences, without qualities, and which move in space, where they are disseminated, that when they approach each other, they unite, interlock, and form by their aggregation water, fire, a plant, or a man. That all these substances, which he calls atoms by reason of their solidity, can experience neither change nor alteration. But, adds Plutarch, we cannot make a color of that which is colorless, nor a substance or soul of that which is without soul and without quality. Professor Balfour Stewart says that this doctrine, in the hands of John Dalton, has enabled the human mind to lay hold of the laws which regulate chemical changes, as well as to picture to itself what is their taking place. After quoting, with approbation, Bacon's idea that men are perpetually investigating the extreme limits of nature, he then erects a standard which he and his brother philosophers would do well to measure their behavior by. Surely we ought says he, to be very cautious before we dismiss any branch of knowledge or train of thought is essentially unprofitable. Brave words, these. But how many are the men of science who put them into practice? p. 402. Democritus of Obdera shows us space crammed with atoms, and our contemporary astronomers allow us to see how these atoms form into worlds, and afterward into the races, our own included, which people them. Since we have indicated the existence of a power in the human will, which, by concentrating currents of those atoms upon an objective point, can create a child corresponding to the mother's fancy, why is it not perfectly credible that the same power put forth by the mother, can, by an intense, albeit unconscious reversal of those currents, dissipate and obliterate any portion or even the whole of the body of her unborn child? And here comes in the question of false pregnancies, which have so often completely puzzled both physician and patient. If the head, arm, and hand of the three children mentioned by Van Helmont could disappear, as a result of the emotion of horror, why might not the same or some other emotion, excited in a like degree, cause the entire extinction of the fetus in so-called false pregnancy? Such cases are rare, but they do occur, and moreover baffle science completely. There certainly is no chemical solvent in the mother's circulation powerful enough to dissolve her child, without destroying herself. We commend the subject to the medical profession, hoping that as a class they will not adopt the conclusion of Fournier, who says, in this succession of phenomena we must confine ourselves to the office of historian, as we have not even tried to explain the whys and wherefores of these things, for there lie the inscrutable mysteries of life, and in proportion as we advance in our exposition, we will be obliged to recognize that this is to us forbidden ground. Within the limits of his intellectual capabilities the true philosopher knows no forbidden ground, and should be content to accept no mystery of nature as inscrutable or inviolable. No student of hermetic philosophy, nor any spiritualist, will object to the abstract principle laid down by Hume that a miracle is impossible, for to suppose such a possibility would make the universe governed through special instead of general laws. This is one of the fundamental contradictions between science and theology. The former, reasoning upon universal experience, maintains that there is a general uniformity of the course of nature, while the latter assumes that the governing mind can be invoked to suspend general law to suit special emergencies. Says John Stuart Mill, if we do not already believe in supernatural agencies, no miracle can prove to us their existence. The miracle itself, 
considered merely as an extraordinary fact, may be satisfactorily certified by our senses or by testimony, but nothing can ever prove that it is a miracle. p. 403. There is still another possible hypothesis, that of its being the result of some unknown natural cause, and this possibility cannot be so completely shut out as to leave no alternative but that of admitting the existence and intervention of a being superior to nature. This is the very point which we have sought to bring home to our logicians and physicists. As Mr. Mill himself says, we cannot admit a proposition as a law of nature, and yet believe a fact in real contradiction to it. We must disbelieve the alleged fact, or believe that we were mistaken in admitting the supposed law. Mr. Hume cites the firm and unalterable experience of mankind, as establishing the laws whose operation ipso facto makes miracles impossible. The difficulty lies in his use of the adjective which is italicized, for this is an assumption that our experience will never change, and that, as a consequence, we will always have the same experiments and observations upon which to base our judgment. It also assumes that all philosophers will have the same facts to reflect upon. It also entirely ignores such collected accounts of philosophical experiment and scientific discovery as we may have been temporarily deprived of. Thus, by the burning of the Alexandrian library and the destruction of Nineveh, the world has been for many centuries without the necessary data upon which to estimate the real knowledge, esoteric and exoteric, of the ancients. But, within the past few years, the discovery of the Rosetta Stone, the Ebers, Dabigny, Anastasi, and other papyri, and the exhumation of the tile libraries, have opened a field of archaeological research which is likely to lead to radical changes in this firm and unalterable experience. The author of Supernatural Religion justly observes that a person who believes anything contradictory to a complete induction, merely on the strength of an assumption which is incapable of proof, is simply credulous, but such an assumption cannot affect the real evidence for that thing. In a lecture delivered by Mr. Hiram Corson, Professor of Anglo-Saxon Literature at the Cornell University, Ithaca, N.Y., before the alumni of St. John's College, Annapolis, in July, 1875, the lecturer thus deservedly rebukes science. There are things, he says, which science can never do, and which it is arrogant and attempting to do. There was a time when religion and the church went beyond their legitimate domain, and invaded and harried that of science, and imposed a burdensome tribute upon the latter, but it would seem that their former relations to each other are undergoing an entire change, and science has crossed its frontiers and is invading the domain of religion and the church, and instead of a religious papacy, we are in danger of being brought under a scientific papacy we are in fact already brought under such a papacy, and as in the 16th century. p. 404. A protest was made, in the interest of intellectual freedom, against the religious and ecclesiastical despotism, so, in this 19th century, the spiritual and eternal interests of man demand that a protest should be made against a rapidly developing scientific despotism, and that scientists should not only keep within their legitimate domain of the phenomenal and the conditioned, but should re-examine their stock and trade, so that we may make sure how far the stock of bullion and the seller on the faith of whose existence so much paper has been circulating is really the solid gold of truth. If this is not done in science as well as in ordinary business, scientists are apt to put their capital at too high a figure and accordingly carry on a dangerously inflated business. Even since Professor Tyndall delivered his Belfast address, it has been shown, by the many replies it has elicited, that the capital of the evolution school of philosophy to which he belongs, is not nearly so great as it was before vaguely supposed to be by many of the non-scientific but intelligent portion of the world. It is quite surprising to a non-scientific person to be made aware of the large purely hypothetical domain which surrounds that of established science, and of which scientists often boast, as a part of their settled and available conquests. Exactly, and at the same time denying the same privilege to others. They protest against the miracles of the church, and repudiate, with as much logic, modern phenomena. In view of the admission of such scientific authorities as Dr. Humans and others that modern science is passing through a transitional period, it would seem that it is time that people should cease to consider certain things incredible only because they are marvelous and because they seem to oppose themselves to what we are accustomed to consider universal laws. There are not a few well-meaning men in the present century who, desiring to avenge the memory of such martyrs of science as Agrippa, Polysi, and Cardan, nevertheless fail, through lack of means, to understand their ideas rightly. They erroneously believe that the Neoplatonists gave more attention to transcendental philosophy than to exact science. 
The failures that Aristotle himself so often exhibits, remarks Professor Draper, are no proof of the unreliability of his method, but rather of its trustworthiness. They are failures arising from one of a sufficiency of facts. What facts? We might inquire. A man of science cannot be expected to admit that these facts can be furnished by occult science, since he does not believe in the latter. Nevertheless, the future may demonstrate. p. 405. This verity. Aristotle has bequeathed his inductive method to our scientists, but until they supplement it with the universals of Plato, they will experience still more failures than the great tutor of Alexander. The universals are a matter of faith only so long as they cannot be demonstrated by reason and based on uninterrupted experience. Who of our present-day philosophers can prove by the same inductive method that the ancients did not possess such demonstrations as a consequence of their esoteric studies? Their own negations, unsupported as they are by proof, sufficiently attest that they do not always pursue the inductive method they so much boast of. Oblige as they are to base their theories, Nolan's volens, on the groundwork of the ancient philosophers, their modern discoveries are but the shoots put forth by the germs planted by the former. And yet even these discoveries are generally incomplete, if not abortive. Their cause is involved in obscurity and their ultimate effect unforeseen. We are not, says Professor Eumens, to regard past theories as mere exploded errors, nor present theories as final. The living and growing body of truth has only mantled its old integuments in the progress to a higher and more vigorous state. This language, applied to modern chemistry by one of the first philosophical chemists and most enthusiastic scientific writers of the day, shows the transitional state in which we find modern science, but what is true of chemistry is true of all its sister sciences. Since the advent of spiritualism, physicians and pathologists are more ready than ever to treat great philosophers like Paracelsus and Van Helmont as superstitious quacks and charlatans, and to ridicule their notions about the Archaeus, or Anima Mundi, as well as the importance they gave to a knowledge of the machinery of the stars. And yet, how much of substantial progress has medicine effected since the days when Lord Bacon classed it among the conjectural sciences? Such philosophers as Democritus, Aristotle, Euripides, Epicurus, or rather his biographer, Lucretius, Aeschylus, and other ancient writers, whom the materialists so willingly quote as authoritative opponents of the dreamy Platonists, were only theorists, not adepts. The latter, when they did write, either had their works burned by Christian mobs or they worded them in a way to be intelligible only to the initiated. Who of their modern detractors can warrant that he knows all about what they know? Diocletian alone burned whole libraries of works upon the secret arts, not a manuscript treating on the art of making gold and silver escaped the wrath of this unpolished tyrant. Arts and civilization had attained such a development at what is now termed the archaic ages that we learn. p. 406. Through Champollion that Athothi, the second king of the first dynasty, wrote a work on anatomy, and the king Necho on astrology and astronomy. Blantesis and Centros were two learned geographers of those pre-Mosaic days. Ilian speaks of the Egyptian Iagus, whose memory was venerated for centuries for his wonderful achievements in medicine. He stopped the progress of several epidemics, merely with certain fumigations. A work of Apollonides, surnamed Arapios, is mentioned by Theophilus, patriarch of Antioch entitled The Divine Book, and giving the secret biography and origin of all the gods of Egypt, and Aminus Marcellinus speaks of a secret work in which was noted the precise age of the bull Apis a key to many a mystery and cyclic calculation. What has become of all these books, and who knows the treasures of learning they may have contained? We know but one thing for a certainty, and that is, that pagan and Christian vandals destroyed such literary treasures wherever they could find them and that the Emperor Alexander Severus went all over Egypt to collect the sacred books on mysticism and mythology, pillaging every temple, and that the Ethiopians old as were the Egyptians in arts and sciences claimed a priority of antiquity as well as of learning over them, as well they might, for they were known in India at the earliest dawn of history. We also know that Plato learned more secrets in Egypt than he was allowed to mention, and that, according to Champollion, all that is really good and scientific in Aristotle's work so prized in our day by our modern inductionists is due to his divine master, and that, as a logical sequence, Plato having imparted the profound secrets he had learned from the priests of Egypt to his initiated disciples orally who in their turn passed it from one generation to another of adepts the latter no more of the occult powers of nature than our philosophers of the present day. And here we may as well mention the works of Hermes Trismegistus, who, 
or how many have had the opportunity to read them as they were in the Egyptian sanctuaries? In his Egyptian mysteries, Yom Likus attributes to Hermes 1,100 books, and Seleucus reckons no less than 20,000 of his works before the period of Menes. Eusebius saw but 42 of these in his time, he says, and the last of the six books on medicine treated on that art as practice in the darkest ages, and p. 407. Diodorus says that it was the oldest of the legislators Nevis, the third successor of Menes, who received them from Hermes. Of such manuscripts as have descended to us, most are but Latin retranslations of Greek translations, made principally by the Neoplatonists from the original books preserved by some adepts. Marsilius Ficinus, who was the first to publish them in Venice, in 1488, has given us mere extracts, and the most important portions seem to have been either overlooked, or purposely omitted as too dangerous to publish in those days of auto de fe. And so it happens now that when a Kabbalist who has devoted his whole life to studying occultism, and has conquered the great secret, ventures to remark that the Kabbalah alone leads to the knowledge of the absolute and the infinite, and the indefinite and the finite, he is laughed at by those who because they know the impossibility of squaring the circle as a physical problem, deny the possibility of its being done in the metaphysical sense. Psychology, according to the greatest authorities on the subject, is a department of science hitherto almost unknown. Physiology, according to Fournier, one of its French authorities, is in so bad a condition as to warn us saying in the preface to his erudite work Physiologie du système nerveux, that we perceive at last that not only is the physiology of the brain not worked out, but also that no physiology whatever of the nervous system exists. Chemistry has been entirely remodeled within the past few years, therefore, like all new sciences, the infant cannot be considered as very firm on its legs. Geology has not yet been able to tell anthropology how long man has existed. Astronomy, the most exact of sciences, is still speculating and bewildered about cosmic energy, and many other things as important. In anthropology, Mr. Wallace tells us, there exists a wide difference of opinion on some of the most vital questions respecting the nature and origin of man. Medicine has been pronounced by various eminent physicians to be nothing better than scientific guesswork. Everywhere incompleteness, nowhere perfection. When we look at these earnest men groping around in the dark to find the missing links of their broken chains, they seem to us like persons starting from a common, fathomless abyss by divergent paths. Each of these ends at the brink of a chasm which they cannot explore. On the p. 408. One hand they lack the means to descend into its hidden depths, and on the other they are repulsed at each attempt by jealous sentries, who will not let them pass and so they go on watching the lower forces of nature and from time to time initiating the public into their great discoveries. Did they not actually pounce upon vital force and catch her playing in her game of correlation with chemical and physical forces? Indeed they did. But if we ask them whence this vital force, how is it that they who had so firmly believed, but a short time since, that matter was destructible and passed out of existence, and now have learned to believe as firmly that it does not, are unable to tell us more about it? Why are they forced in this case as in many others to return to a doctrine taught by Democritus twenty-four centuries ago? Ask them, and they will answer, creation or destruction of matter, increase or diminution of matter, lies beyond the domain of science, her domain is confined entirely to the changes of matter, the domain of science lies within the limits of these changes creation and annihilation lie outside of her domain. Ah. No, they lie only outside the grasp of materialistic scientists. But why affirm the same of science? And if they say that force is incapable of destruction, except by the same power which created it, then they tacitly admit the existence of such a power, and have therefore no right to throw obstacles in the way of those who, bolder than themselves, try to penetrate beyond, and find that they can only do so by lifting the veil of Isis. But, surely among all these inchoate branches of science, there must be some one at least complete. It seems to us that we heard a great clamor of applause, as the voice of many waters, over the discovery of protoplasm. But, alas, when we turn to read Mr. Huxley, the learned parent of the newborn infant is found saying, in perfect strictness, it is true that chemical investigation can tell us little or nothing, directly, of the composition of living matter, and, it is also in strictness, true, that we know nothing about the composition of any body whatever, as it is. This is a sad confession, indeed. It appears, then, that the Aristotelian method of induction is a failure in some cases, after all. This also seems to account for the fact that this model philosopher, 
with all his careful study of particulars before rising to universals, taught that the earth was in the center of the universe, while Plato, who lost himself in p. 409. The maze of Pythagorean vagaries, and started from general principles, was perfectly versed in the heliocentric system. We can easily prove the fact, by availing ourselves of the said inductive method for Plato's benefit. We know that the Sadelian oath of the initiate into the mysteries prevented his imparting his knowledge to the world in so many plain words. It was the dream of his life, says Champollion, to write a work and record in it and full the doctrines taught by the Egyptian hierophants. He often talked of it, but found himself compelled to abstain on account of the solemn oath. And now, judging our modern-day philosophers on the vice versa method namely, arguing from universals to particulars, and laying aside scientists as individuals to merely give our opinion of them, viewed as a whole we are forced to suspect this highly respectable association of extremely petty feelings toward their elder, ancient, and archaic brothers. It really seems as if they bore always in mind the adage, put out the sun, and the stars will shine. We have heard a French academician, a man of profound learning, remark, that he would gladly sacrifice his own reputation to have the record of the many ridiculous mistakes and failures of his colleagues obliterated from the public memory. But these failures cannot be recalled too often in considering our claims in the subject we advocate. The time will come when the children of men of science, unless they inherit the sole blindness of their skeptical parents, will be ashamed of the degrading materialism and narrow-mindedness of their fathers. To use an expression of the venerable William Howitt, the hate new truths as the owl and the thief hate the sun. Mere intellectual enlightenment cannot recognize the spiritual. As the sun puts out a fire, so spirit puts out the eyes of mere intellect. It is an old, old story. From the days when the preacher wrote, the eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing, scientists have deported themselves as if the saying were written to describe their own mental condition. How faithfully lucky, like himself a rationalist, unconsciously depicts this propensity in men of science to deride all new things, and his description of the manner in which educated men receive an account of a miracle having taken place. They receive it, says he, with an absolute and even derisive incredulity, which dispenses with all examination of the evidences. Moreover, so saturated do they become with the fashionable skepticism after once having fought their way into the academy, that they turn about and enact the role of persecutors in their turn. It is a curiosity of science, says Howitt, that Benjamin Franklin, who had himself experienced the ridicule of his countrymen for his attempts to identify lightning and electricity, p. 410, should have been one of the Committee of Savants, in Paris, in 1778, who examined the claims of mesmerism, and condemned it as absolute quackery. If men of science would confine themselves to the discrediting of new discoveries, there might be some little excuse for them on the score of their tendency to a conservatism begotten of long habits of patient scrutiny, but they not only set up claims to originality not warranted by fact, but contemptuously dismiss all allegations that the people of ancient times knew as much and even more than themselves. Pity that in each of their laboratories there is not suspended this text from Ecclesiastes, is there anything whereof it may be said, see, this is new? It hath been already of old time, which was before us. In the verse which follows the one here quoted, the wise man says, There is no remembrance of former things, so that this utterance may account for every new denial. Mr. Meldrum may exact praise for his meteorological observation of cyclones in the Mauritius, and Mr. Baxendal, of Manchester, talk learnedly of the convection currents of the earth, and Dr. Carpenter and Commander Morey map out for us the equatorial current, and Professor Henry show us how the moist wind deposits its burden to form rivulets and rivers only to be again rescued from the ocean and returned to the hilltops but hear what Cahela says, the wind goeth toward the south, and turneth about unto the north, it whirleth about continually, and the wind returneth again according to his circuits. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full, unto the place from whence the rivers come, thither they return again. The philosophy of the distribution of heat and moisture by means of ascending and descending currents between the equator and the poles, has a very recent origin, but here has the hand been lying on notice in our most familiar book, for nearly three thousand years. And even now, in quoting it, we are obliged to recall the fact that Solomon was a Kabbalist, and in the above text, simply repeats what was written thousands of years before his time. Cut off as they are from the accumulation of facts in one half of the universe, and at the most important, modern scholars are naturally unable to construct a system of philosophy which will satisfy themselves, let alone others.
They are like men in a coal mine, who work all day and emerge only at night, being thereby unable to appreciate or understand the beauty and glory of the sunshine. Life to them measures the term of human activity, and the future presence to their intellectual perception. p. 411. Only an abyss of darkness. No hope of an eternity of research, achievement, and consequent pleasure, softens the asperities of present existence, and no reward is offered for exertion but the bread-earning of today, and the shadowy and profitless fancy that their names may not be forgotten for some years after the grave has closed over their remains. Death to them means extinction of the flame of life, and the dispersion of the fragments of the lamp over boundless space. Said Berzelius, the great chemist, at his last hour, as he burst into tears, do not wonder that I weep. You will not believe me a weak man, nor think I am alarmed by what the doctor has to announce to me. I am prepared for all. But I have to bid farewell to science, and you ought not to wonder that it costs me dear. How bitter must be the reflections of such a great student of nature as this, to find himself forcibly interrupted midway toward the accomplishment of some great study, the construction of some great system, the discovery of some mystery which had baffled mankind for ages, but which the dying philosopher had dared hope that he might solve. Look at the world of science today, and see the atomic theorists, patching the tattered robes which expose the imperfections of their separate specialties. See them mending the pedestals upon which to set up again the idols which had fallen from the places where they had been worshipped before this revolutionary theory had been exhumed from the tomb of Democritus by John Dalton. In the ocean of material science they cast their nets, only to have the meshes broken when some unexpected and monstrous problem comes their way. Its water is like the Dead Sea bitter to the taste, so dense, that they can scarcely immerse themselves in it, much less dive to its bottom, having no outlet, and no life beneath its waves, or along its margin. It is a dark, forbidding, trackless waste, yielding nothing worth the having, because what it yields is without life and without soul. There was a period of time when the learned academics made themselves particularly merry at the simple enunciation of some marvels which the ancients gave as having occurred under their own observations. What poor dolts perhaps liars, these appeared in the eyes of an enlightened century. Did not they actually describe horses and other animals, the feet of which presented some resemblance to the hands and feet of men? And in A.D. 1876, we hear Mr. Huxley giving learned lectures in which the protohippus, rejoicing in a quasi-human forearm, in the orohippus with his four toes and Eocene origin, and the hypothetical podactyl equus, maternal granduncle of the present horse, play. p. 412. The most important part. The marvel is corroborated. Materialistic pyrrhonists of the 19th century avenged the assertions of superstitious Platonists, the antediluvian Gobey Mouche. And before Mr. Huxley, Geoffroy St. Hilaire has shown an instance of a horse which positively had fingers separated by membranes. When the ancients spoke of a pygmy race in Africa, they were taxed with falsehood. And yet, pygmies like these were seen and examined by a French scientist during his voyage in the Tendamaya, on the banks of the Rio Grande in 1840, by Bear Taylor at Cairo, in 1874, and by M. Bond, of the Indian Trigonometrical Survey, who discovered a wild dwarfish race living in the hill jungles of the western Gallats, to the southwest of the Palony Hills, a race, though often heard of, no trace of which had previously been found by the survey. This is a new pygmy race, resembling the African Abongos of Dushiu, the Akas of Schweinfort, and the Dokos of Dr. Krapf, and their size, appearance, and habits. Herodotus was regarded as a lunatic for speaking of a people who he was told slept during a night which lasted six months. If we explain the word slept by an easy misunderstanding it will be more than easy to account for the rest as an allusion to the night of the polar regions. Pliny has an abundance of facts in his work, which until very recently, were rejected as fables. Among others, he mentions a race of small animals, the males of which suckle their young ones. This assertion afforded much merriment among our savants. In his report of the Geological Survey of the Territories, for 1872, Mr. C. H. Merriam describes a rare and wonderful species of rabbit, Lepus berti, inhabiting the pine regions about the headwaters of the Wind and Yellowstone rivers, in Wyoming. Mr. Merriam secured five specimens of this animal, which, are the first individuals of the species that have been brought before the scientific world. One very curious fact is that all the males have teats, and take part in suckling their young. Adult males had large teats full of milk, and the hair around the nipple of one was wet, and stuck to it showing that, when taken, he had been engaged in nursing his young. 
and the Carthaginian account of the early voyages of Hanno, was found a long description of savage people, whose bodies were hairy and whom the interpreters called gorilla, alpha nu theta rho omicron pi omicron nu alpha gamma rho iota omicron nu as the text reads, clearly implying thereby that. p. 413. These wild men were monkeys. Until our present century, the statement was considered an idle story, and Godua rejected altogether the authenticity of the manuscript and its contents. The celebrated Atlantis is attributed by the latest modern commentator and translator of Plato's works to one of Plato's noble lies. Even the frank admission of the philosopher, and the Timaeus, that they say, that in their time, the inhabitants of this island, Poseidon, preserved a tradition handed down by their ancestors concerning the existence of the Atlantic island of a prodigious magnitude, etc. does not save the great teacher from the imputation of falsehood, by the infallible modern school. Among the great mass of peoples plunged deep in the superstitious ignorance of the medieval ages, there were but a few students of the hermetic philosophy of old, who, profiting by what it had taught them, were enabled to forecast discoveries which are the boast of our present age, while at the same time the ancestors of our modern high priests of the Temple of the Holy Molecule, were yet discovering the hoof tracks of Satan in the simplest natural phenomenon says Professor A. Wilder, Roger Bacon, 13th century, in his treatise on the admirable force of art and nature, devotes the first part of his work to natural facts. He gives us hints of gunpowder and predicts the use of steam as a propelling power. The hydraulic press, the diving bell and kaleidoscope are all described. The ancients speak of waters metamorphosed into blood, of blood rain, of snowstorms during which the earth was covered to the extent of many miles with snow of blood. This fall of crimson particles has been proved, like everything else, to be but a natural phenomenon. It has occurred at different epochs, but the cause of it remains a puzzle until the present day. De Condole, one of the most distinguished botanists of the century, sought to prove in 1825, at the time when the waters of the Lake of Mora had apparently turned into a thick blood, that the phenomenon could be easily accounted for. He attributed it to the development of myriads of those half-vegetable, half infusory animals which he terms oscillatory rubicens, and which form the link between animal and vegetable organisms. Elsewhere we give an account of the red snow. p. 414. Which Captain Ross observed in the Arctic regions. Many memoirs have been written on the subject by the most eminent naturalists, but no two of them agree in their hypotheses. Some call it pollen powder of a species of pine, others, small insects and Professor Agar confesses very frankly that he is at a loss to either account for the cause of such phenomena, or to explain the nature of the red substance. The unanimous testimony of mankind is said to be an irrefutable proof of truth, and about what was ever testimony more unanimous than that for thousands of ages among civilized people as among the most barbarous, there has existed a firm and unwavering belief in magic? The latter implies a contravention of the laws of nature only in the minds of the ignorant and if such ignorance is to be deplored in the ancient uneducated nations, why do not our civilized and highly educated classes of fervent Christians, deplore it also in themselves? The mysteries of the Christian religion have been no more able to stand a crucial test than biblical miracles. Magic alone, in the true sense of the word, affords a clue to the wonders of Aaron's rod, and the feats of the magi of Pharaoh, who opposed Moses, and it does that without either impairing the general truthfulness of the authors of the Exodus, or claiming more for the prophet of Israel than for others, or allowing the possibility of a single instance in which a miracle can happen in contravention of the laws of nature. Out of many miracles, we may select for our illustration that of the river turned into blood. The text says, Take thy rod and stretch out thine hand, with the rod in it, upon the waters, streams, etc., that they may become blood. We do not hesitate to say that we have seen the same thing repeatedly done on a small scale, the experiment not having been applied to a river in these cases. From the time of Van Helmont, who, in the 17th century, despite the ridicule to which he exposed himself, was willing to give the true directions for the so-called production of eels, frogs, and infusoria of various kinds, down to the champions of spontaneous generation of our own century, it has been known that such a quickening of germs is possible without calling in the aid of miracle to contravene natural law. The experiments of Pasteur and Spallanzani, and the controversy of the panspermis with the heterogeneous disciples of Buffon, among them Needham have too long occupied public attention to permit us to doubt that beings may be called into existence whenever there is air and favorable conditions of moisture and temperature. The records of the official meetings of the Academy of Sciences of Paris. P. 
415. Contain accounts of frequent appearances of such showers of blood-red snow and water. These blood spots were called leprovestium, and were but these lichen and fusoria. They were first observed in 786 and 959, in both of which years occurred great plagues. Whether these zoo carps were plants or animals is undetermined to this day, and no naturalist would risk stating as a certainty to what division of the organic kingdom of nature they belong. No more can modern chemists deny that such germs can be quickened, in a congenial element, in an incredibly short space of time. Now, if chemistry has, on the one hand, found means of depriving the air of its floating germs, and under opposite conditions can develop, or allow these organisms to develop, why could not the magicians of Egypt do so with their enchantments? It is far easier to imagine that Moses, who, on the authority of Manithou, had been an Egyptian priest, and had learned all the secrets of the land of Chemia, produced miracles according to natural laws, than that God himself violated the established order of his universe. We repeat that we have seen the sanguification of water produced by Eastern adepts. It can be done in either of two ways, in one case the experimenter employed a magnetic rod strongly electrified, which he passed over a quantity of water in a metallic basin, following a prescribed process, which we have no right to describe more fully at present, the water threw up in about ten hours a sort of reddish froth, which after two hours more became a kind of lichen, like the Lepraria kermesina of Baron Vrommel. It then changed into a blood-red jelly, which made of the water a crimson liquid that, twenty-four hours later, swarmed with living organisms. The second experiment consisted in thickly strewing the surface of a sluggish brook, having a muddy bottom, with the powder of a plant that had been dried in the sun and subsequently pulverized. Although this powder was seemingly carried off by the stream, some of it must have settled to the bottom, for on the following morning the water thickened at the surface and appeared covered with what to Condole describes as oscillatory rubicens, of a crimson-red color, in which he believes to be the connecting link between vegetable and animal life. Taking the above into consideration, we do not see why the learned alchemists and physicists physicists, we say of the mosaic period should not also have possessed the natural secret of developing in a few hours myriads of a kind of these bacteria, whose spores are found in the air, the water, and most vegetable and animal tissues. The rod plays as important a part in the hands of Aaron and Moses as it did in all so-called magic mummeries of Kabbalist magicians in the Middle Ages, that are now considered superstitious foolery and charlatanism. The rod of Paracelsus, his Kabbalistic trident, and the famous wands of Albertus Magnus p. 416. Roger Bacon, and Henry Conrath, are no more to be ridiculed than the graduating rod of our electromagnetic physicians. Things which appeared preposterous and impossible to the ignorant quacks and even learned scientists of the last century, now begin to assume the shadowy outlines of probability, and in many cases are accomplished facts. Nay, some learned quacks and ignorant scientists even begin to admit this truth. In a fragment preserved by Eusebius, Porphyry, in his letter to Anibo, appeals to Coremon, the higher grammatis, to prove that the doctrine of the magic arts, whose adepts could terrify even the gods, was really countenanced by Egyptian sages. Now, bearing in mind the rule of historical evidence propounded by Mr. Huxley, in his Nashville address, two conclusions present themselves with irresistible force, first, Porphyry, being in such unquestioned repute as a highly moral and honorable man, not given to exaggeration in his statements, was incapable of telling a lie about this matter, and did not lie, and second, that being so learned in every department of human knowledge about which he treats, it was most unlikely that he should be imposed upon as regards the magic arts, and he was not imposed upon. Therefore, the doctrine of chances supporting the theory of Professor Huxley, compels us to believe, one, that there was really such a thing as magic arts, and, two, that they were known and practiced by the Egyptian magicians and priests, whom even Sir David Brewster concedes to have been men of profound scientific attainments. Chapter 12. You never hear the really philosophical defenders of the doctrine of uniformity speaking of impossibilities in nature. They never say what they are constantly charged with saying, that it is impossible for the builder of the universe to alter his work. No theory upsets them. The English clergy, let the most destructive hypothesis be stated only in the language current among gentlemen, and they look it in the face. Tyndall. Lecture on the scientific use of the imagination. The world will have a religion of some kind, even though it should fly for it to the intellectual whoredom of spiritualism. Tyndall, Fragments of Science. But first on earth as vampires sent. Thy corpse shall from its tomb be rent. 
and suck the blood of all thy race. Lord Byron, your. We are now approaching the hallowed precincts of that Janus God the molecular Tyndall. Let us enter them barefoot. As we pass the sacred Adida of the Temple of Learning, we are nearing the blazing sun of the Huxleyocentric system. Let us cast down our eyes, lest we be blinded. We have discussed the various matters contained in this book, with such moderation as we could command in view of the attitude which the scientific and theological world have maintained for centuries toward those from whom they have inherited the broad foundations of all the actual knowledge which they possess. When we stand at one side, and, as a spectator, see how much the ancients knew, and how much the moderns think they know, we are amazed that the unfairness of our contemporary schoolmen should pass undetected. Every day brings new admissions of scientists themselves, and the criticisms of well-informed lay observers. We find the following illustrative paragraph in a daily paper. It is curious to note the various opinions which prevail among scientific men in regard to some of the most ordinary natural phenomena. The aurora is a notable case in point. Descartes considered it a meteor falling from the upper regions of the atmosphere. Halley attributed it to the magnetism of the terrestrial globe, and Dalton agreed with this opinion. Coates supposed that the aurora was derived from the fermentation of a matter emanating from the earth. Marion held it to be a consequence of a contact between the bright atmosphere of the sun and then the atmosphere of our planet. Euler thought the aurora proceeded from the vibrations of the ether among the particles of the terrestrial atmosphere. Canton and Franklin regarded it as a purely electrical phenomenon. p. 418. And Parrot attributed it to the conflagration of hydrogen carbonide escaping from the earth in consequence of the putrefaction of vegetable substances, and considered the shooting stars as the initial cause of such conflagration. The law Rive and Ersted concluded it to be an electromagnetic phenomenon, but purely terrestrial. Olmsted suspected that a certain nebulous body revolved around the sun in a certain time, and that when this body came into the neighborhood of the earth, a part of its gaseous material mixed with our atmosphere, and that this was the origin of the phenomenon of the aurora. And so we might say of every branch of science. Thus, it would seem that even as to the most ordinary natural phenomena, scientific opinion is far from being unanimous. There is not an experimentalist or theologian, who, in dealing with the subtle relations between mind and matter, their genesis and ultimate, does not draw a magical circle, the plane of which he calls forbidden ground. Where faith permits a clergyman to go, he goes, for, as Tyndall says, they do not lack the positive element namely, the love of truth, but the negative element, the fear of error, preponderates. But the trouble is, that their dogmatic creed weighs down the nimble feet of their intellect, as the ball and chain does the prisoner in the trenches. As to the advance of scientists, their very learning, moreover, is impeded by these two causes their constitutional incapacity to understand the spiritual side of nature, and their dread of public opinion. No one has said a sharper thing against them than Professor Tyndall, when he remarks, in fact, the greatest cowards of the present day are not to be found among the clergy, but within the pale of science itself. If there had been the slightest doubt of the applicability of this degrading epithet, it was removed by the conduct of Professor Tyndall himself, for, in his Belfast address, as president of the British Association, he not only discerned in matter the promise and potency of every form and quality of life, but pictured science as wresting from theology the entire domain of cosmological theory, and then, when confronted with an angry public opinion, issued a revised edition of the address in which he had modified his expression, substituting for the words every form and quality of life, all terrestrial life. This is more than cowardly it is an ignominious surrender of his professed principles. At the time of the Belfast meeting, Mr. Tyndall had two pet aversions theology and spiritualism. What he thought of the former has been shown, the latter he called a degrading belief. When hard-pressed by the church for alleged atheism, he made haste to disclaim the amputation, and sue for. p. 419. Peace, but, as his agitated nervous centers and cerebral molecules had to equilibrate by expanding their force in some direction, he turns upon the helpless, because pusillanimous, spiritualist, and in his fragments of science insults their belief after this fashion, the world will have a religion of some kind, even though it should fly for it to the intellectual whoredom of spiritualism. What a monstrous anomaly, that some millions of intelligent persons should permit themselves to be thus reviled by a leader in science, who, himself, has told us that the thing to be repressed both in science and out of it is dogmatism. We will not encroach upon space by discussing the etymological value of the epithet. 
While expressing the hope that it may not be adopted in future ages by science as a tindalism, we will simply remind the benevolent gentleman of a very characteristic feature in himself. One of our most intelligent, honorable, and erudite spiritualists, and author of no small renown, has pointedly termed this feature as his, Tyndall's, simultaneous coquetry with opposite opinions. If we are to accept the epithet of Mr. Tyndall in all its coarse signification, it applies less to spiritualists, who are faithful to their belief, than to the atheistical scientist who quits the loving embraces of materialism to fling himself in the arms of a despised theism, only because he finds his profit in it. We have seen how McGinty frankly confesses the ignorance of physiologists as to some of the most important problems of life, and how Fournier agrees with him. Professor Tyndall admits that the evolution hypothesis does not solve, does not profess to solve, the ultimate mystery. We have also given as much thought as our natural powers will permit to Professor Huxley's celebrated lecture on the physical basis of life, so that what we may say in this volume as to the tendency of modern scientific thought may be free from ignorant misstatement. Compressing his theory within the closest possible limits, it may be formulated thus, out of cosmic matter all things are created, the similar forms result from different permutations and combinations of this matter, matter has devoured spirit, hence spirit does not exist, thought is a property of matter, existing forms die that others may take their place, the dissimilarity in organism is due only to varying chemical action in the same life matter all protoplasm being identical. As far as chemistry and microscopy goes, Professor Huxley's system may be faultless, and the profound sensation caused throughout the world by its enunciation can be readily understood. But its defect is that the thread of his logic begins nowhere, and ends in a void. He has made the best possible use of the available material. Given a universe crowded. p. 420. With molecules, endowed with active force, and containing in themselves the principle of life, and all the rest is easy. One set of inherent forces impelled to aggregate into worlds, and another to evolve the various forms of plant and animal organism. But what gave the first impulse to those molecules and endowed them with that mysterious faculty of life? What is this occult property which causes the protoplasms of man, beast, reptile, fish, or plant, to differentiate, each ever evolving its own kind, and never any other? And after the physical body gives up its constituents to the soil and air, whether fungus or oak, Worm or man, what becomes of the life which once animated the frame? Is the law of evolution, so imperative in its application to the method of nature, from the time when cosmic molecules are floating, to the time when they form a human brain, to be cut short at that point, and not allowed to develop more perfect entities out of this pre-existent law of form? Is Mr. Huxley prepared to assert the impossibility of man's attainment to a state of existence after physical death, in which he will be surrounded with new forms of plant and animal life? the result of new arrangements of now sublimated matter? He acknowledges that he knows nothing about the phenomena of gravitation, except that, in all human experience, as stones, unsupported, have fallen to the ground, there is no reason for believing that any stone so circumstance will not fall to the ground. But, he utterly repels any attempt to change this probability into a necessity, and in fact says, I utterly repudiate and anathematize the intruder. Facts I know, and law I know. But what is this necessity, save an empty shadow of my own mind's throwing? It is this, only, that everything which happens in nature is the result of necessity, and a law once operative will continue to so operate indefinitely until it is neutralized by an opposing law of equal potency. Thus, it is natural that the stone should fall to the ground in obedience to one force, and it is equally natural that it should not fall, or that having fallen, it should rise again, in obedience to another force equally potent which Mr. Huxley may, or may not, be familiar with. It is natural that a chair should rest upon the floor when once placed there, and it is equally natural, as the testimony of hundreds of competent witnesses. p. 421. Shows, that it should rise in the air, untouched by any visible, mortal hand. Is it not Mr. Huxley's duty to first ascertain the reality of this phenomenon, and then invent a new scientific name for the force behind it? Facts I know, says Mr. Huxley, and law I know. Now, by what means did he become acquainted with fact and law? Through his own senses, no doubt, and these vigilant servants enabled him to discover enough of what he considers truth to construct a system which he himself confesses appears almost shocking to common sense. If his testimony is to be accepted as the basis for a general reconstruction of religious belief, when they have produced only a theory after all, 
Why is not the cumulative testimony of millions of people as to the occurrence of phenomena which undermine its very foundations, worthy of a like respectful consideration? Mr. Huxley is not interested in these phenomena, but these millions are, and while he has been digesting his bread and mutton protoplasms, to gain strength for still bolder metaphysical flights, they have been recognizing the familiar handwriting of those they love the best, traced by spiritual hands, and discerning the shadowy simulacre of those who, having lived here, and passed through the change of death, give the lie to his pet theory. So long as science will confess that her domain lies within the limits of these changes of matter, and that chemistry will certify that matter, by changing its form from the solid or liquid, to the gaseous condition, only changes from the visible to the invisible, and that, amid all these changes, the same quantity of matter remains, she has no right to dogmatize. She is incompetent to say either yea or nay, and must abandon the ground to persons more intuitional than her representatives. High above all other names in his pantheon of nihilism, Mr. Huxley writes that of David Hume. He esteems that philosopher's great service to humanity to be his irrefragable demonstration of the limits of philosophical inquiry, outside which lie the fundamental doctrines of spiritualism, and other isms. It is true that the tenth chapter of Hume's inquiry concerning human understanding was so highly esteemed by its author, that he considered that with the wise and learned it would be an everlasting check to all kinds of superstitious delusion, which with him was simply a convertible term to represent a belief in some phenomena previously unfamiliar and by him arbitrarily classified as miracle. But, as Mr. Wallace justly observes, Hume's apothem, that a miracle is a violation of the laws of nature, is imperfect, for in the first place it assumes that we know all the laws of nature, and, second, that an unusual phenomenon is a miracle. Mr. Wallace proposes that a miracle should be defined as, any act or event necessarily implying. p. 422. The existence and agency of superhuman intelligences. Now Hume himself says that a uniform experience amounts to a proof, and Huxley, in this famous essay of his, admits that all we can know of the existence of the law of gravitation is that since, in all human experience, stones unsupported have fallen to the ground, there is no reason for believing that the same thing will not occur again, under the same circumstances, but, on the contrary, every reason to believe that it will. If it were certain that the limits of human experience could never be enlarged, then there might be some justice in Hume's assumption that he was familiar with all that could happen under natural law, and some decent excuse for the contemptuous tone which marks all of Huxley's allusions to spiritualism. But, as it is evident from the writings of both these philosophers, that they are ignorant of the possibilities of psychological phenomena, too much caution cannot be used in according way to their dogmatic assertions. One would really suppose that a person who should permit himself such rudeness of criticism upon spiritualistic manifestations had qualified himself for the office of censor by an adequate course of study, but, in a letter addressed to the London Dialectical Society, Mr. Huxley, after saying that he had no time to devote to the subject, and that it does not interest him, makes the following confession, which shows us upon what slight foundation modern scientists sometimes form very positive opinions. The only case of spiritualism, he writes, I ever had the opportunity of examining into for myself, was as gross an imposture as ever came under my notice. What would this protoplasmic philosopher think of a spiritualist who, having had but one opportunity to look through a telescope, and upon that sole occasion had had some deception played upon him by a tricky assistant at the observatory, should forthwith denounce astronomy as a degrading belief? This fact shows that scientists, as a rule, are useful only as collectors of physical facts, their generalizations from them are often feebler and far more illogical than those of their lay critics. And this also is why they misrepresent ancient doctrines. Professor Balfour Stewart pays a very high tribute to the philosophical intuition of Heraclitus, the Ephesian, who lived five centuries before our era the crying philosopher who declared that fire was the great cause, and that all things were in a perpetual flux. It seems clear, says the professor, that Heraclitus must have had a vivid conception of the innate restlessness and energy of the universe, a conception allied in character to, and only less precise than that of modern philosophers who regard matter as essentially dynamical. He considers the expression fire as very vague, and quite naturally, for the evidence is wanting to show that either Professor Balfour Stewart, who seems less inclined. p. 423. To materialism than some of his colleagues, or any of his contemporaries understand in what sense the word fire was used. His opinions about the origin of things were the same as those of Hippocrates. 
both entertain the same views of a supreme power, and, therefore, if their notions of primordial fire, regarded as a material force, in short, as one akin to Leibniz's dynamism, were less precise than those of modern philosophers, a question which remains to be settled yet, on the other hand their metaphysical views of it were far more philosophical and rational than the one-sided theories of our present-day scholars. Their ideas of fire were precisely those of the later fire philosophers, the Rosicrucians, and the earlier Zoroastrians. They affirmed that the world was created of fire, the divine spirit of which was an omnipotent and omniscient god. Science has condescended to corroborate their claims as to the physical question. Fire, in the ancient philosophy of all times and countries, including our own, has been regarded as a triple principle. As water comprises a visible fluid with invisible gases lurking within, and, behind all the spiritual principle of nature, which gives them their dynamic energy, so, in fire, they recognize, first, visible flame, 2D, invisible, or astral fire invisible when inert, but when active producing heat, light, chemical force, and electricity, the molecular powers, 3D, spirit. They applied the same rule to each of the elements, and everything evolved from their combinations and correlations, man included, was held by them to be triune. Fire, in the opinion of the Rosicrucians, who were but the successors of the Theurgists, was the source, not only of the material atoms, but also of the forces which energize them. When a visible flame is extinguished it has disappeared, not only from the sight but also from the conception of the materialist, forever. But the hermetic philosopher follows it through the partition world of the noble, across and out on the other side into the unknowable, as he traces the disembodied human spirit, vital spark of heavenly flame, into the etherium, beyond the grave. This point is too important to be passed by without a few words of comment. The attitude of physical science toward the spiritual half of the cosmos is perfectly exemplified in her gross conception of fire. In this, as in every other branch of science, their philosophy does not contain one sound plank, every one is honeycombed and weak. The works of their own authorities teeming with humiliating confessions, give us the p. 424. Right to say that the floor upon which they stand is so unstable, that at any moment some new discovery, by one of their own number, may knock away the props and let them all fall and heap together. They are so anxious to drive spirit out of their conceptions that, as Balfour Stewart says, there is a tendency to rush into the opposite extreme, and to work physical conceptions to an excess. He utters a timely warning in adding, let us be cautious that, in avoiding Scylla, we do not rush into Charybdis. For the universe is more than one point of view, and there are possibly regions which will not yield their treasures to the most determined physicists, armed only with kilograms and meters and standard clocks. In another place he confesses, we know nothing, or next to nothing, of the ultimate structure and properties of matter, whether organic or inorganic. As to the other great question we find in Macaulay, a still more unreserved declaration, the question what becomes of man after death we do not see that a highly educated European, left to his unassisted reason, is more likely to be in the right than a Blackfoot Indian. Not a single one of the many sciences in which we surpass the Blackfoot Indians throws the smallest light on the state of the soul after the animal life is extinct. In truth, all the philosophers, ancient and modern, who have attempted, without the help of revelation, to prove the immortality of man, from Plato down to Franklin, appear to us to have failed deplorably. There are revelations of the spiritual senses of man which may be trusted far more than all the sophistries of materialism. What was a demonstration and a success in the eyes of Plato and his disciples is now considered the overflow of a spurious philosophy into failure. The scientific methods are reversed. The testimony of the men of old, who were nearer to truth, for they were nearer to the spirit of nature the only aspect under which the deity will allow itself to be viewed and understood in their demonstrations, are rejected. Their speculations if we must believe the modern thinkers are but the expression of a redundance of the unsystematic opinions of men unacquainted with the scientific method of the present century. They foolishly based the little they knew of physiology on well-demonstrated psychology, while the scholar of our day bases psychology of which he confesses himself utterly ignorant on physiology, which to him is as yet a closed book, and has not even a method of its own, as Fournier tells us. As to the last objection in Macaulay's argument, it was answered by Hippocrates centuries ago, all knowledge, all arts are to be found in nature, he. p. 425. Page missing in source. p. 
426. The artist will display his waves of harmony better on a royal era than he could have done on a spinet of the 16th century. Therefore, whether this instinctive impulse was directly impressed upon the nervous system of the first insect, or each species has gradually had it developed in itself by instinctively mimicking the acts of its like, as the more perfected doctrine of Herbert Spencer has it, is immaterial to the present subject. The question concerns spiritual evolution only. And if we reject this hypothesis as unscientific and undemonstrated, then will the physical aspect of evolution have to follow it to the ground in its turn, because the one is as undemonstrated as the other, and the spiritual intuition of man is not allowed to dovetail the two, under the pretext that it is unphilosophical. Whether we wish it or not, we will have to fall back on the old query of Plutarch's Symposiacs, whether it was the bird or the egg which first made its appearance. Now that the Aristotelian authority is shaken to its foundations with that of Plato, and our men of science reject every authority and they hate it, except each his own, and the general estimate of human collective wisdom is at the lowest discount, mankind, headed by science itself, is still irrepressibly drawing back to the starting point of the oldest philosophies. We find our idea perfectly expressed by a writer in the popular Science Monthly. The gods of sex and specialities, says Osgood Mason, may perhaps be failing of their accustomed reverence, but, in the meantime, there is dawning on the world, with a softer and serener light, the conception, imperfect though it still may be, of a conscious, originating, all-pervading active soul the oversoul, the cause, the deity, unrevealed through human form or speech, but filling and inspiring every living soul in the wide universe according to its measure, whose temple is nature, and whose worship is admiration. This is pure Platonism, Buddhism, and the exalted but just views of the earliest Aryans in their deification of nature. And such is the expression of the ground thought of every theosophist, Kabbalist, and occultist in general, and if we compare it with the quotation from Hippocrates, which precedes the above, we will find in it exactly the same thought and spirit. To return to our subject. The child lacks reason, it being as yet latent in him, and meanwhile he is inferior to the animal as to instinct proper. He will burn or drown himself before he learns that fire and water destroy and are dangerous for him, while the kitten will avoid both instinctively. The little instinct the child possesses fades away as reason, step by step, develops itself. It may be objected, perhaps, that instinct cannot be a spiritual gift, because animals possess it in a higher degree than man, and animals have no souls. Such a belief is erroneous and based upon very insecure foundations. It came from the fact that p. 427. The inner nature of the animal could be fathomed still less than that of man, who is endowed with speech and can display to us his psychological powers. But what proofs other than negative have we that the animal is without a surviving, if not a mortal, soul? On strictly scientific grounds we can adduce as many arguments pro as contra. To express it clearer, neither man nor animal can offer either proof or disproof of the survival of their souls after death. And from the point of view of scientific experience, it is impossible to bring that which has no objective existence under the cognizance of any exact law of science. But Descartes and Bois Raymond have exhausted their imaginations on the subject, and Agassiz could not realize such a thing as a future existence not shared by the animals we love, and even the vegetable kingdom which surrounds us. And it is enough to make one's feelings revolt against the claim justice of the first cause to believe that while a heartless, cold-blooded villain has been endowed with an immortal spirit, the noble, honest dog, often self-denying unto death, that protects the child or master he loves at the peril of his life, that never forgets him, but starves himself on his grave, the animal in whom the sense of justice and generosity are sometimes developed to an amazing degree, will be annihilated. No, away with the civilized reason which suggests such heartless partiality. Better, far better to cling to one's instinct in such a case, and believe what the Indian of Pope, whose untutored mind can only picture to himself a heaven where, admitted to that equal sky, his faithful dog shall bear him company. Space fails us to present the speculative views of certain ancient and medieval occultists upon this subject. Suffice it that they antedated Darwin, embraced more or less all his theories on natural selection and the evolution of species, and largely extended the chain at both ends. Moreover, these philosophers were explorers as daring in psychology as in physiology and anthropology. They never turned aside from the double parallel path traced for them by their great master Hermes. As above, so below, was ever their axiom, and their physical evolution was traced out simultaneously with the spiritual one. 
On one point, at least, our modern biologists are quite consistent, unable, as yet, to demonstrate the existence of a distinct individual soul in animals, they deny it to man. Reason has brought them to the brink of Tyndall's impassable chasm, between mind and matter, instinct alone can teach them to bridge it. When in their despair of ever being. p. 428. Able to fathom the mystery of life, they will have come to a dead stop, their instinct may reassert itself, and take them across the hitherto fathomless abyss. This is the point which Professor John Fisk and the authors of The Unseen Universe seem to have reached, and Wallace, the anthropologist and ex-materialist, to have been the first to courageously step over. Let them push boldly until they discover that it is not spirit that dwells in matter, but matter which clings temporarily to spirit, and that the latter alone is an eternal, imperishable abode for all things visible and invisible. Esoteric philosophers held that everything in nature is but a materialization of spirit. The eternal first cause is latent spirit, they said, in matter from the beginning. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. While conceding the idea of such a God to be an unthinkable abstraction to human reason, they claim that the unerring human instinct grasped it as a reminiscence of something concrete to it though intangible to our physical senses. With the first idea, which emanated from the double sex and hitherto inactive deity, the first motion was communicated to the whole universe, and the electric thrill was instantaneously felt throughout the boundless space. Spirit begat force, and force matter, and thus the latent deity manifested itself as a creative energy. When, at what point of the eternity, or how? The question must always remain unanswered, for human reason is unable to grasp the great mystery. But, though spirit matter was from all eternity, it was in the latent state, the evolution of our visible universe must have had a beginning. To our feeble intellect, this beginning may seem so remote as to appear to us eternity itself a period inexpressible in figures or language. Aristotle argued that the world was eternal, and that it will always be the same, that one generation of men has always produced another, without ever having had a beginning that could be determined by our intellect. And this, his teaching, in its exoteric sense, clashed with that of Plato who taught that there was a time when mankind did not perpetuate itself, but in spirit both the doctrines agreed, as Plato adds immediately, this was followed by the earthly human race, in which the primitive history was gradually forgotten and man sank deeper and deeper, and Aristotle says, if there has been a first man he must have been born without father or mother which is repugnant to nature. For there could not have been a first egg to give a beginning to birds, or there should have been a first bird which gave a beginning to eggs, for a bird comes from an egg. The same he held good for all species, believing, with Plato, that everything before it appeared on earth had first its being in spirit. p. 429. This mystery of first creation, which was ever the despair of science, is unfathomable, unless we accept the doctrine of the Hermetists. Though matter is co-eternal with spirit, that matter is certainly not our visible, tangible, and divisible matter, but its extreme sublimation. Pure spirit is but one remove higher. Unless we allow man to have been evolved out of this primordial spirit matter, how can we ever come to any reasonable hypothesis as to the genesis of animate beings? Darwin begins his evolution of species at the lowest point and traces upward. His only mistake may be that he applies his system at the wrong end. Could he remove his quest from the visible universe into the invisible, he might find himself on the right path. But then, he would be following in the footsteps of the Hermetists that our philosophers positivists even the most learned among them, never understood the spirit of the mystic doctrines taught by the old philosophers Platonists is evident from that most eminent modern work, Conflict Between Religion and Science. Professor Draper begins his fifth chapter by saying that the pagan Greeks and Romans believe that the spirit of man resembles his bodily form, varying its appearance with his variations, and growing with his growth. What the ignorant masses thought is a matter of little consequence though even they could never have indulged in such speculations taken all la lettre. As to Greek and Roman philosophers of the Platonic school, they believed no such thing of the spirit of man, but applied the above doctrine to his soul, or psychical nature, which, as we have previously shown, is not the divine spirit. Aristotle, in his philosophical deduction on dreams, shows this doctrine of the twofold soul, or soul and spirit, very plainly. It is necessary for us to ascertain in what portion of the soul dreams appear, he says. All the ancient Greeks believed not only a double, but even a triple soul to exist in man. And even Homer we find terming the animal soul, or the astral soul, called by Mr. Draper's spirit, theta upsilon mu omicron sigma, 
and the divine one knew Omicron Upsilon Sigma the name by which Plato also designated the higher spirit. The Hindu Jainas conceive the soul, which they call Yua, to have been united from all eternity to even two sublimated ethereal bodies, one of which is invariable and consists of the divine powers of the higher mind, the other variable and composed of the grosser passions of man, his sensual affections, and terrestrial attributes. When the soul becomes purified after death it joins its Vakarika, or divine spirit, and becomes a god. The followers of the Vedas, the learned Brahmins, explain the same doctrine in the Vedanta. The soul, according to their teaching, as a portion of the divine universal spirit or immaterial mind, is capable of uniting itself with the essence of its highest entity. The teaching is explicit. p. 430. The Vedanta affirms that whoever attains the thorough knowledge of his god becomes a god while yet in his mortal body, and acquires supremacy over all things. Quoting from the Vedic theology the verse which says, There is in truth but one deity, the Supreme Spirit, he is of the same nature as the soul of man. Mr. Draper shows the Buddhistic doctrines as reaching Eastern Europe through Aristotle. We believe the assertion unwarranted, for Pythagoras, and after him Plato, taught them long before Aristotle. If subsequently the later Platonists accepted in their dialectics the Aristotelian arguments on emanation, it was merely because his views coincided in some respect with those of the Oriental philosophers. The Pythagorean number of harmony and Plato's esoteric doctrines on creation are inseparable from the Buddhistic doctrine of emanation, and the great aim of the Pythagorean philosophy, namely, to free the astral soul from the fetters of matter and sense, and make it thereby fit for an eternal contemplation of spiritual things, is a theory identical with the Buddhistic doctrine of final absorption. It is the nirvana, interpreted in its right sense, a metaphysical tenet that just begins to be suspected now by our latest Sanskrit scholars. If the doctrines of Aristotle have exercised on the later Neoplatonists such a dominating influence, how is it that neither Plotinus, nor Porphyry, nor Proclus ever accepted his theories on dreams and prophetic soul visions? While Aristotle held that most of those who prophesy have diseases of madness thus furnishing some American plagiarists and specialists with a few reasonable ideas to disfigure the views of Porphyry, hence those of Plotinus, were quite the reverse. In the most vital questions of metaphysical speculations Aristotle is constantly contradicted by the Neoplatonists. Furthermore, either the Buddhistic nirvana is not the nihilistic doctrine, as it is now represented to be, or the Neoplatonists did not accept it in this sense. Surely Mr. Draper will not take upon himself to affirm that either Plotinus, Porphyry, Iamblichus, or any other philosopher of their mystic school, did not believe in the soul's immortality? To say that either of them sought ecstasy as a foretaste of absorption into the universal mundane soul, in the sense in which the Buddhist nirvana is understood by every Sanskrit scholar, is to wrong these philosophers. Nirvana is not, as Mr. Draper has it, a reabsorption in the universal force, eternal rest, and bliss, but, when taken literally by the said scholars, means the blowing out, the extinction, complete annihilation, and not absorption. No one, so far as we know, has ever taken p. 431. Upon himself to ascertain the true metaphysical meaning of this word, which is not to be found, even in the Lankavatara, which gives the different interpretations of the Nirvana by the Brahmins Tirtakas. Therefore, for one who reads this passage in Mr. Draper's work, and bears in mind what the usually accepted meaning of the Nirvana, will naturally suppose that Plotinus and Porphyry were nihilists. Such a page in the conflict gives us a certain right to suppose that either one, the learned author desired to place Plotinus and Porphyry on the same plane with Giordano Bruno, of whom he makes, very erroneously, an atheist, or, too, that he never took the trouble of studying the lives of these philosophers and their views. Now, for one who knows Professor Draper, even by reputation, the latter supposition is simply absurd. Therefore, we must think, with deep regret, that his desire was to misrepresent their religious aspirations. It is decidedly an awkward thing for modern philosophers, whose sole aim seems to be the elimination of the ideas of God and the immortal spirit from the mind of humanity, to have to treat with historical impartiality the most celebrated of the pagan Platonists. To have to admit, on the one hand, their profound learning, their genius, their achievements in the most abstruse philosophical questions, and therefore their sagacity, and, on the other, their unreserved adhesion to the doctrine of immortality, of the final triumph of spirit over matter, and their implicit faith in God and the gods, or spirits, and the return of the dead, apparitions, 
and other spiritual matters, is a dilemma from which academical human nature could not reasonably be expected to extricate itself so easily. The plan resorted to by Lampriere, in such an emergency as the above, is coarser than Professor Draper's, but equally effective. He charges the ancient philosophers with deliberate falsehood, trickery, and credulity. After painting to his readers Pythagoras, Plotinus, and Porphyry as marvels of learning, morality, and accomplishments, as men eminent for personal dignity, purity of lives, and self-abnegation in the pursuit of divine truths, he does not hesitate to rank this celebrated philosopher, Pythagoras, among impostors, while to Porphyry he attributes credulity, lack of judgment, and dishonesty. Forced by the facts of history to give them their just due in the course of his narrative, he displays his bigoted prejudice in the parenthetical comments which he allows himself. From this antiquated writer of the last century we learn that a man may be honest, and at the same time an impostor, pure, virtuous, and a great philosopher, and yet dishonest, a liar, and a fool. We have shown elsewhere that the secret doctrine does not concede. p. 432. Immortality to all men alike. The eye would never see the sun, if it were not of the nature of the sun, said Plotinus. Only through the highest purity and chastity we shall approach nearer to God, and receive in the contemplation of Him, the true knowledge and insight, writes Porphyry. If the human soul has neglected during its lifetime to receive its illumination from its divine spirit, our personal God, then it becomes difficult for the gross and sensual man to survive for a great length of time his physical death. No more than the misshapen monster can live long after its physical birth, can the soul, once that it has become too material, exist after its birth into the spiritual world. The viability of the astral form is so feeble, that the particles cannot cohere firmly when once it is slipped out of the unyielding capsule of the external body. Its particles, gradually obeying the disorganizing attraction of universal space, finally fly asunder beyond the possibility of reaggregation. Upon the occurrence of such a catastrophe, the individual ceases to exist, his glorious ogoides has left him. During the intermediary period between his bodily death and the disintegration of the astral form, the latter, bound by magnetic attraction to its ghastly corpse, prowls about, and sucks vitality from susceptible victims. The man having shut out of himself every ray of the divine light, is lost in darkness, and, therefore, clings to the earth and the earthy. No astral soul, even that of a pure, good, and virtuous man, is immortal in the strictest sense, from elements it was formed to elements it must return. Only, while the soul of the wicked vanishes, and is absorbed without redemption, that of every other person, even moderately pure, simply changes its ethereal particles for still more ethereal ones, and, while there remains in it a spark of the divine, the individual man, or rather, his personal ego, cannot die. After death, says Proclus, the soul, the spirit, continueth to linger in the aerial body, astral form, till it is entirely purified from all angry and voluptuous passions, then doth it put off by a second dying the aerial body as it did the earthly one. Whereupon, the ancients say that there is a celestial body always joined with the soul, and which is immortal, luminous, and star-like. But, we will now turn from our digression to further consider the question of reason and instinct. The latter, according to the ancients, proceeded from the divine, the former from the purely human. One, the instinct, is the product of the senses, a sagaciousness shared by the lowest animals, even those who have no reason it is the alpha iota sigma theta epsilon tau iota kappa omicron nu the other is the product of the reflective faculties nu omicron epsilon tau iota kappa omicron nu, denoting judiciousness and human intellectuality. Therefore, an animal devoid of reasoning powers has in its inherent instinct an unerring faculty which is but that spark of the divine which lurks in every particle of inorganic. P. 433. Matter itself materialized spirit. In the Jewish Kabbalah, the second and third chapters of Genesis are explained thus, when the second Adam is created out of the dust, matter has become so gross that it reigns supreme. Out of its list evolves woman, and Lilith has the best of spirit. The Lord God, walking in the garden in the cool of the day, the sunset of spirit, or divine light obscured by the shadows of matter, curses not only them who have committed the sin, but even the ground itself, and all living things the tempting serpent matter above all. Who but the Kabbalists are able to explain this seeming act of injustice? How are we to understand this cursing of all created things, innocent of any crime? The allegory is evident. 
the curse inheres in matter itself. Henceforth, it is doomed to struggle against its own grossness for purification, the latent spark of divine spirit, though smothered, is still there, and its invincible attraction upward compels it to struggle in pain and labor to free itself. Logic shows us that as all matter had a common origin, it must have attributes in common, and as the vital and divine spark is in man's material body, so it must lurk in every subordinate species. The latent mentality which, in the lower kingdoms is recognized as semi-consciousness, consciousness, and instinct, is largely subdued in man. Reason, the outgrowth of the physical brain, develops at the expense of instinct the flickering reminiscence of a once divine omniscient spirit. Reason, the badge of the sovereignty of physical man over all other physical organisms, is often put to shame by the instinct of an animal. As his brain is more perfect than that of any other creature, its emanations must naturally produce the highest results of mental action, but reason avails only for the consideration of material things, it is incapable of helping its possessor to a knowledge of spirit. In losing instinct, man loses his intuitional powers, which are the crown and ultimatum of instinct. Reason is the clumsy weapon of the scientist's intuition the unerring guide of the seer. Instinct teaches plant and animal their seasons for the procreation of their species, and guides the dumb brute to find his appropriate remedy in the hour of sickness. Reason the pride of man fails to check the propensities of his matter, and brooks no restraint upon the unlimited gratification of his senses. Far from leading him to be his own physician, its subtle sophistries lead him too often to his own destruction. Nothing is more demonstrable than the proposition that the perfection of matter is reached at the expense of instinct. The zoophyte attached to the submarine rock, opening its mouth to attract the food that floats by, shows, proportionally with its physical structure, more instinct than the whale. The ant, with its wonderful architectural, social, and political. p. 434. Abilities, is inexpressibly higher in the scale than the subtle royal tiger watching its prey. With awe and wonder, exclaims Dubois Raymond, must the student of nature regard that microscopic molecule of nervous substance which is the seat of the laborious, constructive, orderly, loyal, dauntless soul of the ant. Like everything else which has its origin in psychological mysteries, instinct has been too long neglected in the domain of science. We see what indicated the way to man to find relief for all his physical ailings, says Hippocrates. It is the instinct of the earlier races, when cold reason had not as yet obscured man's inner vision. Its indication must never be disdained, for it is to instinct alone that we owe our first remedies. Instantaneous and unerring cognition of an omniscient mind, instinct is in everything unlike the finite reason, and in the tentative progress of the latter, the godlike nature of man is often utterly engulfed, whenever he shuts out from himself the divine light of intuition. The one crawls, the other flies, reason is the power of the man, intuition the prescience of the woman. Plotinus, the pupil of the great Ammonius Saccas, the chief founder of the Neoplatonic school, taught that human knowledge had three ascending steps, opinion, science, and illumination. He explained it by saying that the means or instrument of opinion is sense, or perception, of science, dialectics, of illumination, intuition, or divine instinct. To the last, reason is subordinate, it is absolute knowledge founded on the identification of the mind with the object known. Prayer opens the spiritual sight of man, for prayer is desire, and desire develops will. The magnetic emanations proceeding from the body at every effort whether mental or physical produce self-magnetization and ecstasy. Plotinus recommended solitude for prayer, as the most efficient means of obtaining what is asked, and Plato advised those who prayed to remain silent in the presence of the Divine Ones, till they remove the cloud from thy eyes, and enable thee to see by the light which issues from themselves. Apollonius always isolated himself from men during the conversation he held with God, and whenever he felt the necessity for divine contemplation and prayer, he wrapped himself, head and all, in the drapery of his white woolen mantle. When thou prayest enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy father in secret, says the Nazarene, the pupil of the Essenes. Every human being is born with the rudiment of the inner sense called intuition, which may be developed into what the Scotch know. P. 435. As second sight, all the great philosophers, who, like Plotinus, Porphyry, and Iamblichus employed this faculty, taught the doctrine. There is a faculty of the human mind, writes Iamblichus, which is superior to all which is born or begotten. Through it we are enabled to attain union with the superior intelligences, 
to being transported beyond the scenes of this world, and to partaking the higher life and peculiar powers of the heavenly ones. Were there no inner sight or intuition, the Jews would never have had their Bible, nor the Christians Jesus. What both Moses and Jesus gave to the world was the fruit of their intuition or illumination. What their subsequent elders and teachers allowed the world to understand was dogmatic misrepresentations, too often blasphemy. To accept the Bible as a revelation and nail belief to a literal translation, is worse than absurdity it is a blasphemy against the divine majesty of the unseen. If we had to judge of the deity, and the world of spirits, by its human interpreters, now that philology proceeds with giant strides on the fields of comparative religions, belief in God and the soul's immortality could not withstand the attacks of reason for one century more. That which supports the faith of man and God in the spiritual life to come is intuition, that divine outcome of our inner self, which defies the mummeries of the Roman Catholic priest, and his ridiculous idols, the thousand and one ceremonies of the Braham and his idols, and the Jeremiads of the Protestant preacher, and his desolate and arid creed, with no idols, but a boundless hell and damnation hooked on at the end. Were it not for this intuition, undying though often wavering because so clogged with matter, human life would be a parody and humanity a fraud. This ineradicable feeling of the presence of someone outside and inside ourselves is one that no dogmatic contradictions, nor external form of worship can destroy in humanity, let scientists and clergy do what they may. Moved by such thoughts of the boundlessness and impersonality of the deity, Gautama Buddha, the Hindu Christ, exclaimed, as the four rivers which fall in the Ganges lose their names as soon as they mingle their waters with the holy river, so all who believe in Buddha cease to be Brahmins, Kshatriyas, Vaisyas, and Sudras. The Old Testament was compiled and arranged from oral tradition, the masses never knew its real meaning, for Moses was ordered to impart the hidden truths but to his seventy elders on whom the Lord put of the spirit which was upon the legislator. Maimonides, whose authority and whose knowledge of the sacred history can hardly be rejected, says, whoever shall find out the true sense of the book of Genesis ought to take care not to divulge it. If a person should discover the p. 436. True meaning of it by himself, or by the aid of another, then he ought to be silent, or, if he speaks of it, he ought to speak of it but obscurely and in an enigmatical manner. This confession, that what is written in the Holy Writ is but an allegory, was made by other Jewish authorities besides Maimonides, for we find Josephus stating that Moses philosophized, spoke riddles and figurative allegory, when writing the book of Genesis. Therefore modern science, by neglecting to unriddle the true sense of the Bible, and by allowing the whole of Christendom to go on believing in the dead letter of the Jewish theology, tacitly constitutes herself the confederate of the fanatical clergy. She has no right to ridicule the records of a people who never wrote them with the idea that they would receive such a strange interpretation at the hands of an inimical religion. That their holiest text should be turned against them and that the dead men's bones could have smothered the spirit of truth, is the saddest feature of Christianity. The gods exist, says Epicurus, but they are not what the rabble, suppose them to be. And yet Epicurus, judged as usual by superficial critics, is set down and paraded as a materialist. But neither the great first cause nor its emanation human, immortal spirit have left themselves without a witness. Mesmerism and modern spiritualism are there to attest the great truths. For over fifteen centuries, thanks to the blindly brutal persecutions of those great vandals of early Christian history, Constantine and Justinian, ancient wisdom slowly degenerated until it gradually sank into the deepest mire of monkish superstition and ignorance. The Pythagorean knowledge of things that are, the profound erudition of the Gnostics, the world and time-honored teachings of the great philosophers, all were rejected as doctrines of antichrist and paganism, and committed to the flames. With the last seven wise men of the Orient, the remnant group of the Neoplatonists, Hermias, Priscianus, Diogenes, Eulalius, Damascius, Simplicius, and Isidorus, who fled from the fanatical persecutions of Justinian, to Persia, the reign of wisdom closed. The books of Thoth, or Hermes Trismegistus, which contain within their sacred pages the spiritual and physical history of the creation and progress of our world, were left to mold in oblivion and contempt for ages. They found no interpreters in Christian Europe, the Philolethians, or wise lovers of the truth, were no more, they were replaced by the light fleers, the tonsured and hooded monks of papal Rome, who dread truth, in whatever shape and from whatever quarter it appears, if it but clashes in the least with their dogmas. As the skeptics this is what Professor Alexander Wilder remarks of. P. 437. 
them and their followers, and his sketches on Neoplatonism and alchemy. A century has passed since the compilers of the French Encyclopedia infused skepticism into the blood of the civilized world, and made it disreputable to believe in the actual existence of anything that cannot be tested in crucibles or demonstrated by critical reasoning. Even now, it requires candor as well as courage to venture to treat upon a subject which has been for many years discarded and contemned, because it has not been well or correctly understood. The person must be bold who accounts the hermetic philosophy to be other than a pretense of science, and so believing, demands for its enunciation a patient hearing. Yet its professors were once the princes of learned investigation, and heroes among common men. Besides, nothing is to be despised which men have reverently believed, and disdain for the earnest convictions of others is itself the token of ignorance, and of an ungenerous mind. And now, encouraged by these words from a scholar who is neither a fanatic nor a conservative, we will recall a few things reported by travelers as having been seen by them in Tibet and India, and which are treasured by the natives as practical proofs of the truth of the philosophy and science handed down by their forefathers. First we may consider that most remarkable phenomenon is seen in the temples of Tibet and the accounts of which have reached Europe from eyewitnesses other than Catholic missionaries whose testimony we will exclude for obvious reasons. Early in the present century a Florentine scientist, a skeptic and a correspondent of the French Institute, having been permitted to penetrate in disguise to the hallowed precincts of a Buddhist temple, where the most solemn of all ceremonies was taking place, relates the following as having been seen by himself. An altar is ready in the temple to receive the resuscitated Buddha, found by the initiated priesthood, and recognized by certain secret signs to have reincarnated himself in a newborn infant. The baby, but a few days old, is brought into the presence of the people and reverentially placed upon the altar. Suddenly rising into a sitting posture, the child begins to utter in a loud, manly voice, the following sentences, I am Buddha, I am his spirit, and I, Buddha, your Dalai Lama, have left my old, decrepit body, out the temple of, and selected the body of this young babe as my next earthly dwelling. Our scientist, being finally permitted by the priests to take, with due reverence, the baby in his arms, and carry it away to such a distance from them as to satisfy him that no ventriloquial deception is being practiced, the infant looks at the grave academician with eyes that make his flesh creep, as he expresses it, and repeats the words he had previously uttered. A detailed account of this adventure, attested with the signature of this eyewitness, was forwarded to Paris. p. 438. But the members of the Institute, instead of accepting the testimony of a scientific observer of acknowledged credibility, concluded that the Florentine was either suffering under an attack of sunstroke, or had been deceived by a clever trick of acoustics. Although, according to Mr. Stanislaus Julian, the French translator of the sacred Chinese texts, there is a verse in the Lotus which says that a Buddha is as difficult to be found as the flowers of Udambara and Kalika. If we are to believe several eyewitnesses, such a phenomenon does happen. Of course its occurrence is rare, for it happens but on the death of every great Dalai Lama, and these venerable old gentlemen live proverbially long lives. The poor Abbe Huck, whose works of travel in Tibet and China are so well known, relates the same fact of the resuscitation of Buddha. He adds, Furthermore, the curious circumstance that the baby oracle makes good his claim to being an old mind in a young body by giving to those who ask him, and who knew him in his past life, the most exact details of his interior earthly existence. It is worthy of notice, that De Musso's, who expatiates at length on the phenomenon, attributing it as a matter of course to the devil, gravely remarks of the abbe himself, that the fact that he had been unfrocked, the frock, is an accident which I, he, Confess scarcely tends to strengthen our confidence. In our humble opinion this little circumstance strengthens it all the more. The Abbe Huck had his work placed on the index for the truth he told about the similarity of the Buddhistical rites with the Roman Catholic ones. He was moreover suspended in his missionary work for being too sincere. If this example of infant prodigy stood alone, we might reasonably indulge in some hesitation as to accepting it, but, to say nothing of the Camisar prophets of 1707, among whom was the boy of fifteen months described by Jacques Dubois, who spoke in good French as though God were speaking through his mouth, and of the Savan babies, whose speaking and prophesying were witnessed by the first savants of France we have instances in modern times of quite as remarkable a character. Lloyd's Weekly Newspaper, for March, 1875, contained an account of the following phenomenon, at Zarlouis, France, a child was born. The mother had just been confined. The midwife was holding forth garrulously on the blessed little creature, 
and the friends were congratulating the father on his luck, when somebody asked what time it was. Judge of the surprise of all, on hearing the newborn babe reply. P. 439. Distinctly two o'clock. But this was nothing to what followed. The company were looking on the infant, with speechless wonder and dismay, when it opened its eyes, and said, I have been sent into the world to tell you that 1875 will be a good year, but that 1876 will be a year of blood. Having uttered this prophecy it turned on its side and expired, aged half an hour. We are not aware that this prodigy has received official authentication by the civil authority of course we should look for none from the clergy, since no profit or honor was to be derived from it but even if a respectable British commercial journal was not responsible for the story, the result has given it special interest. The year 1876, just passed, we write in February, 1877, was emphatically, and, from the standpoint of March, 1875, unexpectedly a year of blood. In the Danubian principalities was written one of the bloodiest chapters of the history of war and rapine chapter of outrages of Muslim upon Christian that has scarcely been paralleled since Catholic soldiers butchered the simple natives of North and South America by tens of thousands and Protestant Englishmen waded to the imperial throne of Delhi, step by step, through rivers of blood. If the Zarlu's prophecy was but a mere newspaper sensation, still the turn of events elevated it into the rank of a fulfilled prediction, 1875 was a year of great plenty, and 1876, to the surprise of everybody, a year of carnage. But even if it should be found that the baby prophet never opened its lips, the instance of the Jenkin infant still remains to puzzle the investigator, this is one of the most surprising cases of mediumship. The child's mother is the famous Kate Fox, its father H.D. Jenkin, M.R.I., barrister at law, in London. He was born in London, in 1873, and before he was three months old showed evidences of spirit mediumship. Wrappings occurred on his pillow and cradle, and also on his father's person, when he held the child in his lap and Mrs. Jenkin was absent from home. Two months later, a communication of twenty words exclusive of signature, was written through his hand. A gentleman, a Liverpool solicitor, named J. Wasson, was present at the time, and united with the mother and nurse in a certificate which was published in the London Medium in daybreak of May 8, 1874. The professional and scientific rank of Mr. Jenkin make it in the highest degree improbable that he would lend himself to a deception. Moreover, the child was within such easy reach of the royal institution, of which his father is a member, that Professor Tyndall and his associates had no excuse for neglecting to examine and inform the world about this psychological phenomenon. The sacred baby of Tibet being so far away, they find their most convenient plan to be a flat denial, with hints of sunstroke and acoustical. P. 440. Machinery. As for the London baby, the affair is still easier. Let them wait until the child has grown up and learned to write, and then deny the story point blank. In addition to other travelers, the Abbe Huck gives us an account of that wonderful tree of Tibet called the Kaumbum, that is to say, the tree of the ten thousand images and characters. It will grow in no other latitude, although the experiment has sometimes been tried, and it cannot even be multiplied from cuttings. The tradition is that it sprang from the hair of one of the avatars, the Lama Sun Kapa, one of the incarnations of Buddha. But we will let the Abbe Huck tell the rest of the story, each of its leaves, in opening, bears either a letter or a religious sentence, written in sacred characters, and these letters are, of their kind, of such a perfection that the type foundries of Dido contain nothing to excel them. Open the leaves, which vegetation is about to unroll, and you will there discover, on the point of appearing, the letters or the distinct words which are the marvel of this unique tree. Turn your attention from the leaves of the plant to the bark of its branches, and new characters will meet your eyes. Do not allow your interest to flag. Raise the layers of this bark, and still other characters will show themselves below those whose beauty had surprised you. 4. Do not fancy that these superposed layers repeat the same printing. No, quite the contrary, for each lamina you lift presents to view its distinct type. How, then, can we suspect jugglery? I have done my best in that direction to discover the slightest trace of human trick, and my baffled mind could not retain the slightest suspicion. We will add to M. Huck's narrative the statement that the characters which appear upon the different portions of the Kaumbum are in the Sansar, or language of the sun, characters, ancient Sanskrit, and that the sacred tree, in its various parts, contains an extensive of the whole history of the creation, and in substance the sacred books of Buddhism. In this respect, 
It bears the same relation to Buddhism as the pictures in the Temple of Dendera, in Egypt, due to the ancient faith of the pharaohs. The latter are briefly described by Professor W. B. Carpenter, president of the British Association, in his Manchester lecture on Egypt. He makes it clear that the Jewish book of Genesis is nothing more than an expression of the early Jewish ideas, based upon the pictorial records of the Egyptians among whom they lived. But he does not make it clear, except inferentially, whether he believes either the Dendera pictures or the Mosaic account to be an allegory or a pretended historical narrative. How a scientist who had devoted himself to the most superficial investigation of the subject can venture to assert that the ancient Egyptians had the same ridiculous notions about the world's instantaneous creation. p. 441. As the early Christian theologians, passes comprehension. How can he say that because the Dendera picture happens to represent their cosmogony in one allegory, they intended to show the scene as occurring in six minutes or six millions of years? It may as well indicate allegorically six successive epics or eons, or eternity, as six days. Besides, the books of Hermes certainly give no color to the charge, and the Avesta specifically names six periods, each embracing thousands of years, instead of days. Many of the Egyptian hieroglyphics contradict Dr. Carpenter's theory, and Champollion has avenged the ancients in many particulars. From what has gone before, it will, we think, be made clear to the reader that the Egyptian philosophy had no room for any such crude speculations. If the Hebrews themselves ever believed them, their cosmogony viewed man as the result of evolution, and his progress to be marked by immensely lengthened cycles. But to return to the wonders of Tibet. Speaking of pictures, the one described by Huck as hanging in a certain lamasery may fairly be regarded as one of the most wonderful in existence. It is a simple canvas without the slightest mechanical apparatus attached, as the visitor may prove by examining it at his leisure. It represents a moonlit landscape, but the moon is not at all motionless and dead, quite the reverse, for, according to the abbe, one would say that our moon herself, or at least her living double, lighted the picture. Each phase, each aspect, each movement of our satellite, is repeated in our facsimile, in the movement and progress of the moon in the sacred picture. You see this planet in the painting right as a crescent, or full, shine brightly, pass behind the clouds, peep out or set, in a manner corresponding in the most extraordinary way with the real luminary. It is, in a word, a most servile and resplendent reproduction of the pale queen of the night, which received the adoration of so many people in the days of old. When we think of the astonishment that would inevitably be felt by one of our self-complacent academicians at seeing such a picture and it is by no means the only one, for they have them in other parts of Tibet and Japan also, which represent the sun's movements when we think, we say, of his embarrassment at knowing that if he ventured to tell the unvarnished truth to his colleagues, his fate would probably be like that of poor Huck, and he flung out of the academical chair as a liar or a lunatic, we cannot help recalling the anecdote of Tycho Brahe, given by Humboldt in his cosmos. One evening, says the great Danish astronomer, as, according, p. 442. To my usual habit, I was considering the celestial vault, to my indescribable amazement, I saw, close to the zenith, in Cassiopeia, a radiant star of extraordinary size. Struck with astonishment, I knew not whether I could believe my own eyes. Some time after that, I learned that in Germany, Cartman, and other persons of the lower classes had repeatedly warned the scientists that a great apparition could be seen in the sky, which fact afforded both the press and public one more opportunity to indulge in their usual raillery against the men of science, who, in the cases of several antecedent comments, had not predicted their appearance. From the days of the earliest antiquity, the Brahmins were known to be possessed of wonderful knowledge in every kind of magic arts. From Pythagoras, the first philosopher who studied wisdom with the gymnosophists, and Plotinus, who was initiated into the mystery of uniting oneself with the deity through abstract contemplation, down to the modern adepts, it was well known that in the land of the Brahmins and Gautama Buddha the sources of hidden wisdom are to be sought after. It is for future ages to discover this grand truth, and accept it as such, whereas now it is degraded as a low superstition. What did anyone, even the greatest scientists, know of India, Tibet, and China, until the last quarter of the century? That most untiring scholar, Max Muller, tells us that before the not a single original document of the Buddhist religion had been accessible to European philologists, that fifty years ago there was not a single scholar who could have translated a line of the Veda, a line of the Zen Avesta, or a line of the Buddhist Tripitaka, 
let alone other dialects or languages. And even now, that science is in possession of various sacred texts, what they have are but very incomplete editions of these works, and nothing, positively nothing of the secret sacred literature of Buddhism. And the little that our Sanskrit scholars have got hold of, and which at first was termed by Max Muller a dreary jungle of religious literature the most excellent hiding place for Lamas and Dalai Lamas, is now beginning to shed a faint light on the primitive darkness. We find the scholar stating that that which appeared at the first glance into the labyrinth of the religions of the world, all darkness, self-deceit, and vanity begin to assume another form. It sounds, he writes, like a degradation of the very name of religion, to apply it to the wild ravings of Hindi yogins, and the blank blasphemies of Chinese Buddhists. But, as we slowly and patiently wend our way through the dreary prisons, our own eyes seem to expand, and we perceive a glimmer of light, where all was darkness at first. P. 443. As an illustration of how little even the generation which directly preceded our own was competent to judge the religions and beliefs of the several hundred million Buddhists, Brahmins, and Parsis, let the student consult the advertisement of a scientific work published in 1828 by Professor Dunbar, the first scholar who has undertaken to demonstrate that the Sanskrit is derived from the Greek. It appeared under the following title, An Inquiry into the Structure and Affinity of the Greek and Latin Languages, with occasional comparisons of the Sanskrit and Gothic, with an appendix, in which the derivation of the Sanskrit from the Greek is endeavored to be established. By George Dunbar, FRSE, and Professor of Greek in the University of Edinburgh. Price, 18. Had Max Muller happened to fall from the sky at that time, among the scholars of the day, and with his present knowledge, we would like to have compiled the epithets which would have been bestowed by the learned academicians upon the daring innovator. One who, classifying languages genealogically, says that Sanskrit, as compared to Greek and Latin, is an elder sister, the earliest deposit of Aryan speech. And so, we may naturally expect that in 1976, the same criticisms will be justly applied to many a scientific discovery, now deemed conclusive and final by our scholars. That which is now termed the superstitious verbiage and gibberish of mere heathens and savages, composed many thousands of years ago, may be found to contain the master key to all religious systems. The cautious sentence of St. Augustine, a favorite name in Max Muller's lectures, which says that there is no false religion which does not contain some elements of truth, may yet be triumphantly proved correct, the more so as, far from being original with the Bishop of Hippo, it was borrowed by him from the works of Ammonius Saccas, the great Alexandrian teacher. This God-taught philosopher, the Theodidactos, had repeated these same words to exhaustion, in his numerous works some 140 years before Augustine. Acknowledging Jesus as an excellent man, and the friend of God, he always maintained that his design was not to abolish the intercourse with gods and demons spirits, but simply to purify the ancient religions, that the religion of the multitude went hand in hand with philosophy, and with her had shared the fate of being by degrees corrupted and obscured with mere human conceits, superstition, and lies, that it ought therefore to be brought back to its original purity by purging it of this dross and expounding it upon philosophical principles, and p. 444 that the whole which Christ had in view was to reinstate and restore to its primitive integrity the wisdom of the ancients. It was Ammonius who first taught that every religion was based on one and the same truth, which is the wisdom found in the books of Thoth, Hermes Trismegistus, from which books Pythagoras and Plato had learned all their philosophy. And the doctrines of the former he affirmed to have been identical with the earliest teachings of the Brahmins now embodied in the oldest Vedas. The name Thoth, says Professor Wilder, means a college or assembly, and it is not improbable that the books were so named as being the collected oracles and doctrines of the sacerdotal fraternity of Memphis. Rabbi Wise had suggested a similar hypothesis in relation to the divine utterances recorded in the Hebrew scripture. But the Indian writers assert that during the reign of King Kansa, Yadis, Judeans, or sacred tribe left India and migrated to the west, carrying the four Vedas with them. There was certainly a great resemblance between the philosophical doctrines and religious customs of the Egyptians and Eastern Buddhists, but whether the Hermetic books and the four Vedas were identical, is not now known. But one thing is certainly known, and that is, that before the word philosopher was first pronounced by Pythagoras at the court of the king of the Philasians, the secret doctrine or wisdom was identical in every country. Therefore it is in the oldest texts those least polluted by subsequent forgeries that we have to look for the truth. 
And now that philology has possessed itself of Sanskrit texts which may be boldly affirmed to be documents by far antedating the Mosaic Bible, it is the duty of the scholars to present the world with truth, and nothing but the truth. Without regard to either skeptical or theological prejudice, they are bound to impartially examine both documents the oldest Vedas and the Old Testament, and then decide which of the two is the original Sruti or Revelation, and which but the Smriti, which, as Max Muller shows, only means recollection or tradition. Origen writes that the Brahmins were always famous for the wonderful cures which they performed by certain words, and in our own age we find O'Reilly, a learned corresponding member of the French Institute, corroborating the statement of Origen in the 3rd century, and that of Leonard de Vere of the 16th, in which the latter wrote, There are also persons, who upon pronouncing a certain sentence a charm, walk barefooted on red, burning coals, and on the points of sharp knives stuck. p. 445. In the ground, and, once poised on them, on one toe, they will lift up in the air a heavy man or, or any other burden of considerable weight. They will tame wild horses likewise, and the most furious bulls, with a single word. This word is to be found in the mantras of the Sanskrit Vedas, say some adepts. It is for the philologists to decide for themselves whether there is such a word in the Vedas. So far as human evidence goes, it would seem that such magic words do exist. It appears that the reverend fathers of the order of Jesuits have picked up many such tricks in their missionary travels. Baldinger gives them full credit for it. The champing a Hindu word, from which the modern word shampooing is derived is a well-known magical manipulation in the East Indies. The native sorcerers use it with success to the present day, and it is from them that the father Jesuits derive their wisdom. Camerarius, in his hoary subscesivi, narrates that once upon a time there existed a great rivalry of miracles between the Austin Friars and the Jesuits. A disputation having taken place between the Father General of the Austin Friars, who was very learned, and the General of the Jesuits, who was very unlearned, but full of magical knowledge, the latter proposed to settle the question by trying their subordinates, and finding out which of them would be the readiest to obey his superiors. Thereupon, turning to one of his Jesuits, he said, Brother Mark, our companions are cold, I command you, in virtue of the holy obedience you have sworn to me, to bring here instantly out of the kitchen fire, and in your hands, some burning coals, that they may warm themselves over your hands. Father Mark instantly obeyed, and brought in both his hands a supply of red, burning coals, and held them till the company present had all warmed themselves, after which he took them back to the kitchen hearth. The general of the Austin Friars found himself crestfallen, for none of his subordinates would obey him so far as that. The triumph of the Jesuits was thus accomplished. If the above is looked upon as an anecdote unworthy of credence, we will inquire of the reader what we must think of some modern mediums, who perform the same while entranced. The testimony of several highly respectable and trustworthy witnesses, such as Lord Adair and Mr. S. C. Hall, is unimpeachable. Spirits, the spiritualists will argue. Perhaps so, in the case of American and English fireproof mediums, but not so in Tibet and India. In the West a sensitive has to be entranced before being rendered invulnerable by the presiding guides, and we defy any medium, in his or her normal physical state. p. 446. To bury the arms to the elbows in glowing coals. But in the East, whether the performer be a holy lama or a mercenary sorcerer, the latter class being generally termed jugglers, he needs no preparation or abnormal state to be able to handle fire, red-hot pieces of iron, or melted lead. We have seen in southern India these jugglers keep their hands in a furnace of burning coals until the latter were reduced to cinders. During the religious ceremony of Shiva Raitri, or the vigil night of Shiva, when the people spend whole nights in watching and praying, some of the Shivites called in a Tamil juggler, who produced the most wonderful phenomena by simply summoning to his help a spirit whom they call Kuti Sat and the little demon. But, Far from allowing people to think he was guided or controlled by this gnome for it was a gnome, if it was anything the man, while crouching over his fiery pit, proudly rebuked the Catholic missionary, who took his opportunity to inform the bystanders that the miserable sinner had sold himself to Satan. Without removing his hands and arms from the burning coals within which he was coolly refreshing them, the Tamil only turned his head and gave one arrogant look at the flushed missionary. My father and my father's father, he said, had this little one at their command. For two centuries the Cuddy is a faithful servant in our home, and now, sir, you would make people believe that he is my master. But they know better. After this, he quietly withdrew his hands from the fire, 
and proceeded with other performances. As for the wonderful powers of prediction and clairvoyance possessed by certain Brahmins, they are well known to every European resident of India. If these upon their return to civilized countries, laugh at such stories, and sometimes even deny them outright, they only impugn their good faith, not the fact. These Brahmins live principally in sacred villages, in secluded places, principally on the western coast of India. They avoid populated cities, and especially Europeans, and it is but rarely that the latter can succeed in making themselves intimate with the seers. It is generally thought that the circumstance is due to their religious observance of the caste, but we are firmly convinced that in many cases this is not so. Years, perhaps centuries, will roll away before the real reason is ascertained. As to the lower caste, some of which are termed by the missionaries devil worshippers, notwithstanding the pious efforts on the part of the Catholic missionaries to spread in Europe heart-rending reports of the misery of these people sold to the archenemy, and like efforts, perhaps only a trifle less ridiculous and absurd, of Protestant missionaries, the word devil, in the sense understood by Christians, is a non-entity for them. They believe in good and bad spirits, but they neither worship nor dread the devil. Their worship is simply a ceremonial precaution. p. 447. Against terrestrial and human spirits, whom they dread far more than the millions of elementals of various forms. They use all kinds of music, and scents, and perfumes, in their efforts to drive away the bad spirits, the elementary. In this case, they are no more to be ridiculed than the well-known scientist, the firm spiritualist, who suggested the keeping of vitriol and powdered nitre in the room to keep away unpleasant spirits, and no more than heat, are they wrong in so doing, for the experience of their ancestors, extending over many thousands of years has taught them how to proceed against this vile spiritual horde. That they are human spirits is shown by the fact that very often they try to humor and propitiate the larvae of their own daughters and relatives, when they have reason to suspect that the latter did not die in the odor of sanctity and chastity. Such spirits they name Kani, bad virgins. The case was noticed by several missionaries, Reverend E. Lewis, among others. But these pious gentlemen usually insist upon it that they worship devils, whereas, they do nothing of the sort, for they merely try to remain on good terms with them in order to be left unmolested. They offer them cakes and fruit, and various kinds of food which they like while alive, for many of them have experienced the wickedness of these returning dead ones, whose persecutions are sometimes dreadful. On this principle likewise they act toward the spirits of all wicked men. They leave on their tombs, if they were buried, or near the place where their remains were burnt, food and liquors, with the object of keeping them near these places, and with the idea that these vampires will be prevented thereby from returning to their homes. This is no worship, it is rather a spiritualism of a practical sort. Until 1861, there prevailed a custom among the Hindus of mutilating the feet of executed murderers, under the firm belief that thereby the disembodied soul would be prevented from wandering and doing more mischief. Subsequently, they were prohibited, by the police, from continuing the practice. Another good reason why the Hindus should not worship the devil is that they have no word to convey such a meaning. They call these spirits putam, which answers rather to our spook, or malicious imp, another expression they use is pay in the Sanskrit pasasu, both meaning ghosts or returning ones perhaps goblins, in some cases. The putam are the most terrible, for they are literally haunting spooks, who return on earth to torment the living. They are believed to visit generally the places where their bodies were burnt. The fire or Shiva spirits are identical with the Rosicrucian gnomes and salamanders, for they are pictured as dwarfs of a fiery appearance, living in p. 448. Earth and Fire The Selenese demon called Dewal is a stout smiling female figure with a white Elizabethan frill around the neck and a red jacket. As Dr. Warden justly observes, there is no character more strictly oriental than the dragons of romance and fiction. They are intermixed with every tradition of early date and of themselves confer a species of illustrative evidence of origin. In no writings are these characters more marked than in the details of Buddhism, these record particulars of the Nagas, or kingly snakes, inhabiting the cavities under the earth, corresponding with the abodes of Tiresias and the Greek seers, a region of mystery and darkness, wherein revolves much of the system of divination and oracular response, connected with inflation, or a sort of possession designating the spirit of Python himself, the dragon serpent slain by Apollo. But the Buddhists no more believe in the devil of the Christian system that is, an entity as distinct from humanity as the deity itself and the Hindus. 
Buddhists teach that there are inferior gods who have been men either on this or another planet, but still who were men. They believe in the Nagas, who have been sorcerers on earth, bad people, and who give the power to other bad and yet living men to blight all the fruit they look upon, and even human lives. When a Singhalese has the reputation that if he looks on a tree or on a person both will wither and die, he is said to have the Nagaraja, or King Serpent on him. The whole endless catalogue of bad spirits are not devils in the sense the Christian clergy wants us to understand, but merely spiritually incarnated sins, crimes, and human thoughts, if we may so express it. The blue, green, yellow, and purple god demons, like the inferior gods of Jugandir, are more of the kind of presiding genii, and many are as good and beneficent as the Nat deities themselves, although the Nats reckon in their numbers, giants, evil genii, and the like which inhabit the desert of Mount Jugandir. The true doctrine of Buddha says that the demons, when nature produced the sun, moon, and stars, were human beings, but, on account of their sins, they fell from the state of felicity. If they commit greater sins, they suffer greater punishments, and condemned men are reckoned by them among the devils, while, on the contrary, demons who die, elemental spirits, and are born or incarnated as men, and commit no more sin can arrive at the state of celestial felicity. Which is a demonstration, remarks Edward Upham, in his History and Doctrine of Buddhism, that all beings, divine as well as human, are subject to the laws of transmigration, which are operative on all, according to a scale of moral deeds. This faith then, is a complete test of a code of moral enactments and motives, applied to the regulation and government of man. p. 449. An experiment, he adds, which renders the study of Buddhism an important and curious subject for the philosopher. The Hindus believe, as firmly as the Servians or Hungarians, in vampires. Furthermore, their doctrine is that of Pierrot, the famous French spiritist and mesmerizer, whose school flourished some dozen years ago. The fact of a specter returning to suck human blood, says this doctor, is not so inexplicable as it seems, and here we appeal to the spiritualists who admit the phenomenon of bicorporeity or soul duplication. The hands which we have pressed, these materialized limbs, so palpable, prove clearly how much is possible for astral specters under favorable conditions. The honorable physician expresses the theory of the Kabbalists. The Shadim are the lowest of the spiritual orders. Maimonides, who tells us that his countrymen were obliged to maintain an intimate intercourse with their departed ones, describes the feast of blood they held on such occasions. They dug a hole, and fresh blood was poured in over which was placed a table, after which the spirits came and answered all their questions. Pierre Art, whose doctrine was founded on that of the theurgist, exhibits a warm indignation against the superstition of the clergy which requires, whenever a corpse is suspected of vampirism, that a stake should be driven through the heart. So long as the astral form is not entirely liberated from the body there is a liability that it may be forced by magnetic attraction to re-enter it. Sometimes it will be only halfway out, when the corpse which presents the appearance of death, is buried. In such cases the terrified astral soul violently re-enters its casket, and then, one of two things happens either the unhappy victim will writhe in the agonizing torture of suffocation, or, if he had been grossly material, he becomes a vampire. The bicorporeal life begins, and these unfortunate buried cataleptics sustain their miserable lives by having their astral bodies rob the lifeblood from living persons. The ethereal form can go wherever it pleases, and so long as it does not break the link which attaches it to the body, it is at liberty to wander about, either visible or invisible, and feed on human victims. According to all appearance, this spirit then transmits through a mysterious and invisible cord of connection, which perhaps, some day may be explained, the results of the suction to the material body which lies inert at the bottom of the tomb, aiding it, in a manner, to perpetuate the state of catalepsy. p. 450 Rier de Boisman gives a number of such cases, fully authenticated, which he is pleased to term hallucinations. A recent inquest, says a French paper, has established that in 1871 two corpses were submitted to the infamous treatment of popular superstition, at the instigation of the clergy, or blind prejudice. But Dr. Pierre Art, quoted by De Musso's, who stoutly adheres to vampirism, exclaims, Blind, you say? Yes, blind as much as you like. But whence sprang these prejudices? Why are they perpetuated in all ages, and in so many countries? After a crowd of facts of vampirism so often proved, 
Should we say that there are no more and that they never had a foundation? Nothing comes of nothing. Every belief, every custom springs from facts and causes which gave it birth. If one had never seen appear, in the bosom of families of certain countries, beings clothing themselves in the shape of the familiar dead, coming thus to suck the blood of one or of several persons, and if the death of the victims by emaciation had not followed, they would never have gone to disinter the corpses in cemeteries, we would never have had attested the incredible fact of persons buried for several years being found with the corpse soft, flexible, the eyes open, with rosy complexions, the mouth and nose full of blood, and of the blood running in torrents under blows, from wounds, and when decapitated. One of the most important examples of vampirism figures in the private letters of the philosopher, the Marquis Sturgeon, and, in the Revue Britannique, for March, 1837, the English traveler Pashley describes some that came under his notice in the island of Candia. Dr. Jabar, the anti-Catholic and anti-spiritual Belgian savant, testifies to similar experiences. I will not examine, wrote the Bishop de Ron Hewitt, whether the facts of vampirism, which are constantly being reported, are true, or the fruit of a popular error, but it is certain that they are testified to by so many authors, able and trustworthy, and by so many eyewitnesses, that no one ought to decide upon the question without a good deal of caution. The Chevalier, who went to great pains to collect materials for his demonological theory, brings the most thrilling instances to prove that all such cases are produced by the devil, who uses graveyard corpses with which to clothe himself, and roams at night sucking people's blood. Methinks we could do very well without bringing this dusky personage upon the scene. If we are to believe at all in the return of spirits, there are plenty of wicked sensualists, misers, and sinners of other death. p. 451. Scriptions especially suicides, who could have rivaled the devil himself and malice in his best days. It is quite enough to be actually forced to believe in what we do see, and know to be a fact, namely spirits, without adding to our pantheon of ghosts the devil whom nobody ever saw. Still, there are interesting particulars to be gathered in relation to vampirism, since belief in this phenomenon has existed in all countries, from the remotest ages. The Slavonian nations, the Greeks, the Wallachians, and the Servians will rather doubt the existence of their enemies, the Turks, than the fact that there are vampires. The Brukolak, or Vaurdalak, as the latter are called, are but two familiar guests at the Slavonian fireside. Writers of the greatest ability, men as full of sagacity as of high integrity, have treated of the subject and believed in it. Whence, then, such a superstition? Whence that unanimous credence throughout the ages, and whence that identity in details and similarity of description as to that one particular phenomenon which we find in the testimony generally sworn evidence of peoples foreign to each other and differing widely in matters concerning other superstitions? There are, says Dom Coleman, a skeptical Benedictine monk of the last century, two different ways to destroy the belief in these pretended ghosts. The first would be to explain the prodigies of vampirism by physical causes. The second way is to deny totally the truth of all such stories, and the latter plan would be undoubtedly the most certain, as the most wise. The first way that of explaining it by physical, though occult causes, is the one adopted by the Pierre Art School of Mesmerism. It is certainly not the spiritualists who have a right to doubt the plausibility of this explanation. The second plan is that adopted by scientists and skeptics. They deny point blank. As De Musso's remarks, there is no better or surer way, and none exacts less of either philosophy or science. The specter of a village herdsman, near Kodum, in Bavaria, began appearing to several inhabitants of the place, and either in consequence of their fright or some other cause every one of them died during the following week. Driven to despair, the peasants disinterred the corpse, and pinned it to the ground with a long stake. The same night he appeared again, plunging people into convulsions of fright, and suffocating several of them. Then the village authorities delivered the body into the hands of the executioner, who carried it to a neighboring field and burned it. The corpse, says De Musos, quoting Dom Calmet, howled like a madman, kicking and tearing as if he had been alive. When he was, p. 452. Run through again with sharp pointed stakes, he uttered piercing cries, and vomited masses of crimson blood. The apparitions of this specter ceased only after the corpse had been reduced to ashes. Officers of justice visited the places said to be so haunted, the bodies were exhumed, and in nearly every case it was observed that the corpse suspected of vampirism looked healthy and rosy, and the flesh was in no way decaying.
The objects which had belonged to these ghosts were observed moving about the house without anyone touching them. But the legal authorities generally refused to resort to cremation and beheading before they had observed the strictest rules of legal procedure. Witnesses were summoned to appear, and evidence was heard and carefully weighed. After that the exhumed corpses were examined, and if they exhibited the unequivocal and characteristic signs of vampirism, they were handed over to the executioner. But, argues Dom Comet, the principal difficulty consists in learning how these vampires can quit their tombs, and how they re-enter them, without appearing to have disturbed the earth in the least, how is it that they are seen with their usual clothing, how can they go about, and walk, and eat? If this is all imagination on the part of those who believe themselves molested by such vampires, how happens it that the accused ghosts are subsequently found in their graves, exhibiting no signs of decay, full of blood, supple and fresh? How explain the cause of their feet found muddy and covered with dirt on the day following the night they had appeared and frightened their neighbors, while nothing of the sort was ever found on other corpses buried in the same cemetery? How is it again that once burned they never reappear? and that these cases should happen so often in this country that it is found impossible to cure people from this prejudice. For, instead of being destroyed, daily experience only fortifies the superstition in the people, and increases belief in it. There is a phenomenon in nature unknown, and therefore rejected by physiology and psychology in our age of unbelief. This phenomenon is a state of half-death. Virtually, the body is dead, and, in cases of persons in whom matter does not predominate over spirit and wickedness not so great as to destroy spirituality, if left alone, their astral soul will disengage itself by gradual efforts, and, when the last link is broken, p. 453. It finds itself separated forever from its earthly body. Equal magnetic polarity will violently repulse the ethereal man from the decaying organic mass. The whole difficulty lies in that one. The ultimate moment of separation between the two is believed to be that when the body is declared dead by science, and two, a prevailing unbelief in the existence of either soul or spirit in man, by the same science. Pierre R. tries to demonstrate that in every case it is dangerous to bury people too soon, even though the body may show undoubted signs of putrefaction. Poor dead cataleptics, says the doctor, buried as if quite dead, in cold and dry spots where morbid causes are incapable to affect the destruction of their bodies, there, astral, spirit enveloping itself with a fluidic body, ethereal, is prompted to quit the precincts of its tomb, and to exercise on living beings acts peculiar to physical life, especially that of nutrition, the result of which, by a mysterious link between soul and body, which spiritualistic science will explain some day, is forwarded to the material body lying still in its tomb, and the latter thus help to perpetuate its vital existence. These spirits, and their ephemeral bodies, have been often seen coming out from the graveyard, they are known to have clung to their living neighbors, and have sucked their blood. Judicial inquiry has established that from this resulted an emaciation of the victimized persons, which often terminated in death. Thus, following the pious advice of Don Calment, we must either go on denying, or, if human and legal testimonies are worth anything, accept the only explanation possible. That souls departed are embodied in aerial or ethereal vehicles is most fully and plainly proved by those excellent men, Dr. C. and Dr. Moore, says Glanville, and they have largely shown that this was the doctrine of the greatest philosophers and most ancient and aged fathers. Gars, the German philosopher, says to the same effect, that God never created man as a dead corpse, but as an animal full of life. Once he had thus produced him, finding him ready to receive the immortal breath, he breathed him in the face, and thus man became a double masterpiece in his hands. It is in the center of life itself that this mysterious insufflation took place in the first man, race, and thence were united the animal soul issued from earth, and the spirit emanating from heaven. De Musos, in company with other Roman Catholic writers, exclaims, This proposition is utterly anti-Catholic. Well, and suppose. p. 454. It is, it may be archie anti-Catholic, and still be logic, and offer a solution for many a psychological puzzle. The sun of science and philosophy shines for everyone, and if Catholics, who hardly number one-seventh part of the population of the globe, do not feel satisfied, perhaps the many millions of people of other religions who outnumber them, will. And now, before parting with this repulsive subject of vampirism, we will give one more illustration without other voucher than the statement that it was given to us by apparently trustworthy witnesses. About the beginning of the present century, 
there occurred in Russia, one of the most frightful cases of vampirism on record. The governor of the province of TCH, was a man of about sixty years, of a malicious, tyrannical, cruel, and jealous disposition. Clothed with despotic authority, he exercised it without stint, as his brutal instincts prompted. He fell in love with the pretty daughter of a subordinate official. Although the girl was betrothed to a young man whom she loved, the tyrant forced her father to consent to his having her marry him, and the poor victim, despite her despair, became his wife. His jealous disposition exhibited itself. He beat her, confined her to her room for weeks together, and prevented her seeing anyone except in his presence. He finally fell sick and died. Finding his end approaching, he made her swear never to marry again, and with fearful oaths, threatened that, in case she did, he would return from his grave and kill her. He was buried in the cemetery across the river, and the young widow experienced no further annoyance, until, nature getting the better of her fears, she listened to the importunities of her former lover, and they were again betrothed. On the night of the customary betrothal feast, when all had retired, the old mansion was aroused by shrieks proceeding from her room. The doors were burst open, and the unhappy woman was found lying on her bed, in a swoon. At the same time a carriage was heard rumbling out of the courtyard. Her body was found to be black and blue in places, as from the effect of pinches, and from a slight puncture on her neck drops of blood were oozing. Upon recovering, she stated that her deceased husband had suddenly entered her room, appearing exactly as in life, with the exception of a dreadful pallor, that he had upbraided her for her inconstancy, and then beaten and pinched her most cruelly. Her story was disbelieved, but the next morning, the guard stationed at the other end of the bridge which spans the river, reported that, just before midnight, a black coach and six had driven furiously past them, toward the town, without answering their challenge. The new governor, who disbelieved the story of the apparition, took nevertheless the precaution of doubling the guards across the bridge. p. 455. The same thing happened, however, night after night, the soldiers declaring that the toll bar at their station near the bridge would rise of itself, and the spectral equipage sweep by them despite their efforts to stop it. At the same time every night, the coach would rumble into the courtyard of the house, the watchers, including the widow's family, and the servants, would be thrown into a heavy sleep, and every morning the young victim would be found bruised, bleeding, and swooning as before. The town was thrown into consternation. The physicians had no explanations to offer, priests came to pass the night in prayer, but as midnight approached, all would be seized with the terrible lethargy. Finally, the archbishop of the province came, and performed the ceremony of exorcism in person, but the following morning the governor's widow was found worse than ever. She was now brought to death's door. The governor was finally driven to take the severest measures to stop the ever-increasing panic in the town. He stationed fifty Cossacks along the bridge, with orders to stop the specter carriage at all hazards. Promptly at the usual hour, it was heard and seen approaching from the direction of the cemetery. The officer of the guard, and a priest bearing a crucifix, planted themselves in front of the toll bar, and together shouted, In the name of God, and the Tsar, who goes there? Out of the coach window was thrust a well-remembered head, and a familiar voice responded, The Privy Councillor of State and Governor, C. At the same moment, the officer, the priest, and the soldiers were flung aside as by an electric shock, and the ghostly equipage passed by them, before they could recover breath. The Archbishop then resolved, as a last expedient, to resort to the time-honored plan of exhuming the body, and pinning it to the earth with an oaken stake driven through its heart. This was done with great religious ceremony in the presence of the whole populace. The story is that the body was found gorged with blood, and with red cheeks and lips. At the instant that the first blow was struck upon the stake, a groan issued from the corpse, and a jet of blood spurted high into the air. The archbishop pronounced the usual exorcism, the body was reinterred, and from that time no more was heard of the vampire. How far the facts of this case may have been exaggerated by tradition, we cannot say. But we had it years ago from an eyewitness, and at the present day there are families in Russia whose elder members will recall the dreadful tale. As to the statement found in medical books that there are frequent cases of inhumation while the subjects are but in a cataleptic state, and the persistent denials of specialists that such things happen, except very rarely, we have but to turn to the daily press of every country to find. p. 456. The horrid facts substantiated. The Rev. H. R. Haas, M.A., author of Ashes to Ashes, enumerates in his work, 
written in advocacy of cremation, some very distressing cases of premature burial. On page 46 occurs the following dialogue. But do you know of many cases of premature burial? Undoubtedly I do. I will not say that in our temperate climate they are frequent, but they do occur. Hardly a graveyard is open but coffins are found containing bodies not only turned, but skeletons contorted in the last hopeless struggle for life underground. The turning may be due to some clumsy shaking of the coffin, but not the contortion. After this he proceeds to give the following recent cases. At Bergerac, Dordogne, in 1842, the patient took a sleeping draft, but he woke not. They bled him, and he woke not. At last they declared him to be dead, and buried him. After a few days, remembering the sleeping draft, they opened the grave. The body had turned and struggled. The Sunday Times, December 30, 1838, relates that at Tunnings, Lower Garon, a man was buried, when an indistinct noise proceeded from the coffin, the reckless gravedigger fled. The coffin was hauled up and burst open. A face stiffened in terror and despair, a torn winding sheet, contorted limbs, told the sad truth too late. The Times, May, 1874, states that in August of 1873, a young lady died soon after her marriage. Within a year the husband married again, and the mother of his first bride resolved to remove her daughter's body to Marseille. They opened the vault and found the poor girl's body prostrate, her hair disheveled, her shroud torn to pieces. As we will have to refer to the subject once more in connection with Bible miracles, we will leave it for the present, and return to magical phenomena. If we were to give a full description of the various manifestations which take place among adepts in India and other countries, we might fill volumes, but this would be profitless, as there would remain no space for explanation. Therefore we select in preference such as either find their parallels in modern phenomena or are authenticated by legal inquiry. Horst tried to present an idea of certain Persian spirits to his readers, and failed, for the bare mention of some of them is calculated to set the brains of a believer in a world. There are the devs and their specialities, the darwans and their gloomy tricks, the shadim and jinnas, the whole vast legion of spirits, demons, goblins, and elves of the Persian. p. 457. Calendar, and, on the other hand, the Jewish seraphim, cherubim, bizeds, amshas bands, sephiroth, malahim, Elohim, and, adds Horst, the millions of astral and elementary spirits, of intermediary spirits, ghosts, and imaginary beings of all races and colors. But the majority of these spirits have not to do with the phenomena consciously and deliberately produced by the Eastern magicians. The latter repudiate such an accusation and leave the sorcerers the help even of elemental spirits and the elementary spooks. The adept has an unlimited power over both, but he rarely uses it. For the production of physical phenomena he summons the nature spirits as obedient powers, not as intelligences. As we always like to strengthen our arguments by testimonies other than our own, it may be well to present the opinion of a daily paper, the Boston Herald, as to phenomena in general and mediums in particular. Having encountered sad failures with some dishonest persons, who may or may not be mediumistic, the writer went to the trouble of ascertaining as to some wonders said to be produced in India, and compares them with those of modern thaumaturgy. The medium of the present day, he says, bears a closer resemblance, in methods and manipulations, to the well-known conjurer of history, than any other representative of the magic art. How far short he still remains of the performances of his prototypes is illustrated below. In 1615 a delegation of highly educated and distinguished men from the English East India Company visited the Emperor Jahangir. While on their mission they witnessed many most wonderful performances, almost causing them to discredit their senses, and far beyond any hint even of solution. A party of Bengalese conjurers and jugglers, showing their art before the Emperor, were desired to produce upon the spot, and from seed, ten mulberry trees. They immediately planted ten seeds, which, in a few minutes produced as many trees. The ground divided over the spot where a seed was planted, tiny leaves appeared, at once followed by slender shoots, which rapidly gained elevation, putting out leaves and twigs and branches, finally spreading wide in the air, budding, blossoming and yielding fruit, which matured upon the spot, and was found to be excellent. And this before the beholder had turned away his eyes. Fig, almond, mango, and walnut trees were at the same time under like conditions produced, yielding the fruit which belonged to each. Wonder succeeded wonder. 
The branches were filled with birds of beautiful plumage flitting about among the leaves and singing sweet notes. The leaves turned to russet, fell from their places, branches and twigs withered, and... p. 458. Finally the trees sank back into the earth, out of which they had all sprung within the hour. Another had a bow and about fifty steel-pointed arrows. He shot an arrow into the air, when, lo, the arrow became fixed in space at a considerable height. Another and another arrow was sent off, each fixing itself in the shaft of the preceding, until all formed a chain of arrows in the air, excepting the last shot, which, striking the chain, brought the whole to the ground in detachments. They set up two common tents facing each other, and about a bow shot apart. These tents were critically examined by the spectators, as are the cabinets of the mediums, and pronounced empty. The tents were fastened to the ground all around. The lookers-on were then invited to choose what animals or birds they would have issue from these tents to engage in a battle. Khan Ijeon incredulously asked to see a fight between ostriches. In a few minutes an ostrich came out from each tent rushed to combat with deadly earnestness, and from them the blood soon began to stream, but they were so nearly matched that neither could win the victory, and they were at last separated by the conjurers and conveyed within the tents. After this the very demands of the spectators for birds and animals were exactly complied with, always with the same results. A large cauldron was set, and into it a quantity of rice thrown. Without the sign of fire this rice soon began to boil, and out from the cauldron was taken more than one hundred platters of cooked rice, with a stewed fowl at the top of each. This trick is performed on a smaller scale by the most ordinary fakirs of the present day. But space fails to give opportunity for illustrating, from the records of the past, how the miserably tame performances by comparison of the mediums of the present day were pale and overshadowed by those of other days and more adroit peoples. There is not a wonderful feature in any of the so-called phenomena or manifestations which was not, nay, which is not now more than duplicated by other skillful performers, whose connection with earth, and earth alone, is too evident to be doubted, even if the fact was not supported by their own testimony. It is an error to say that fakirs or jugglers will always claim that they are helped by spirits. In quasi-religious evocations, such as Jocalio's Kovinasami is described to have produced before this French gentleman, when the parties desire to see real spiritual manifestations, they will resort to Petrus, their disembodied ancestors, and other pure spirits. These they can evoke but through prayer. As to all other phenomena, they are produced by the magician and fakir at will. Notwithstanding the state of apparent abjectness in which the latter lives, he is often an initiate of p. 459. The temples, and is as well acquainted with occultism as his richer brethren. The Chaldeans, whom Cicero counts among the oldest magicians, place the basis of all magic in the inner powers of man's soul, and by the discernment of magic properties in plants, minerals, and animals. By the aid of these they perform the most wonderful miracles. Magic, with them, was synonymous with religion and science. It is but later that the religious myths of the Magdean dualism, disfigured by Christian theology and humorized by certain fathers of the church, assume the disgusting shape in which we find them expounded by such Catholic writers as De Musos. The objective reality of the medieval incubus and succubus, that abominable superstition of the Middle Ages which cost so many human lives, advocated by this author in a whole volume, is the monstrous production of religious fanaticism and epilepsy. It can have no objective form, and to attribute its effects to the devil is blasphemy, implying that God, after creating Satan, would allow him to adopt such a course. If we are forced to believe in vampirism, it is on the strength of two irrefragable propositions of occult psychological science. 1. The astral soul is a separable distinct entity of our ego, and can roam far away from the body without breaking the thread of life. 2. The corpse is not utterly dead, and while it can yet be re-entered by its tenant, the latter can gather sufficient material emanations from it to enable itself to appear in a quasi-terrestrial shape. But to uphold, with De Musos and De Merville, that the devil, whom the Catholics endow with a power which, in antagonism, equals that of the supreme deity, transforms himself into wolves, snakes, and dogs, to satisfy his lust and procreate monsters, is an idea within which lie hidden the germs of devil worship, lunacy, and sacrilege. The Catholic Church, which not only teaches us to believe in this monstrous fallacy, but forces her missionaries to preach such a dogma, need not revolt against the devil worship of some Parsi and South India sects. Quite the reverse, 
For when we hear the Yezidis repeat the well-known proverb, keep friends with the demons, give them your property, your blood, your service, and you need not care about God he will not harm you, we find him but consistent with his belief and reverential to the Supreme, his logic is sound and rational, he reveres God too deeply to imagine that he who created the universe and its laws is able to hurt him, poor Adam, but the demons are there, they are imperfect, and therefore he has good reasons to dread them. Therefore, the devil, and his various transformations, can be but a fallacy. When we imagine that we see, and hear, and feel him, it is but too often the reflection of our own wicked, depraved, and polluted soul that we see, hear, and feel. Like attracts like, they say, thus, according to the p. 460. Mood in which our astral form oozes out during the hours of sleep, according to our thoughts, pursuits, and daily occupations, all of which are fairly impressed upon the plastic capsule called the human soul, the latter attracts around itself spiritual beings congenial to itself. Hence some dreams and visions that are pure and beautiful, others fiendish and beastly. The person awakes, and either hastens to the confessional, or laughs in callous indifference at the thought. In the first case, he is promised final salvation, at the cost of some indulgences, which he has to purchase from the church, and perhaps a little taste of purgatory, or even of hell. What matter? Is he not safe to be eternal and immortal, do what he may? It is the devil. Away with him, with Bell, Book, and Holy Sprinkler. But the devil comes back, and often the true believer is forced to disbelieve in God, when he clearly perceives that the devil has the best of his creator and master. Then he is left to the second emergency. He remains indifferent, and gives himself up entirely to the devil. He dies, and the reader has learned the sequel in the preceding chapters. The thought is beautifully expressed by Dr. Anamoser, religion did not hear, Europe and China, strike root so deeply as among the Hindus, says he, arguing upon the superstition. The spirit of the Greeks and Persians was more volatile. The philosophical idea on the good and bad principle, and of the spiritual world, must have assisted tradition in forming visions of heavenly and hellish shapes, and the most frightful distortions, which in India were much more simply produced by a more enthusiastic fanaticism, there the seer received by divine light, here he lost himself in a multitude of outward objects, with which he confounded his own identity. Convulsions, accompanied by the mind's absence from the body, in distant countries, were here common, for the imagination was less firm, and also less spiritual. The outward causes are also different, the modes of life, geographical position, and artificial means producing various modifications. The mode of life in western countries has always been very variable, and therefore disturbs and distorts the occupation of the senses, and the outward life is therefore reflected upon the inner dream world. The spirits, therefore, are of endless varieties of shape, and incline men to gratify their passions, showing them the means of so doing, and descending even to the minutest particulars which was so far below the elevated natures of Indian seers. Let the student of occult sciences make his own nature as pure and his thoughts as elevated as those of these Indian seers, and he may sleep unmolested by vampire, incubus, or succubus. Round the insensible form of such a sleep of the immortal spirit sheds a power divine that protects it from evil approaches, as though it were a crystal wall. Hike miris aeneas esto, nil contra sibi, nulla palacier culpa.